Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 16. Chapter 376, Different Teams Pettigrew stood at just over 1.6 meters tall, his disheveled, yellow hair peeking out from under a face mask designed for performances. His right palm was encased in a flamboyant silver glove, and he wore an open brown jacket over a dark shirt. As Lumian approached, Pettigrew stepped forward, exclaiming in surprise and delight, Muggle, you finally reappeared. Lumian replied with a smile in Aurora's voice, something happened some time ago, it took me a while to recuperate. Are you all right now? Pettigrew asked with concern. It's all right, Lumian replied nonchalantly, unsure of Aurora's friendship with him. He turned his gaze to a lady sitting on the stone steps. The woman donned a black butterfly mask, a white shirt adorned with a bow tie, and a long, dark coat. Pinned to her chest, a clearly typeset paper name tag read, Professor. Lumian greeted her with a smile, did Associate Professor not make it? Associate Professor was a man. A few years back, due to their shared code names, they had met in real life and became husband and wife. Both were avid warlocks, delving deep into the study of various spells. Aurora's grimoires contained a weed removal spell, courtesy of Associate Professor. Professor's lips bore a faint hue, and her gaunt face framed her beautiful brown eyes. She simply replied, he's occupied in the real world, playing host to guests. He couldn't spare the time. Nevertheless, my presence is akin to his, it doesn't alter matters. Muggle, what's the matter? Lumian smiled faintly and said, I want to thank him for his weed removal spell. What's there to be grateful for? Could it be that your home was overrun by a large number of weeds? Pettigrew asked curiously. Lumian mirrored Aurora's expression as he recounted the past. His light blue eyes darted around as he continued, Some time ago, I encountered a plant rumored to originate from the abyss. It not only grew at an astounding rate but also possessed remarkable vitality. It emitted anesthetic gases and devoured humans like a man-eating flower. Whenever it surfaced, it did so in the hundreds, if not thousands. The weed removal spell, however, could wither them all. While it didn't annihilate them outright, it rendered them dormant for a considerable duration. Weed removal works on beyonder plants? Professor exclaimed in astonishment. Lumian nodded and said, but it's effective only against grass or vine-type plants. These were the insights Aurora had penned in her grimoires. It was evident she had conducted experiments with the abyss demon flower of the Padre, meticulously documenting her findings with scholarly dedication even when her condition was clearly off. This is an interesting discovery. Professor held Lumian's hand, delving into the intricacies of the weed removal spell. Fortunately, Lumian had delved deeply into this spell and sought guidance from Franca and Madame Hila. Though he couldn't use it, his knowledge was sufficient for a conversation. After a lengthy discussion on spells and mystical knowledge with the Academy team, Lumian suddenly sensed a looming presence, casting a shadow over his surroundings. Raising his eyes, he beheld an immense figure. This figure towered at an imposing 2.4 meters, draped in a plain linen robe. Its head was concealed beneath a hood, and in its grip, a formidable magic staff capable of shattering the skulls of ordinary humans, was held. It was none other than Gandalf, the president of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Franca had suggested that he might have reincarnated as a middle-aged man within the Faisak Empire, endowed with a giant bloodline. He had a penchant for liquor and an insatiable thirst for mystical knowledge, yet the nature of his pathway remained an enigma. Sometimes, he displayed traits of the reader pathway, embodying characteristics of a savant and mystery prior. At other times, it made people feel that with his physical condition, it would be a pity not to take the warrior pathway. High-end mystical knowledge like the law of beyonder characteristics indestructibility originated from Gandalf. Oddly, Franca's expression took on a peculiar twist when mentioning Gandalf, as though his code name didn't quite align with his towering stature and imposing presence. Gandalf, his visage obscured by an eerie shadow, fixed his gaze upon Lumian and gruffly extended a smile. You've missed a few gatherings. I was concerned something might have befallen you. 
Lumian responded with pursed lips, his momentary sigh and helplessness hidden beneath the surface. Something did happen, but it's been resolved. That's reassuring. Gandalf nodded in relief. Following a few more courteous exchanges with Lumian, he made his way towards the other teams. This was Lumian's first time participating in the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society's discussions. Following Madame Hela's counsel, he adopted a stance of speaking less and listening more. Often, he remained in silence. Throughout this process, Lumian, now seated on the stone steps, observed those who spoke with a faint smile, projecting an aura of extreme attentiveness. Aurora often employed a similar tactic. When conversing with Madame Puales and the elderly ladies in Cordu, she would grace the speaker with a warm smile, making them feel truly valued. The discussion might be captivating, but beneath her apparent engagement, Aurora's thoughts would occasionally drift. She would intermittently return to grasp the essential points, safeguarding against potential awkwardness when she needed to respond. Of course, when it came to discussions of mystical knowledge or striking deals, Lumian remained fully engaged, simply mirroring Aurora's demeanor. After a while, Lumian found a suitable moment to rise from his spot, signaling his intention to depart from the academy team's gathering area. A lady, her face adorned with removable oil paint, exclaimed in surprise, Aren't you purchasing anything today? Do you really need to spend a small fortune at every gathering to find joy, grande sir? Lumian muttered silently and smiled. I have two reasons. Firstly, I've recently hit a bottleneck and am more focused on gathering the formula and ingredients for the scroll's professor potion. He spoke earnestly while analyzing the absence of corresponding requirements. Finally, he said, secondly, I'm broke and owe someone a substantial sum. Members of the academy team chuckled warmly, their understanding evident. They had all noticed that Muggle had met with a significant problem during her hiatus from the gatherings, transforming from a well-off individual into someone burdened with debt. However, they weren't overly concerned for Muggle. Over the past few years, they had witnessed their companion's knack for accumulating wealth. Gracefully, Lumian made his way to the third pillar on the right of the colossal stone chair, where the Purgatory team congregated. Madame Hela frequently engaged in their discussions. The lady was already present, albeit with a noticeable reduction in the chill that enveloped her. Under her veiled hat was a blur, revealing only a pale, yet not dismal, white complexion. Silently, Lumian observed the discussions and dealings of the purgatory team. After a while, he inquired thoughtfully, Have any of you heard of an illusory river associated with the domain of death? Hila cast a fleeting glance at Lumian but remained silent. Another member of the purgatory team, a man bearing the code name Cerberus, pondered the question and responded, Muggle, why do you ask? I've heard rumors of an illusory river deep within the underworld, within the realm of hell. It's said to be connected to one of the high sequence beyonders of the corpse collector pathway. He actually answered without hesitation and didn't seek compensation for the intel, even though it's only hearsay and not verified fact. Lumian smiled and said, I've recently been intrigued by the presence of such a river in both the myths and legends of our homeland and here. He raised the topic indirectly without delving into further details. Cerberus pondered for a moment before commenting, this might be rooted in the commonality between the origins of myths and human thought. Lumian tersely acknowledged with Aurora's voice and didn't inquire further. He listened for a while longer before turning his attention to a hole in the ancient palace. With his previous preparations in place, Lumian could smoothly blend into the April Fool's team, allowing him to eavesdrop on their conversations. As Lumian made his way to the designated location, he quickly reviewed what he had observed and heard. He couldn't help but notice that his sister, Aurora, had garnered quite a bit of popularity. Both the members of the Academy and the Purgatory team had shown her kindness. While moving diagonally through the ancient palace, Lumian's attention was drawn to a man with stockings covering his head. This individual leaped onto a broken pillar and addressed the curly-haired baboons research society members, who were clad in various eccentric outfits. Allow me to recite a poem. Ocean, you are all water, horse, you have four legs. Demoness, you truly taste great. This isn't a poem at all. 
Lumian had already purchased Emperor Roselle's secret chronicles, which included jests about the Emperor having a more than friendly relationship with a demoness. In the diary, he even commented on the taste of demonesses. With one step following another, Lumian approached the April Fool's team. He spotted a man with his back turned to him, dressed in a black seer's robe. Behind this figure, an ancient Faisak word was inscribed in golden paint, Loki. Franca had mentioned that Loki was a figure from certain legends in their world, associated with lies, mischief, and flames. This member bearing the code name Loki is the founder of the April Fool's team. Although he has progressed on the paths of the divine at a pace not inferior to Hela and the others, he hasn't ascended to the position of vice president. Various pieces of information flashed through Lumian's mind. He entered the area where the April Fool's team was, and all laughter abruptly ceased. In unison, Loki and the others turned to face Lumian, who was clad in a half-mask and a black warlock robe. As Muggle, Lumian's lips curved into a radiant smile. Long time no see, everyone. Chapter 377 An Earlier Transmigrator Facing Lumian's greeting, the dozen or so members of the April Fool's team fell silent. Among them, several people's gazes and body language gave Lumian the distinct feeling that something was amiss. There was Bard wearing stockings to conceal his appearance, Hisoka with a half mask, vertical red hair, and teardrop and star makeup on his face, Mad Lady sporting red, yellow, and white clown paint, and Ultraman in comical attire. Some of these April Fool's team members appeared surprised and puzzled, while others subtly shrank back. Some narrowed their eyes, and others changed their postures, becoming even more vigilant than before. If Lumian hadn't sought guidance from psychiatrist Anthony Reed during this time and focused on observing the guilty's reactions when they realized their victim was still alive, he wouldn't have been able to discern these differences so clearly. He might have missed something important. In contrast, Lumian's earlier suspects, Loki and I Know Someone, had more normal reactions. The former was the founder and leader of the April Fool's team. If anything unusual occurred within the team, the chances of him remaining unaffected were slim. According to Franca, he was believed to be a member of the Spectator Pathway, possibly a psychiatrist. However, Aurora's understanding of this pathway was notably deficient. Her grimoires didn't align with the details uncovered in the dream. Dressed in a black circus divination-style robe, Loki obscured his face with the shadows of his hood, seemingly unconcerned about being identified. After a brief silence, he expressed his surprise, saying, Muggle, you've reappeared. I thought you lost control and went mad after hearing the Hidden Sages cram school classes, and that's why you haven't attended any gatherings for months. Rap, it's rap, not cram school classes, corrected Bard with a smile. Lumian had learned from Franca that rap was a strange form of music that some members of the Curly Haired Baboons Research Society liked to compare to the ravings of unknown entities. Muggle's thin red lips curled up slightly in response. I did show signs of madness, but I managed it. In the Curly Haired Baboons Research Society, this was a common topic. Many members had lost control for various reasons, turning into monsters or even dying. As a result, psychiatrists could make a killing by treating their companions' psychological or mental problems during gatherings. Dressed in a white coat and wearing a bird beak mask, I know someone nodded. Last year, I assessed your mental and psychological state. There wasn't much of a problem, but you haven't had regular assessments in nearly a year. You need to be careful. I know someone who was careless and overconfident and ended up in an asylum. This psychiatrist appeared normal enough and was genuinely concerned about his patient's condition. However, his membership in the April Fool's team raised some suspicions for Lumian. At the very least, his mental state didn't seem entirely healthy. As a prankster, Lumian didn't despair about the future or made it his life's mission to seek fun. Having such circumstances would undoubtedly put a toll on their psychological well-being. Loki didn't press further about Muggle's absence from numerous gatherings. He spread his hands and addressed all the members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society in the April Fool's team spot. Everyone, I've recently come across another transmigrator from history. 
Who is it? Bard with stockings blurted out, and the other members turned their attention to Loki. Taking note of everyone's gazes, Loki gestured meaningfully and continued, I've obtained ancient texts that mention the existence of an ancient sun god in the third epoch. Haven't we always been puzzled by the scriptures of the various churches, especially the eternal blazing sun church? Don't they bear a striking resemblance to the religious texts of our world? Now, I believe I've found the answer. As the leader of the April Fool's team spoke, he tapped his chest four times, top, down, left, right, as if indicating a religion from his homeland. Lumian's eyelids twitched. Mr. K had made the same gesture while praying to that entity. Was it merely a coincidence, or was there an inevitable connection? Furthermore, wasn't the ancient sun god the father of the angel at Sal de Bal unique? Loki continued in an exaggerated tone, yes, just as you suspect. The scriptures of the various churches are derived from the ancient sun god, but they have different focuses and have altered certain details. I've only managed to find a few of that entity's books, but I can confirm they're from our world. I hope you can gather more information about the ancient sun god and eventually confirm that he too is a transmigrator, possibly even predating Roselle. If you wish to see the books I've obtained, remember to request a trade later. 100 grams of gold or an equivalent currency for a copy is a very reasonable price, don't you think? We're all on the same side, and this discovery holds the key to our hopes of returning home. Otherwise, I wouldn't sell it for such a small amount of gold. The comical-looking Ultraman let out a sigh and said, It's all rather pointless. I believe you think that this entity, who has become a deity, must have a better understanding of the world's truth than us. He might have already unraveled the secret of transmigration and the way back. But according to your information, didn't he also fail to return? See the light. Loki's lips curled up. And I suspect that the reason that individual couldn't return is because he perished in a divine battle. Sounds intriguing, Hisoka, dressed in clothes with poker card patterns, suddenly chimed in. Loki slowly scanned the members of the curly-haired baboon's research society and flashed a smile. The information about that entity in the ancient books related to it has been deliberately erased, with only a small number of them circulating in secret. Most are hidden underground near the source of power left behind by that entity. It's said that in those places, the higher your sequence, the more dangerous it becomes. It's easier to lose control. Ordinary beyonders like us stand a chance to approach. Perhaps it holds the truth about the connection between our two worlds and a way to return to our homeland. At this point, Loki's gaze passed over Lumian's masked face. Is he subtly encouraging Aurora and the other members of the curly-haired baboons research society to venture underground? Lumian maintained his vigilance against any potential pranks. However, there was another reason why he sensed a potential issue instantly. Madam Justice had mentioned that the higher one's sequence, the more dangerous it would be when approaching the Samaritan Women's Spring. She had also explained the nature of the problem. This led Lumian to suspect that the ancient sun god's location mentioned by Loki might be a place similar to the Samaritan Women's Spring. He knew firsthand how perilous and terrifying the Samaritan Women's Spring could be. Inciting others to explore underground in their quest to return home while avoiding the risks himself, or is this merely a prank that could harm others without benefiting Loki? Lumian glanced at Loki's profile and deliberately interjected, I've been pondering a similar question lately. Why do many myths and legends in this world involve an illusory river associated with the domain of death, just like in our homeland? Could it be the result of some senior who transmigrated back? Given Lumian's knowledge of Aurora, he knew she couldn't resist getting involved if she caught wind of any leads regarding returning to her hometown. Since he had questions of his own, he needed to steer the conversation away from Loki's direction. Finding a relevant topic was his best strategy. This was a lesson Lumian and his sister had learned through their battles of wits and pranks over studies, homework, exams, combat, and pranks. Mad Lady, adorned with red, yellow, and white clown paint, chuckled and remarked, Human nature, my dear, humans tend to blend their own experiences into myths and legends. In ancient times, they relied on water for survival, so they believed there should be a river in the afterlife. 
Likewise, when they dug graves, the deeper they went, the more likely they'd encounter an underground river. Lumian, emulating Aurora's tone, responded, Your explanation is quite scientific, but I think it lacks mysticism. And if we aim to return, mysticism might be just what we need. He recounted the legend of the river Styx, which he had recently acquired from the Purgatory team, and concluded, I believe this could also be a path worth exploring. Loki's face remained hidden in the hooded shadows as he chuckled and remarked, Although the underworld should be somewhere in the spirit world, I believe it must be closely related to the underground. In numerous folklores from the northern and southern continents, hell is often depicted as being hidden underground. That's why our investigation needs to be centered on the underground. Whether it's the remains of the third epic's ancient sun god or issues related to the river Styx, we must delve deep underground to truly connect with these mysteries. Lumian couldn't help but mutter to himself, you just want everyone to meet their end faster. He pretended to be engaged and continued sharing information about the ancient sun god, underground exploration, and the river Styx with Loki, I know someone, and the other members of the April Fool's team. After almost twenty minutes of conversation, Lumian decided to step away from the April Fool's team's vicinity. He had already sensed abnormal reactions from at least four members of the April Fool's team. The next step was to leave this to Hidden Blade Franca. If there was indeed something awry with the April Fool's team, they would be highly cautious when dealing with Muggle. They wouldn't readily engage or probe, fearing they might fall into a trap. Their primary objective should be observation and indirect information gathering at this point. When it came to Hidden Blade, they could play pranks without reservations. Later on, Franca could use those pranks as an excuse to locate the April Fool's team members in the real world and confront them individually. She could win the support of other members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Whether they could extract any significant information during these confrontations remained to be seen. As Lumian took a few steps away from the gathering, he spotted the 2.4-meter-tall president, Gandalf, approaching the massive stone chair and addressing the group with a resounding voice, Everyone, I have something important to discuss. Chapter 378, Investigation Lumian halted and turned his attention toward the president of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, who was dressed in a linen robe. The nearly half-giant Gandalf didn't require mechanical contraptions or mystical techniques to project his voice throughout the ancient palace. I just had a conversation with Isotope and noticed a matter that deserves our attention. He mentioned that ever since advancing to Sequence 6, he's been encountering Beyonders more frequently and getting involved in Beyonder affairs. This aligns with my general observations over the past few years. You know I enjoy talking to every member and asking about the additional changes brought about by superpowers. For me, I've delved deeper into the paths of the divine than most, gaining a profound understanding. Having said that, I want to share a conclusion. There are almost no exceptions. As Beyonders progress in sequence, the frequency of mystical matters involving them significantly increases. At sequence 9, this phenomenon isn't prominent. But starting from sequence 7 or even sequence 6, even those who typically don't pay much attention to such matters will feel that they are constantly encountering Beyonder events. Let me illustrate with numbers. At sequence 9, the assumed number of Beyonder incidents or encounters with other Beyonders each season is 1. This can easily slip under the radar during mysticism gatherings and small circle activities you participate in. It's challenging to pinpoint precisely. Now, at sequence 8, it's 2. For sequence 7, it might surge to 5 or 6. In other words, one may come across one or two Beyonder incidents or unfamiliar Beyonders once or twice a month. Do you have any thoughts or speculations about this phenomenon? Can you discern the cause? Perhaps there are fundamental laws of mysticism at play. Lumian fell into a daze. Isn't this the law of Beyonder characteristics convergence? This transmigrator, codenamed Gandalf, possessed a sharp investigative spirit. He was astute in noticing even the smallest details and had actually uncovered the outward signs of the law of Beyonder characteristics convergence. 
he was also the one who had suggested that advancing to sequence 9 and sequence 8 in recent years would be easier than before, even allowing for the direct consumption of beyonder characteristics. He had provided a more precise assessment of the increased risk. A research-focused talent. Lumian sighed, using Aurora's usual terminology. For someone like him, with an evil god's angel sealed within and a deity-level aura shrouding him, the manifestation of the law of beyonder characteristics convergence was so intense that it couldn't be ignored. Anyone would recognize the problem. What do you mean one or two beyonder incidents a month? It's practically every week. Including the beyonders he had encountered, it could be said to be a daily occurrence. However, at times, Lumian felt that the law of beyonder characteristics convergence hadn't fully played its role. Only by attracting members of the Sinners organization and Roche Louis Sanson's family to Avenue du Marquet and coincidentally meeting them would it qualify. Perhaps the power of a boon wasn't as potent as the convergence of beyonder characteristics, or perhaps Termoboros's seal had mitigated the effect. In any case, his desire remained unfulfilled. As someone who had taken his sister's place at the gathering, Lumian refrained from approaching Gandalf directly and offering a substantial price for information on the law of beyonder characteristics convergence. Casually scanning the area, he noticed Madame Gila and Hidden Blade Franca remaining silent, listening to the discussions among members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society regarding this phenomenon. Lumian knew that Franca was familiar with the law of beyonder characteristics convergence. With Gila's concealed knowledge from her exploration of the Samaritan Women's Spring, she should have observed such a phenomenon. They didn't explicitly mention the term convergence due to their different motivations. For Franca, as long as she didn't seek to ascend to godhood, immediate understanding of the law of beyonder characteristics convergence wasn't necessary. She just needed to recognize the corresponding phenomena and avoid risks. The specific details could be sold at the gathering when she needed funds and gained Madame Judgment's approval. As various groups engaged in fervent discussions about President Gandalf's topic, Lumian made his way toward the Academy team. As Lumian continued on his path, he spotted Hidden Blade Franca approaching. Muggle? You're finally back at the gathering. I was genuinely worried something had happened to you. Franca's expressions were slightly exaggerated but it was well within the norm for her. In the eyes of all the members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, she was known for her rich emotions and her love for interacting and experimenting. Lumian pursed his lips and offered a smile. Something did come up, but it got sorted out. Impressive mental resilience. He didn't react strongly when the quarter disaster was mentioned. Franca looked at Muggle's exposed lower face with curiosity and asked, What happened? A mysticism catastrophe, Lumian replied, taking on a resistant demeanor. Franca knew when to change the subject and shifted the conversation with a smile. Just a while ago, in the April Fool's group, Loki mentioned that he stumbled upon another ancient transmigrator known as the ancient sun god. Lumian took the initiative to bring up his conversation with April Fools. Mad Lady, Hisoka, Bard, and Ultraman are a bit skeptical. Mad Lady, Hisoka, Bard, Ultraman. Franca and Lumian shared an unspoken understanding. She immediately grasped his intentions, take note of the four April Fool's team members Lumian suspected of being problematic. Including Loki and I know someone, who were often discussed as potential suspects, there were now a total of six individuals. Is that true? Besides Emperor Roselle, are there other ancient transmigrators? Franca asked with genuine excitement. She wasn't faking it. She had always been interested in ancient transmigrators. Seeing the opportunity, she bid Muggle farewell and approached the area in the palace where the April Fool's team was located. Lumian returned to the academy team and listened as Professor, Isotope, and Pettigrew discussed the mysticism experiences they had encountered. The gathering had a strict two-hour time limit, but attendees could leave at any moment. They simply needed to recite an incantation, changing the last sentence to I beseech your permission to leave your kingdom, and they would return to their original location. Many members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society chose to depart early after conducting their business and sharing their concerns, 
to prevent any accidents from occurring in the real world. However, a significant number of members opted to stay. For them, the opportunity to interact with people who shared their unique origins and not worry about accidental disclosures of their secrets was a pleasure. Even if their conversations veered into trivial topics, it still improved their emotional well-being and provided relief for their mental and psychological states. Lumian believed that his sister had found these gatherings quite relaxing. Thus, he partly attended to impersonate her and show no difference while also enjoying the atmosphere on Aurora's behalf, patiently remaining until the end. Vaguely, he sensed that his emotions were becoming more sensitive and easily stirred. It was as if Aurora's soul fragment had risen to the surface and was affecting his psyche. As the gathering drew to a close, Professor, wearing a shirt with a bow tie, turned her attention to Lumian and inquired, Muggle, are you still residing in the South? Hmm, she's not referring to a specific country. Does she know that Aurora is an Intus? Lumian's thoughts raced as he responded candidly, No, I've already moved to the Trier Greater Region. A smile curved on Professor's lips. Associate Professor and I are also residing in Trier. Would you be interested in an offline gathering? I'm in the Trier Greater Region as well, Pettigrew chimed in eagerly. Periodic Table and Isotope nodded in agreement. An offline gathering. Aurora did occasionally go out for a few days in the past. Could she have attended a real-life gathering with Professor and the others? Different circles have different styles. Franca and her associates have a telegram group, and these individuals from the academy participate in real-life gatherings depending on the region? Lumian pondered for a moment and replied, another time. After I've sorted out some personal matters. He intentionally brought up certain personal matters, hoping that this information might reach the April Fool's suspects like Loki and Mad Lady. All right. Professor and the others acknowledged. After all, Muggle had previously revealed that something had occurred to her. A beyonder from ancient times, the ruler of the nation of the Evernight, the noble mother of heaven, I beseech your permission to leave your kingdom. With each repetition of the incantation, the figures in the ancient palace gradually faded away. When Lumian regained consciousness, he found himself back in the safe house on Rue du Rossignol. How magical! Compared to this, Mr. K's mysticism gatherings are like comparing my safe house to Emperor Roselle's summer palace. They're on entirely different levels. The contrast is quite significant. Lumian sighed and returned to his original appearance. He wasn't in a rush to write to Madame Magician to report the Armored Shadow's response or to inquire about the ancient sun god. Instead, after changing his clothes, he headed straight to three Rue de Blouse's Blanches and knocked on the door of apartment 601. Jenna had gone to visit her brother and wouldn't return until the next morning. Franca sat in a recliner, muttering as if cursing someone. What's bothering you? Lumian asked as he settled onto the divan. That rascal Loki. I wanted to buy some information from him, but he told me others could pay with gold, but not me. Franca replied indignantly. He said he wanted to experience the taste of a demoness. Damn it, why didn't he drink the potion and become a witch himself? After I cursed him, he claimed it was a joke and sold me the ancient information. She chuckled after recounting the encounter. Although there's a special barrier in the gathering venue that prevents us from tracing the ownership and location of the items we trade, the essence of the items can't be concealed. Regarding the copy of the information, it includes details such as the type of paper, which factory it originated from, the model of the mechanical typewriter or printing machine used to produce it, and even the approximate location. This could provide some clues. It might help us locate Loki in the real world. Of course, that's assuming he hasn't taken any anti-divination measures, misdirection, or hidden anything. As Franca spoke, she took out a mirror and prepared for magic mirror divination. After reciting the incantation, the mirror darkened, accompanied by the faint sound of water. Franca held the copy of the information she had obtained from Loki and inquired thoughtfully, where can we find the mechanical typewriter used to create this information? Within the mirror, an aged voice responded, Trier, a lone bar. Chapter 379, 
bold speculation. Alone bar? Lumian was taken aback by the answer. Loki, the founder of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society's April Fool's team, is actually in Trier and connected to the Alone Bar? Isn't this a little too coincidental? Lumian's impression of the Alone Bar was that it stood diagonally opposite Sal de Ball Unique. In the basement, there was a theater for marionette shows. The lighting was dim, and the colors were dark, giving it a slightly sinister appearance. Initially, he didn't see it as a problem, but now that he knew that the monocle-wearing patrons of Sal de Ball Unique were in a superimposed state of being a mon and not a mon, he believed that the alone bar, which could compete with this dance hall and survive, wasn't simple. Moreover, he had once observed Leah from Bureau 8 entering the bar. He suspected it to be Bureau 8's covert hideout, designed to keep an eye on the almonds at Sal de Ball Unique. Could Loki also be a member of Bureau 8, a true official beyond her? Or was it possible that he merely resided in Cartier de l'Observatoire and recognized the uniqueness of a lone bar? Was that why he used the mechanical typewriter there to create a copy of the information, preventing anyone from tracing it back to him? What's the matter? Franca watched Lumian furrow his brow and plunge into deep thought. After a prolonged silence, she extended her right hand and waved it in front of his eyes. Lumian contemplated for a moment and said, There's a significant issue with this bar. You're familiar with this bar? Franca looked surprised. This man appeared to harbor many secrets she was unaware of. A soft chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. We'll need to start with Madame Gila and me searching for the Samaritan Women's Spring. Franca was taken aback. How many times do I need to have you give out every detail? Are you a tube of toothpaste, giving out a little with each squeeze? The focus was on the situation at the Samaritan Women's Spring, and this all happened along the way, Lumian explained, without feeling embarrassed. Starting from his encounter with the Islander swindler, Monette, and his repeated scares, he connected Charlie being swindled, the uniqueness of Sal de Ball Unique, and Madame Magician's connection to Amon. Finally, he mentioned that a lone bar was diagonally opposite Sal de Ball Unique, and an official member of Bureau 8 had once entered and exited. Franca felt like she was listening to a ghost story. She subconsciously wanted to hug a pillow, but there was none on the recliner. Quickly shaking off her daze, she straightened her back, trying to maintain an expression that suggested a true man wouldn't be frightened by such a terrifying incident. All this was used to torment Jenna. After Lumian finished speaking, Franca hissed and said, You've had quite the array of experiences. You've even encountered an old monster that only exists in horror stories. Why didn't you warn me earlier? That islander swindler shows up in the market district from time to time. What if I run into him one day? It's for your own safety. If you didn't suspect anything when you encountered him, he wouldn't pay you any attention. But now, if your demeanor changes when you see him, he might become suspicious and involve you in his parasitism, Lumian warned, half-scaring Franca. That's true. Franca gritted her teeth and added, The next time I meet him, I'll pray for the angel's protection from Mr. Fool when I get home. She pushed aside her fear of the almonds and steered the conversation back to the main topic. This all ties into the alone bar. Investigating it in the future is going to be very challenging. Franca suddenly had an imaginative guess. Do you think Loki has already been parasitized by an Amon? Lumian struggled to follow Franca's train of thought and responded, Ha! Huh? Franca continued, her tone grave, consider this. The books and legends of the ancient sun god have been missing for two to three thousand years, and since the churches of the seven gods' bibles are copied from him, they must have erased relevant information. How did Loki come by this information? While there are various possibilities, if he is indeed a mon, it would make sense. No one knows his father's situation better than him. As a child of a transmigrator, not to mention that he can obtain Loki's memories through parasitism, even if he can't, he can perfectly act as our companion. You also mentioned that he enjoys deceit and has frightened you a few times. This is very similar to Loki's usual behavior. And when Amon from Sal de Ball Unique created the duplicate, he deliberately went to the alone bar diagonally opposite to use a mechanical typewriter to mislead potential tracing. This also fits with this style. 
Franca's bold imagination surprised Lumian. After a moment of thought, he responded, this does explain why this information oddly points to the alone bar. Under the guidance of this evil angel, the April Fool's team gradually felt despair for the future and pursued their own joy. It was a reasonable development for them to start targeting other members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. However, Amon wouldn't intentionally lead the information to the alone bar, as that would naturally make investigators suspect him, who resides diagonally opposite. Perhaps he anticipated the investigators' thoughts, Frank countered. Lumian shook his head slowly. If it were Amon, your divination would have been misled or you wouldn't have received an answer. Yes, regardless, this is indeed a possibility. I plan to visit the alone bar for a drink in the next two days and investigate the situation on the ground, but I won't delve further. Frank acknowledged his words tersely and sighed. In truth, I also realized that the likelihood of Loki being parasitized by an Amon is very low. Our primary purpose in attending the gathering is to transition into a special state. In this state, the sealed artifact borrowed from Madame Hela should be able to detect any abnormalities in each member's bodies. It won't transform the corresponding object and leave it where it is. Sigh, I'm just finding excuses for myself. It's not wise for us to pursue Loki without substantial evidence and strong suspicion. It makes me feel like I've betrayed the research society and my companions. That's why I hope that Loki was indeed parasitized by Amon. That way, I won't experience a similar sense of guilt. I'd be helping the research society eliminate hidden dangers. Filtering abnormalities in the body by entering a special state and attending the gathering? But nothing happened to Termoboros. Lumian wondered if it was because Mr. Fool's seal was unique or if Madame Hela's sealed artifact lacked the ability to filter abnormalities and guard against parasitic angels like Amon. However, he didn't voice any objections at the moment and instead smiled. In my view, there's definitely something amiss with Loki. It's just a question of whether it's a major or minor issue. When he sold you the information, did he encourage you to explore the underground and seek out more remnants of the ancient sun god? He did, Franca confirmed. He also mentioned that in such places, the higher the sequence, the more dangerous it is. It's easier to lose control. Only low sequence beyonders like us can approach it. That's only a relative perspective. Did you find it dangerous when I explored the Samaritan Women's Spring earlier? Lumian inquired. It was extremely dangerous, Frank acknowledged, knowing much about the matter. And you don't even know that the Blood Emperor's apparition nearly caught me. Lumian muttered, searching for the remnants of the ancient sun god will likely be even more dangerous. If Loki doesn't make an attempt, he'll be essentially using you as cannon fodder by encouraging you to explore underground. And if he does try, he'll inevitably be corrupted and gradually mutate. He lacks the purification of a great existence like Mr. Fool. So, it's crucial to locate Loki as soon as possible. It's in both your and his best interests. Franka bit her lip and agreed, you're right. Loki clearly has malicious intentions in this matter. The other members of the April Fool's team might be curious and willing to participate, but I believe they're cooperating with him. After persuading Franca, Lumian asked curiously, Tell me, the prerequisite for entering the gathering is to enter a special state. What state is it? Franca, no longer hesitating, shared eagerly, I've asked my major arcana card holder about it before. Although I couldn't reveal the incantation or provide a detailed description of the gathering, she speculated that it involves a concealment power based on my description and its effects. Concealment power. Lumian nodded. It was indeed well concealed. Even the incantation had been hidden, preventing anyone from discovering it. Franca went on, the power of concealment is associated with the Evernight Pathway, which is the divine pathway controlled by the Evernight Goddess Church. She lowered her voice and added, I suspect that Madame Hela is affiliated with the Church of Evernight. Similar to 007? Lumian inquired. He hadn't encountered 007 today, as too many people had participated in the gathering, and he didn't know the usual attire or team of 007. 
Franca tersely confirmed his assumption. Something along those lines, but she may hold a more significant position. She's at a higher level and has access to more concealed knowledge. Recalling Madame Hila's actions in obtaining the Samaritan Women's Spring, Lumian couldn't help but agree with Franca's assessment. Indeed, the lady possessed a wealth of secret knowledge. Moreover, she wore a black diamond ring that clearly exceeded ordinary mystical items and was suspected to possess godlike powers. Additionally, the sealed artifact she had borrowed to convene the gathering was beyond Lumian's imagination. In a casual manner, Lumian asked, What are the primary manifestations of the Evernight Pathway's powers? According to Aurora's grimoires, the first three sequences of this pathway were Sleepless, Midnight Poet, and Nightmare. They primarily involved enhancing spirituality, increasing mental strength, reducing the need for sleep, the mystical application of poetry, and the unique ability to induce sleep in others. Franca thought for a moment and replied, the power of concealment, command over spirits, and the ability to create realistic dreams. Realistic dream. Lumian was taken aback by the answer. He couldn't help but recall the realistic dream he had experienced in the ruins of Kordu. Chapter 380, Bell Chimes At the conclusion of the Kordu disaster, Lumian found himself not only grappling with the seal within his body and the fading aura of inevitability surrounding him, but he had also been thrust into a vivid, lifelike dream. Surprisingly, even the investigators, Ryan and the others, succumbed to an uncontrollable slumber as they entered a specific area, becoming entangled in his dream. During that time, Lumian, who was still unfamiliar with the intricacies of mysticism, failed to sense anything amiss. It was only later, when he enlisted the help of Mr. Poet to decipher the symbolic meanings woven into the dream, that he realized its origins were not tied to Termoboros's power or Mr. Fool's seal. It had a different source, one that conveyed protection and solace. Ever since that moment, Lumian had tirelessly pondered the origin of this lifelike dream, but he had never unearthed a definitive answer. The possibilities were endless. However, with Franca's detailed account of the Evernight Pathway and his own experiences at the gathering, a sudden revelation struck him. The Evernight Pathway, known for inducing nightmarish visions, could also weave the fabric of realistic dreams. Could it be that Madame Hila, upon learning of Aurora's tragic fate in Cordu, had arrived too late to intervene directly? Perhaps she had resorted to employing the power of a sealed artifact to draw me into the lifelike dream and attempt to provide solace for my tormented soul? No, there's no need for her to hide this from me and feign ignorance. What's there to hide? Moreover, if she were responsible, there would be no lingering traces of slumbering power left behind. Could it be that the continuous use of the incantation involving concealment powers during the gathering somehow marked or corrupted Aurora with the sealed artifact's influence? When her body disintegrated, the sealed artifact sensed the disturbance and, albeit unsuccessfully in saving her, led me into the realm of this lifelike dream? Yes, it makes sense. Leah and the others were compelled to slumber on the blood-colored mountain peak, situated near the sacrificial ground close to the three-headed, six-armed giant. This aligns with my theory. The source of the dream's power is intricately tied to Aurora's fate. Frank observed Lumian's prolonged silence, realizing he was deeply engrossed in contemplation. She wisely refrained from interrupting, allowing him to return to the present before gently inquiring, what thoughts have crossed your mind? Do you recall the Kordu disaster I mentioned? There's an area around the sacrificial ground, which became the blood-colored mountain peak. Anyone who ventured into it fell into a deep slumber and experienced a realistic dream, Lumian explained succinctly. The more Frank absorbed his words, the more astonishment and trepidation filled her. Could it be that there's something wrong with Madame Hila too? I don't think so. Lumian shook his head in response and outlined the crucial aspects of his conjecture. Relief washed over Franca, and she couldn't hide her emotions. This theory does seem to fit the circumstances. Right, did you notice? The initial part of the incantation features a three-line honorific name. This implies that the sealed artifact either possesses characteristics of a living entity or was once alive. 
it's reasonable for it to instinctively influence those who beseech its power. After careful consideration, Lumian recognized the validity of this point. The two of them continued their conversation, ultimately deciding that Lumian should find a suitable time to pay a visit to the alone bar. Returning to the Aubert's du Coke door, Lumian drew the curtains and settled at the table. Bathed in the soft glow of the carbide lamp, he began composing a letter addressed to Madame Magician. The letter primarily centered around the Armored Shadow's performance and its response. Lumian was particularly interested in gathering information about the ancient sun god and its connection with the Aurora Order. However, mindful of the late hour, he decided to wait until he naturally woke up in the morning, had his breakfast, and then sent the letter. At noon, Lumian received a reply from Madame Magician, and he felt a sense of satisfaction for having purposely returned to room 207 of Aubert's Du Coke door. The Armored Shadow's response and its current condition offer us valuable insights into the situation regarding underscore 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 dot. Lumian was taken aback by the first sentence. His gaze fixated on the blank portion of the sentence, uncertain whether Madame Magician had intentionally injected humor into her letter or if some form of distortion had affected the message. Drawing from his knowledge of Magician, Lumian's initial assumption was that she had initially composed the entire sentence but later realized that certain information couldn't be disclosed at this moment. Instead of redacting it or starting anew, she had employed some mystical means to erase the phrase. Why can't I be privy to this information? It's merely another world, right? Lumian mused as he proceeded to read the subsequent sentence. While this is a valuable acquisition, its immediate utility may be limited, though Mr. Hangman will undoubtedly be pleased. In due time, when he deems it appropriate, he might get you to summon the Armored Shadow once more. He will be responsible for providing compensation and gold for the chance to pose inquiries. Let him determine the questions. Your role is to facilitate the communication, and the Two of Cups will handle translation. Oh, and do not forget to request a reward from Mr. Hangman. Mr. Hangman Lumian repeated the code name, his eyes continuing to scan the contents of the letter. The ancient sun god's problem is complicated, and my knowledge on the matter is limited. At this juncture, I can only offer this. He was the ruler of the Third Epic, the one who brought an end to the tyrannical reign of the brutal ancient gods and ushered in an era of light for humanity. The entity revered by the Aurora Order maintains a complicated connection with him. Understanding this connection carries risks. Consider him as the inheritor of half of his legacy, while the other portion is shared among select members of the Seven Deities. This division directly gave rise to what we commonly term the Age of the Gods, also known as the Fourth Epic. If remnants of history, legends, documents, and artifacts were still available from the fourth epoch, the prior third and second epochs existed mostly within the scriptures of various churches, veiled in almost mythical obscurity. Lumian possessed only scant knowledge, recognizing the third epoch as the cataclysm epoch and the second epoch as the dark epoch. In Madame Magician's words, Lumian sensed the majesty and allure of ancient history unfolding before him. The brutal ancient gods, the ancient sun god who ended humanity's dark age, the ruler of the third epoch whose demise remains shrouded in mystery, and the age of the gods that emerged from his corpse. Why would such an ancient deity give birth to someone like Amon? And who is Amon's mother? Could there be a connection between Amon and the figure revered by the Aurora Order? The more Lumian contemplated this, the more he discerned problems with the ancient sun god's method of raising offspring. He harbored a favorable impression of this deity, not only because of his role in ending the dominion of the ancient gods and offering humanity a glimmer of hope, but also due to the suspicion that he might be an earlier transmigrator from the same world as Aurora and Emperor Roselle. Simultaneously, Lumian began to understand why Mr. K and the Aurora Order held such vehement disdain for heretics. The one they revered was the rightful heir to the legacy of the ancient sun god. A flame erupted, igniting the letter in Lumian's hand. He tidied up and fastened the silver lie earring, making subtle adjustments to his appearance to ensure he bore no resemblance to Lumian Lee. With that done, he removed lie and slipped it into a concealed pocket. His recent insights indicated that his transfigurations from lie wouldn't end when he was separated from lie. 
it was a flesh and blood reconstruction. If he wanted to return to his original state, he had to use lie to adjust it again. Lumian grabbed his satchel and left Aubert's Ducope door. On his way to Avenue du Marquet, he heard the chime of a bell, signaling that it was 1 p.m. Lumian retrieved the golden pocket watch he had borrowed from Sal de Ball Breeze and synchronized it with the distant tolling of the bell. The pocket watch would lose a minute every few days. After a journey of more than half an hour, Lumian arrived at Rouen Sien. His steps led him toward the alone bar, and his gaze naturally drifted across Sal de Ball Unique. At that moment, the establishment had yet to see many customers. Three guards, each sporting a monocle over their right eyes, lounged in various corners, engaged in sporadic conversations or drifting into daydreams. A postman in a distinctive blue uniform adorned with floral patterns parked his bicycle by the roadside and approached Sal de Ball Unique's mailbox, clutching a stack of letters. Like the guards, he too wore a monocle on his right eye. An inexplicable shiver coursed through Lumian's scalp, prompting him to avert his gaze and continue his course into the alone bar. Inside, the dimly lit atmosphere persisted, casting a shadowy ambience even at noon. At present, Lumian found himself the sole patron. The bartender stationed behind the bar counter was not the same individual as before. Instead, it was Leah, the Bureau 8 investigator, whom Lumian recognized. She was attired in a white shirt, a bow tie, and a black knee-length dress. Her hair had been elegantly tied into a simple bun, adorned with tiny silver bells, a departure from her previous appearance, exuding a distinct charm. Gin on the rocks, Lumian stated as he settled onto a barstool at the counter, tapping the surface lightly. A chuckle escaped him as he continued, Why do we have a new bartender? Leah cast a playful glance in his direction and quipped, Monsieur, there's no strict rule that dictates a bar must employ only one bartender. That would surely lead to their exhaustion. Fair enough, Lumian agreed, paying eight licks for his drink and patiently awaiting the arrival of his iced gin. After savoring his beverage for nearly ten minutes, he casually inquired, Is there a typewriter available here? I've just remembered a document I need to complete. Leah, wiping a glass, responded, In the room next to the theater in the cellar, there's a typewriter reserved for scripts. It costs two licks and one copet for each sheet of paper. That's quite pricey. Lumian muttered as he rose and entered the cellar with his glass of gin. He steered clear of the marionette theater, harboring some lingering unease from his previous encounter. Instead, he ventured into a nearby room. There was indeed a brass mechanical typewriter here, and a man engrossed in reading a newspaper beside it. Lumian, in line with his prior preparations, proceeded to type out a brief document. Some of the worn letters on the typewriter matched the information provided by Loki with uncanny precision. Satisfied with his work, Lumian offered payment to the silent man for his use of the typewriter and paper before promptly exiting the somewhat eerie basement room. As he returned to the bar's lobby, he was abruptly met with fugue, as he heard the faint chime of a bell. Lumian swiftly regained his composure and directed his gaze towards Leah, noticing that she displayed no signs of alarm or surprise. Did you hear the bell? Lumian inquired, placing his glass on the bar counter. Leah furrowed her brow. The hour has not yet struck. Why would the bell toll? Suppressing his bewilderment, Lumian finished his drink and departed the alone bar. While passing Sal de Ball Unique, he observed that only two guards with monocles remained stationed at the entrance. The postman was conspicuously absent. Without further ado, Lumian continued down the street, putting distance between himself and the establishment. As he boarded a public carriage headed back to the market district, the clock chimed two o'clock with impeccable precision. Instinctively, Lumian retrieved his pocket watch, opening it to check the time. To his astonishment, the pocket watch, which he had meticulously calibrated just an hour earlier, had once again slowed down. A minute slow. Chapter 381 Elimination Lumian carefully examined the pocket watch, ensuring that there were no mechanical issues. He hadn't bumped or jostled it in the past hour, so there should be no reason for it to malfunction. 
Ever since I calibrated my pocket watch, the only odd occurrence had been the fugue state and the faint ringing of a bell when I left the alone bar. Additionally, there is one less monocle-wearing guard at the entrance of Salle de Bal Unique. Could there be a connection between these events and the sudden one-minute slowdown of my pocket watch? Lumian pondered this seriously, trying to come up with possible explanations. He planned to write and inquire with Madame Magician once he returned to the market district. Normally, he wouldn't bother his major arcana card holder with such minor issues, but the pocket watch's abnormality had likely started on Ruan Sien. Moreover, there had been changes in Sal de Bal Unique's almonds. These were reasons to be cautious. Lumian stowed his pocket watch away. When the public carriage came to a stop, he swiftly disembarked and turned into a nearby street, keeping a vigilant eye on the people and animals passing by. He changed public carriages three times, each leading to different destinations, attempting to identify and elude any potential pursuers. This was the self-cultivation of a hunter. After completing this elaborate process, Lumian entered a department store. He placed the satchel containing the flawed boxing gloves in a public washroom cubicle, put on his lie earring, and reverted to his original appearance. He also swapped his brown jacket for a dark vest that he had kept in his satchel, transforming himself back into Seal Du Bois as he returned to Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief after sending the letter to Madame Magician, detailing his experiences with the fugue state, the faint bell chimes, and the alterations in Sal de Bal Unique's guards. Whenever he visited Rouen Sien, even though he never encountered a genuine disaster, he always felt an unsettling and inexplicable fear gripping his heart. The puppet messenger swiftly returned with a reply from Madame Magician. Your instincts are keen and accurate. The fugue you experienced and the bell chimes you heard were the result of Mr. Fool's Angel of Time. He located his target and obliterated Sal de Bal Unique along with all the almonds in Trier. The reason your pocket watch slowed down by a minute was also a consequence of this clash. In the near future, you needn't concern yourself with what Amon might do to you. Nevertheless, you should be aware that dealing with such a mythical creature is far from simple, and they cannot be completely annihilated. There are still numerous Amons lurking in the various countries of the northern and southern continents, and a few might even be concealed beneath Trier, beyond the reach of angelic powers. As Lumian read Madame Magician's response, he was momentarily stunned. That brief fugue he had experienced indicated a battle on an angelic scale? Had he not recently calibrated his pocket watch, he might not have gathered any substantial evidence. And if it weren't for the angelic Termoboros sealed within him, he might have suffered the same fate as Leah, unable to hear the bell or even be in a fugue state. Is this the might of an angel? The confrontation between the Angel of Time and Amon had not affected the ordinary people in the vicinity. Otherwise, the residents of Ruan Sien would have died without even realizing it. The pocket watch had fallen a minute behind. During my momentary fugue, an angel-level battle had unfolded. The Angel of Time, Mr. Fool's Angel of Time, possesses true mastery over time. Once one crosses the threshold into divinity, their array of abilities take on a mystical quality. The circle inhabitant's repetitive loop, the concealment power of the Evernight Pathway, Madame Magician's Door of Starlight, and now the Angel of Time's Bell Chimes, all of these surpass my wildest imagination. For the first time, Lumian didn't long for the power of a high sequence beyond her solely to resurrect his sister. It was an innate yearning. Lumian's spirits lifted at the prospect of no longer living in fear of almonds suddenly emerging from the shadows and thrusting him into peril. He offered genuine praise to Mr. Fool and the Angel of Time, as well as his major arcana card holder, Madame Magician. With a sense of relief, he incinerated the reply and made his way to apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Franco was waiting for his return with information about the Alone Bar and Loki. Good news and bad news. Which one do you want to hear? He inquired, still grinning, as he closed the door. Franca sized him up. You seem rather cheerful. The good news is that you found leads on Loki? The bad news is that we lack the strength to continue investigating? Neither. Lumian seized Franca's reclining chair. Franca was taken aback. 
she hadn't expected Lumian to be so shameless. Before Franca could voice her surprise, Lumian continued, the good news is that Mr. Fool's Angel of Time has taken action. Sal de Bal Unique and all of Trier's almonds have been wiped out. If Loki shows up at the next gathering, it means he hasn't been parasitized by an Amon. The bad news is that the copy of the information you bought was indeed created using a mechanical typewriter in the cellar of the Alone Bar. However, we can't continue our investigation while in Bureau 8's territory. I'm quite certain that it's Bureau 8's stronghold. Leo was already working there as a bartender. Franca's expression shifted between excitement and concern. Did you see Mr. Fool's Angel of Time? But why didn't I sense any obvious developments in Trier? Indeed, whether Loki is a member of Bureau 8 or not, asking directly about anyone who has recently used that mechanical typewriter will result in us being targeted by Bureau 8. And finding an excuse to use that typewriter to attempt divination with the last user might point to some members of Bureau 8 or even Saints. There must be a high sequence beyond or overseeing Bureau 8's stronghold diagonally opposite Sal de Bal Unique. Franca, her attention diverted to serious matters, forgot to ask Lumian to leave her exclusive seat. Lumian recounted the minute delay in his pocket watch and Madame Magician's reply, leaving Franca amazed and fascinated. After mentioning the Angel of Time, Lumian pondered for a moment and said, Loki didn't conceal his appearance well at the gathering. I suspect he possesses abilities similar to Nee's face or lie. Franca nodded. If he's truly an official member of Bureau 8, I believe he's a beyonder of the seer pathway. He's at least a sequence 6 faceless. Your lie corresponds to this sequence. Yes, many beyonders in Bureau 8 are from the seer pathway. Above magician is faceless. After Lumian obtained lie, he suspected that it belonged to the seer pathway but he didn't know the corresponding sequence name. That's right. This pathway becomes bizarre and difficult to kill after Sequence 7 Magician. It excels at transformations. At Sequence 5, its abilities are even more terrifying. It can silently turn a person into a puppet without a sense of self. Its name is Marionettist. Franca, who had entered the world of mysticism and joined the Tarot Club earlier than Lumian, clearly possessed more information about the pathways of the divine. After Lumian conversed with Franca about the seer pathway, the two of them fell into a dilemma about how to find Loki in reality. Just then, brisk footsteps echoed upstairs before Jenna opened the door to apartment 601. She glanced at Lumian, who was sitting in the recliner, and Franca, who was standing beside him, and asked in confusion, what are you guys talking about? We're pondering over a conundrum, Lumian clarified, informing Jenna that he and Franca were in trouble tracking an enemy with the code name Loki. Finally, he asked, any ideas? Jenna shook her head in amusement. You've rejected all the solutions I can think of. Without waiting for her companions to speak, she said thoughtfully, Seal, put yourself in Loki's shoes. Think of yourself as someone who likes to tease others. Think of everything that happened from their perspective and see if you can find any clues. Don't you also like pranks? You should have something in common with them. My pranks are quite different from theirs. Lumian didn't say it out loud. He tried to recall his motives, thoughts, and changes in mentality during the pranks to analyze the actions and motives of the April Fool's team. After a moment, he furrowed his brow. All pranks are meant to bring joy when the target is embarrassed or suffers a blow. Those people used my sister as a target for pranks, but they can't confirm the final outcome, so it's difficult for them to obtain true joy. Similarly, how are they going to track Franca's movements and witness her tragic end by instigating her to explore the underground? You have to know that even if Franca never goes to the mysticism gathering again, she might have encountered an accident due to something else. The three people in the room pondered this question. If a prankster failed to witness the end of a prank, they would lack a sense of accomplishment and the expected joy. How could Loki and the others determine Aurora or Franca's encounter? After a while, Lumian said in a deep voice, either the prank is a cover-up, and they have an ulterior motive, or they have a way to monitor the corresponding target. Franca suddenly felt a chill down her spine and subconsciously surveyed the room. What way? 
Jenna asked on her behalf. Lumian shook his head slowly. I don't know. This might be a lead. Amidst the alternations between silence and discussion, the three of them couldn't come up with an answer, so they could only put this matter aside for the time being. On his way back to Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian gazed at the afternoon sun and probed, Temaboros, can I find Loki through the prophecy spell? Termaboros's magnificent voice resounded, after you left Ruan Sien, if you hadn't done any anti-tracking, you would have encountered Loki. Chapter 382, Seizing the Opportunity If I hadn't used anti-tracking, I would have encountered Loki. Lumian was taken aback by Termaboros's response. All he wanted to know was whether the prophecy spell would work against Seer Pathway Beyonders. It didn't matter if Termaboros answered or not. As a contractee, he could answer his own question and acquire a bottle of prophetic concoction to test its effects. To his surprise, the inevitability angel did provide an answer. Lumian's mind raced as he dissected the information in that sentence. After leaving Ruan Sien, Loki had been tailing him for some time. The source of the copied information had been a trap. This noon, Loki had been at the alone bar. He deliberately chose the alone bar's mechanical typewriter to make a copy of the information. His plan was that anyone chasing him would discover it, allowing him to start tracking the other party, aiming for a lethal strike. And if the pursuer turned out to be formidable, he could ensure his basic safety by being inside Bureau 8's stronghold. He wouldn't be easily discovered. He could even manipulate Bureau 8, an official organization, to go after the other party. With this in mind, Lumian felt a mixture of regret and relief. Regrettably, he hadn't spotted Loki's pursuit after leaving Ruan Sien until the anti-tracking process was finished. This meant he had missed the founder of the April Fool's team. He could have had the chance to discuss muggle-related matters with him. But Lumian was also relieved because he wasn't prepared. If he had discovered Loki and was forced to act prematurely, there was a high chance he would have met a tragic end. After all, according to Franca's description, a Sequence 7 magician possessed many bizarre abilities. As a marionettist, they could silently eliminate others. If Loki had launched a surprise attack, Lumian wasn't sure if he would have had the opportunity to use Mr. K's finger. He also wasn't sure if he could have located the real Loki in time and escaped with the spell of Harumph. However, at this moment, regret outweighed relief in his heart. Lumian's pace towards Sal de Ball Breeze involuntarily slowed. He recalled his experience at the alone bar at noon. The bar was dimly lit, and it was well past lunchtime. Besides a couple of inebriated patrons chatting by the window, Leah, disguised as a bartender, appeared to be the only one on the first floor. From the cellar, which doubled as a marionette theater, he could occasionally hear conversations from different people. In the room with the mechanical typewriter, a man was reading a newspaper. He remained silent, his gaze fixed on the newspaper. Even when collecting the typing fee, he merely nodded. Which one of them was Loki? Lumian stopped diagonally across from Sal de Ball Breeze, his gaze unfocused. Clearly, Leah couldn't be Loki. It wasn't due to gender differences but rather her lack of sequence. According to Franca, Loki had a habit of revealing his appearance as of last year or even earlier. It was suspected that he had advanced to Faceless, and Leah was only a sequenced seven magician a few months ago. In the lifelike dream, she likely couldn't conceal her specific sequence. Lumian's suspicion gradually settled on the man who was engrossed in reading the newspaper and watching the typewriter. He has the ability to use the mechanical typewriter to duplicate information at will. It would be easy for him to notice if any strangers borrowed the typewriter. Lumian carefully recalled the man's appearance and realized he was entirely unremarkable. He was in his thirties, with black hair, blue eyes, and an average appearance, dressed in a plain black suit like any common clerk. Moreover, a marionettist can create marionettes. The man might just be one of those marionettes, not Loki, which is why he remained silent and pretended to read the newspaper. But if a marionettist can control people, can they also turn rats, cockroaches, bedbugs, and other creatures into marionettes? In that case, the possibilities are endless. 
every living thing in the alone bar could potentially be Loki. How could I ever hope to find him? What a vexing individual. Though his manifestations differed from those of the almonds, they are equally vexing. It's only thanks to the angel trapped within me, Mr. Fool's seal, and the blood emperor's aura that I could evade a marionettist, a seer beyond her, so far. Relying solely on anti-tracking and lie likely wouldn't be enough to escape Loki's grasp. How frustrating. The alone bar is Bureau 8's stronghold. I can't simply flush the real Loki out with a broad sweep. The more Lumian contemplated it, the more exasperated he became. Having successfully eluded pursuit, it seemed nearly impossible to bait Loki with a similar ploy. Anyone with a modicum of intelligence would smell a trap in this recurring situation. What's worse, frequent visits to the alone bar would undoubtedly attract Bureau 8's attention, further complicating matters. Lumian took a deep breath, exhaling slowly, forcing himself to regain his composure. He concentrated on his analysis of Loki. According to Anthony's theory, Loki and most members of the April Fool's team have high opinions of themselves. Otherwise, after experiencing despair for the future, they wouldn't seek solace in pranks. They would indulge in their desires and the pleasures of life. Is it possible to lure such a person into a trap they believe they had outsmarted? Lumian dismantled and reassembled various pieces of information in his mind, searching for a viable solution. His frustration grew, and he longed to storm into the alone bar and eliminate everyone except Leah. Then, an idea struck Lumian. While it might not form a direct plan against Loki, it could serve as a means to probe the situation at the alone bar, uncover exploitable details, and gather information. Additionally, it would provide an outlet for his emotions and anger, and perhaps even earn him some money. After careful consideration, Lumian turned around and made his way towards Rue Anarchy. Aubert's Du Coke Door, Room 401. Lumian pushed open the unlatched door, where he found the bankrupt merchant, Fitz, sitting at a wooden table, dipping a long, stick-like rye bread into a thick, sticky soup. Fitz glanced back, placing the food aside, and stood up, clearly confused and somewhat panicked. Monsieur Seal, what's the matter? The bankrupt merchant's brown hair appeared greasy, yet he stubbornly maintained a semblance of tidiness. His dark brown eyes and smile lines gave him a naturally ingratiating appearance. In contrast to their previous encounter, Fitz's clothes now bore a bit of dirt, as if he hadn't had the time to clean them. Lumian cut to the chase, his tone blunt. Can you provide evidence that Timmons owes you 100,000 verl d'or? The owner of Sal de Bal Unique. Fitz's eyes lit up. Yes. I have a contract for our joint venture. It clearly states that he agreed to repurchase his shares within a specified time frame, along with paying me 100,000 verl d'or and the corresponding profits. Monsieur Seal, you don't need to use Sal de Bal Unique to jog my memory about Timmons. I curse that scoundrel a hundred times a day. Monsieur Seal, do you believe there's a chance of recovering my money? Lumian's lips curled up. This could be your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If you miss it, you may never see that money again. Sal de Bal Unique was at its most vulnerable. Without the almonds, it was now inhabited solely by humans with varying degrees of mutation. Fitz was a mix of excitement and apprehension upon hearing this. He hastily retrieved the valuable contract and handed it over to Lumian. While he didn't entirely trust the mob leader, he had no choice but to place his hopes in him, praying that Lumian would return with good news. Cartier de l'Observatoire, Rouen Sien. Lumian changed his appearance and clothes. He walked towards Sal de Bal Unique in a shirt, vest, top hat, and thin formal suit. He encountered a guard sporting a monocle on his right eye and dressed in a short black suit, who obstructed his path. Monsieur, you must wear a monocle to enter our dance hall. Lumian responded with a smile. Monette introduced me here. He mentioned that I don't need to wear a monocle on my right eye, like you gentlemen. The two guards exchanged meaningful glances and exchanged knowing smiles. Then it's not an issue. From their appearances, it seems they are well aware of the consequences of being invited by Monette. 
They might even have been influenced by Monet's devious personality and secretly are faithful to Amon. Unfortunately, they remain oblivious to the fact that Sal de Bal Unique is no longer the same as they remembered. Lumian sneered inwardly and decided to seek out someone most resembling Amon later, intent on shattering their monocle with a punch. This act was both a release of his pent-up anger and fear from being manipulated and intimidated by Amon, and a means to catch the attention of the alone bar. After all, how would they know that someone could reclaim the money from Timmons? It was already evening, and gas wall lamps and stained glass chandeliers illuminated Sal de Bal Unique's dance hall. Dancers in monocles and short suits swayed on the dance floor while others leaned against the railings with glasses of wine, wearing smiles as they observed others dancing. Musicians played violins and the clarinet in one corner, contributing to the lively atmosphere. It appeared as though nothing unusual had occurred here. After observing for a while, Lumian made his way to the stairs leading to the second floor. The guard with a monocle, stationed at the top of the stairs, extended his right hand to block Lumian's path. He asked with an inscrutable smile, Who are you here to see? Lumian maintained a relaxed demeanor as he replied, I'm here to collect some debts from Timmins. Then you can't proceed upstairs, the monocled guard retorted, his tone almost amused, as if he were witnessing a comedy. Lumian's lips curled into a radiant smile. Bang! His left fist connected with the guard's face, sending the monocle flying. It crashed to the ground with a resounding crack. Chapter 383 Force Storming Amidst the sound of the monocle falling and sliding, the guard tilted his head, surprise and confusion crossing his face. His reaction was rather bizarre. He didn't react with anger or call for backup. It was as though he considered what had just happened a part of some performance filled with mystery. Lumian passed by with a smile, heading up the stairs without a second glance. The guard's expression flickered, but he eventually gave up trying to intervene. Still filled with puzzlement and thought, his eyes darted around, and a strange, anticipatory grin played on his lips, as if he expected something thrilling. As Lumian reached the second floor, the two guards with monocles simply watched him pass without hindrance. They wore similar enigmatic and expectant smiles. No low sequence beyond hers? Lumian muttered, disappointed. He had braced himself for a confrontation, something to showcase for the alone bar across the street. But, to his surprise, the other fake almonds in the Salle de Bal Unique were just regular folks. None of them seemed inclined to engage with him. It made sense, though. Amon wasn't like Mr. Fool or the Great Mother, capable of granting large-scale boons to believers. As for the low and mid-sequence beyonders, they had likely been dealt with. In the undetectable angelic struggle, they might have been eliminated. The remaining individuals probably had no idea that the dance hall had turned unusual, and many of their colleagues had vanished without a trace. They likely believed that Lumian was about to join them or go mad from some sort of prank. With no imposter Amon to confront, Lumian had no option but to improvise and enact the situation himself. He pulled his revolver from its holster and nonchalantly fired at the rooms on both sides of the corridor. Bang! 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 Each bullet hit a window with precision, the shattering glass echoing through the hall, accompanied by gunshots. The second floor guards were both surprised and perplexed by Lumian's actions. They suspected that he had been repeatedly fooled by a co-worker, leading to a mental breakdown. Otherwise, why would he be taking on the air and windows? Instinctively, the guards raised their right hands to adjust their monocles in their eyes. Their expressions became increasingly eager, as if they were anticipating the climax of this thriller. Go! confront the iceberg beneath the sea and the fear lurking in the darkness. After firing four shots, Lumian reached the largest office. He pushed the slightly ajar door open and found a man seated behind a massive wooden desk. The man had a wide forehead and narrow cheeks. His dark, slightly curly hair framed his face, and his light blue eyes seemed unfocused. He also sported a crystal-like monocle over his right eye and wore a loose, comfortable black robe. Timmons? Lumian inquired, entering with a furrowed brow. 
The man snapped out of his daze and responded with a sense of disappointment, as if he had lost something precious. I'm Timmins. You're not dead yet? Lumian asked, both surprised and amused. As far as he knew, the other members of Sal de Bal Unique were in a state of being a mon and not a mon. However, Timmins, the boss here, must have been deeply parasitized. Such a person should have perished in the angelic level battle, losing his life. But that wasn't the case. Timmins glanced at Lumian, maintaining the frustration and emptiness of someone who had lost their soul. Many people wish me dead, but they don't seem to have the power to curse me. Perhaps I'm already dead. All that's left is a shell. That's not important. What matters is that you return my client's 110,000 verl d'or, along with the interest, Lumian stated as he retrieved the contract from his satchel with his left hand, courtesy of the bankrupt merchant, Fitz. He anticipated Timmins' rejection of his request and an ensuing confrontation. Timmins shook off his despondency, raised a hand to his forehead, and smiled. There's cash and accessories in the safe. Help yourself. The password is 010103. I thought you'd put up a fight. Lumian sighed in disappointment. Timmins gazed at the revolver in Lumian's hand and remarked, I'm just a swindler, not a miser. I can swindle others again when I'm out of money. But if I'm dead, there's nothing left. Besides, I've already lost the most important thing today. Compared to that, 110,000 verl d'or is nothing. What do you mean you can swindle others if you're out of money? Haven't you ever considered becoming wealthy through legal means? Lumian pursed his lips and made his way towards the mechanical safe in the office. Three, two, one. As he approached the safe, he counted down, expecting Timmins to launch a surprise attack from behind. Yet, the owner of Sal de Bal Unique remained motionless. He didn't cry out for help or attempt to summon the police. Lumian crouched in front of the iron gray mechanical safe. Using the password provided by Timmins, he twisted the knob repeatedly until he heard a satisfying click. He glanced at the banknotes and gold bars that clearly exceeded 100,000 verl d'or, opened his satchel, and collected them all. With that task completed, Lumian raised his revolver, shattered the office window, and climbed out. Timmins's lips curled into a playful smile, one shared by everyone present. However, at that moment, Lumian unexpectedly spun around and pulled the trigger. Bang! A yellow bullet grazed Timmins's hair and embedded itself into a cabinet nearby. The monocle wearing Timmins's body tensed, and his smile disappeared. His eyes were filled with bewilderment. He even caught a whiff of something burning above his head. Lumian grinned and waved his hand. Surprised? With that, he leaped off the windowsill and landed in the alley behind Sal de Bal Unique. Timmins's expression gradually shifted now marked by confusion and bewilderment. Inside Sal de Bal Unique, the dancers with monocles on their right eyes and short suits went about their business, eagerly awaiting the intruder's descent, imagining him donning a monocle and officially joining their ranks. However, amid the intermittent gunshots, they failed to witness the spectacle they had anticipated. Near Place du Pertori in Rouen Sienne, there was a bell tower belonging to the eternal Blazing Sun Cathedral. Adjacent to the bell tower stood a newly constructed ten-story building. Franca, disguised as a typical female mercenary, positioned herself at the rooftop's edge with a brass telescope, her gaze fixed on the alone bar in the distance. Amidst the distant echoes of gunshots, Leah, the bartender clad in a white shirt, black bow tie, and a dark knee-length dress, emerged at the bar's entrance, her eyes directed towards Sal de Bal Unique, situated diagonally across from her. Before long, Frank observed gray rats emerging from beside Leah's feet. These rats crossed the street and disappeared beside the ancient building. After another two to three minutes, a man and a woman exited the alone bar, pushing their way through the guards and entering Sal de Bal Unique. Franca scrutinized the pair through her telescope and noticed that their expressions seemed animated and their movements agile when they interacted with the guards. However, as they crossed the street and passed by the guards, their expressions grew stiffer, and their movements became somewhat robotic. Marionettes? Franca speculated. 
As for the whereabouts of the marionettist who created and controlled these marionettes, she couldn't discern it at all. The only thing she could deduce was that the effective range of this ability spanned dozens of meters, if not more. Simultaneously, she couldn't help but complain, when there are people, they appear as real people. But when there's nobody around, the marionettist can't be bothered to maintain their facial expressions and character details? Isn't this too unprofessional? Or perhaps it's a tactic to intimidate occasional onlookers and passersby who happen to catch a glimpse? Franca maintained her vigil until Lumian had returned to his original form, changed his attire, and completed his anti-tracking measures. Even then, she couldn't spot the marionettist when he met up with her. Other than Leah, everyone else appeared to be marionettes. Franca conveyed her frustration to Lumian, isn't this level of caution and meticulousness excessive? I couldn't find anything conclusive. All I can confirm is that there's definitely a marionettist here, and it's highly likely that there's more than one. Just hearing her account made Lumian's head ache, much like when dealing with Amon. Could it be that they became neighbors because they excelled at concealing their true forms and were exceptionally elusive and hard to uncover? Is there no way to use magic mirror divination to gather some clues? Lumian pondered briefly before inquiring. Franca gently shook her head in response. This is the seer pathway. Unless I can directly possess one of the marionettes, I won't be able to locate their true bodies. Lumian fell silent as he gazed at the now tranquil Sal de Ball unique. Let's head back. At the next gathering, we'll gather information from I know someone, Hisoka, and Bard. They shouldn't be as elusive as Loki. We can still pretend to be duped and see if we can draw them out. When the time came, Hidden Blade couldn't step forward, Muggle would have to handle it herself. Franca had already purchased a copy of Loki's information and was among the potential suspects. Agreed, Franca concurred, realizing that this was their best course of action. The two of them promptly departed from the high-rise apartment and secured a four-wheeled, four-seater rental carriage. As the carriage reached the intersection between Cartier de l'Observatoire and Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, Franca turned to Lumian. Aren't you going to perform another anti-tracking procedure? Wouldn't relying on your anti-divination skills be sufficient? Lumian responded with a smile. Besides, after leaving Sal de Ball Unique, I've already undertaken several anti-tracking measures. Franca stared at him for a couple of seconds before letting out a resigned sigh. Fine. Avenue du Marquet, Market District. Lumian, carrying a satchel filled with banknotes and gold, said his goodbyes to Franca and proceeded towards Rue Anarchy. Franca, on the other hand, headed back to Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Rue Anarchy was as lively and crowded as ever. Lumian weaved his way through vendors and pedestrians, drawing closer to Aubert's du Coke door. Suddenly, he experienced an unsettling sensation. His body seemed to lose coordination, as if someone had injected glue into his joints. Chapter 384 Stagnation Not good. Lumian was both a hunter and a dancer, and his mastery over his body was amazing. Any unfamiliar or abnormal situation immediately triggered his instincts, alerting him to potential danger. But in that critical moment, his thoughts seemed to slow down, shrouded in a dense fog. Each idea froze, demanding tremendous effort to clear. I've been attacked. Loki is really. Here. Is this. The performance. Of a marionettist's abilities. As it nears the end. I won't be able. To think. Will I become his. Marionette? My sense of danger. Is clouded. Damn it. Termi. Boros, it's impossible. That you didn't notice. The changes in my fate. You didn't. Warn me. Did he intentionally tell me? That Loki. Nearly tracked me. To make me do it again? Me becoming Loki's. Puppet. Aids. Him and escaping. The seal? I can't just. Wait like this. I must resist with all my might. Where is? Loki. 
In these fragmented thoughts, Lung Lian strained to move. His hand found its way into his pocket, and he surveyed his surroundings with stiffness. Previously, he and Franca had discussed the limitations of the marionettist's power. They agreed that it must have a certain range or require proximity. Otherwise, it would exceed the capabilities of a Sequence 5 and only be within the realm of a saint who had transcended into godhood. Those from different pathways that Franca knew couldn't resist it at all. The duo believed that this ability either required a certain medium or could only be activated at a close distance. Just like the Ring of Punishment's psychic piercing, it could only be effective if the distance between them was reduced to five meters. Lumian suspected Loki was hiding nearby in the crowd, perhaps no more than ten meters away. What greeted his eyes were street vendors and passers-by. Some of their faces were familiar, while others were unfamiliar. They were no different from usual. In his haste, Lumian couldn't discern Loki among them. Adding to the challenge, Loki was a faceless, skilled in transformation and disguise. As Lumian continued his search for Loki, a crimson flame manifested in his left palm. His motives were twofold, first, to test his ability to resist a marionettist's control and invasion by inflicting pain upon himself, and second, to set a question and observe how Loki would respond. By studying Loki's reactions, he hoped to glean insights into Loki's exact whereabouts and weaknesses in his marionette-making abilities. But just as the searing pain coursed through his mind, Lumian heard a distinct snap. Instantly, the crimson flame in his palm dissipated into a harmless stream of light, unable to form anything explosive. Lumian spun around, trying to identify the source of the snapping of fingers. However, his joints had become encased in a sticky glue, and his movements grew increasingly rigid and sluggish. This delay caused him to turn a second slower than he intended. Everyone within his line of sight appeared normal, and he couldn't pinpoint who had snapped their fingers. Marionettist is indeed capable of flame controlling. Pain doesn't help much in the slowdown of my thoughts and stiffening of my body. It only marginally increased my reaction speed. I can't waste time on such matters. The most important thing now is to find Loki. Otherwise, whether I use the spell of Harumph, summon Mr. K, or wait for Franca to save me, wouldn't significantly change the situation. I wonder if spirit world traversal can be used. If the next two or three attempts fail. I'll give it a try and see if I can teleport out of a marionettist's ability range. Lumian's thoughts grew increasingly sluggish, but they weren't to the point where he couldn't think, react, or dodge any attack. Soon, with his rich combat experience, he came up with an idea. From the current situation, a marionettist indeed needs to be at close range, to gradually transform their target into a marionette. In that case, I'll make sure there's no one or animals within a 10 meter radius. Whoever lingers within the inferno hell shall be Loki. Once Lumian understood the situation, he immediately opened his mouth and shouted, There is a fire. Crimson flames surged from Lumian's body as he finished his staccato sentence. With his feet as the center, they spread out, igniting the fruit peels and litter on the ground. Alerted by Lumian's warning, nearby street vendors and pedestrians swiftly gathered their belongings and fled toward the ends of Rue Anarchy upon seeing the rising flames. Seeing their hasty retreat, Lumian's sluggish smile emerged. Yes, you can use flame controlling, but I'm not going to do any delicate maneuvers now. My only move is to constantly ignite the surrounding things and increase the variety of fire sources. 
Moreover, this will inevitably draw the attention of official beyonders. Crimson flames expanded in all directions, resembling a vibrant ocean gradually consuming the earth. Despite his faltering gaze, Lumian still managed to catch a glimpse of a figure flickering within the flames, a figure with black hair, blue eyes, and an ordinary face, blending in with the crowd of clerks on the road. After bidding Lumian farewell, Franca made her way toward Rue de Blouse's blanches. However, her journey took an unexpected turn as she suddenly veered into an alley, disappearing into the shadows. This demoness of pleasure began to stealthily make her way toward Rue Anarchy. This was her prior agreement with Lumian. If their initial plan of barging into Sal de Bal Unique failed to provoke the Beyonders in the Alone Bar or have them reveal themselves, they had a backup plan, a kind of fishing expedition after leaving Ruan Sien to see if they could encounter their target. Franca's earlier inquiry about Lumian's intention to engage in counter-tracking was essentially confirming if they should stick to their original strategy. Lumian's response had been affirmative. As Franca approached Rue Anarchy, she retrieved a mirror from the shadows. This mirror was a mirror substitution, crafted using Lumian's blood and hair. While it couldn't be used as a substitute for death or injury at this distance, it had a profound mystical connection to the original body. It could be employed to monitor Lumian's general condition. In simple terms, if the mirror were to suddenly shatter, it would signal that Lumian had met his demise. If it displayed a few deep cracks, it would indicate that Lumian had suffered severe injuries. Likewise, Franca had placed a mirror substitution on Lumian. This precaution was taken because they were uncertain whom Loki might target after their separation. They had no choice but to conceal themselves in the shadows and continue their activities. Through mirror substitution, they could keep tabs on each other's well-being and provide timely assistance. This method was more reliable than attempting to discern changes in luck, as Loki possessed formidable anti-divination abilities and could manipulate fate after making decisions. Franca, deep in her stealthy advancement, was suddenly alerted as the mirror in her hand grew icy cold. Utilizing her dark vision, she pierced through the shadows and witnessed the mirror's transformation into a lifeless gray, as if it had rusted or been submerged in the depths of an icy lake. Seal is under attack. Franca's heart tightened as she quickened her pace. Upon reaching Rue Anarchy, she was met with the sight of spreading flames. Within the Crimson Inferno, a figure flickered intermittently. Occasionally, it opened its mouth, producing a sharp bang. It sounded like a real gunshot, causing vendors and pedestrians to scatter in fear, believing a violent gunfight between the mobs was unfolding. Lumian, on the other hand, struggled to evade the attacks but he failed twice. The air bullets grazed his body, leaving noticeable wounds. However, it was clear that the figure didn't truly intend to harm him. It seemed more concerned about the potential complications that injuries might cause before a specific juncture. Relieved that Lumian was relatively unscathed, Franca retreated into the shadows and approached the battlefield cautiously. As she drew nearer, she retrieved a mirror and, disengaging from the shadows, directed the mirror toward the clusters of flames. Her right hand became enshrouded in zero-temperature black flames. When the figure appeared in the mirror's reflection, Franca swiftly ran her right hand across the mirror's surface. Silently, the figure burst into pitch-black flames. He swiftly thinned and shrank, transforming into an intricately cut paper figurine. Among the crowd, roughly 10 to 20 meters away, an unusually ordinary-looking man clad in a black suit emerged. Lumian's thoughts snapped back to full speed, and his body shook off the stiffness that had hindered him. In a flash, he vanished from his previous position and reappeared just seven meters away from the suspected Loki. Lumian then exclaimed, Mph. A brilliant beam of white light shot forth from his nostrils targeting the ordinary-looking man with black hair and blue eyes. Simultaneously, Franca acted in perfect coordination. She conjured a transparent ice spear and hurled it toward their target. Upon piercing the ground, white frost rapidly spread from the impact, chilling those nearby and causing their bodies to stiffen. At that very moment, a thin-faced passerby with brown hair and brown eyes interposed himself between Lumian and the suspected Loki intercepting the white beam created by Lumian. 
he appeared unharmed, his blank eyes gazing upwards as he began to sing an aria. Oh, my son. In an instant, it was as if a blinding sun had risen within the minds of Lumian, Franca, and others nearby, rendering their thoughts sluggish. Instinctively, the duo moved to evade, with one either retreating into the shadows while encasing herself in a crystalline and resilient frost or rolling to the side of the road and using the knee's face to alter his appearance. When the intense sunlight eventually receded, they found that both the man suspected to be Loki and the passerby singing the aria had vanished into thin air. Fearful glances from vendors and passersby were directed their way. Those closest to the spectacle had shut their eyes tightly, tears streaming down their faces. Chapter 385 Before and After Comparison Lumian swiftly assessed the surroundings, taking in the scattered gas street lamps and their flickering crimson flames. In the distance, figures moved about cautiously, but none dared to draw near. The individuals up ahead couldn't even open their eyes due to the blinding glare of the sun. In this situation, whether it was the suspected Loki or the passerby who had sung that aria, there was no sign of either of them. Son of a sow, did they just vanish into thin air? Lumian couldn't help but curse under his breath, his anxiety and anger mounting. Had they fled without even engaging in a proper battle? Did they disengage once a single strike failed? Damn it, were you born in the year of the rat? Slippery as eels, and they vanish at the drop of a hat. Franca cursed as she approached Lumian, using a peculiar phrase that seemed like a translation. The seer and marauder pathways are truly interchangeable. Their styles are too damn similar, aren't they? This was primarily evident in their inability to strike or capture the primary target. The key difference was that the seer pathway started behaving this way from sequence 7, while the marauder pathway might have to wait until they reached sequence 4 to exhibit such traits. Lumian's mind raced as he pondered how to track down Loki and his marionette. Perhaps they had already made their escape, or maybe they were lurking somewhere in the evening streets of Ruanarchy. A marionette. Yes, that Arya singing marionette had taken my spell of Harumph head on without flinching. That suggests there's a high chance it's already dead. No active, conscious spirit body. My near transformation into a marionette confirms this indirectly. If the marionette is dead, it probably doesn't possess the fate of a living being. No so-called luck. Even if there is, it's locked in darkness. That spells death. If we can't locate Loki, who possesses faceless powers, maybe we can start with his marionette. With this plan in mind, Lumian concentrated, carefully observing the destiny of the people standing more than 10 to 20 meters away. He scanned everything that had a destiny and wasn't shrouded in darkness. After a rapid survey, Lumian couldn't identify any potential marionette targets. He let out a slow, disappointed sigh. Let's get out of here. The firefighters are on their way. Official Beyonders should be arriving soon, Franca warned Lumian. Lumian withdrew his gaze and left Rue Anarchy before the crimson flames could be extinguished. His intention was to take a circuitous route back to Aubert's Du Coke door. There, he would return the scammed funds he had obtained from Sal de Ball Unique to the bankrupt merchant, Fitz, and claim his share as agreed. After taking a dozen steps, Lumian suddenly remembered Monsieur Rohr, who had succumbed to illness, and Madame Michel, who had hanged herself while singing the Capital of Joy. He feared that he might unwittingly bring a catastrophe involving Beyonder Powers to Aubert's Du Coke door and his entrustee, Fitz. Aurora had portrayed despicable and deranged criminals in two of her novels. They relished beginning their torment with those their targets held dear, forcing them to witness the tragic deaths of their friends one by one. As the leader of April Fools, Loki took pleasure in manipulating others' minds. He had no qualms about harming his comrades, let alone murdering innocent people he had never met. Therefore, the likelihood was high that he would commence with Lumian's acquaintances and employ their deaths to shatter Lumian's psyche. He would secretly revel in watching Lumian descend into madness before seizing the opportunity to end his life. Though it was only a possibility, Lumian refused to take the risk. He halted and turned towards Avenue du Marquet. What's the matter? 
Frank inquired, her expression one of confusion. Having regained his composure, Lumian flashed a reassuring smile and replied, let's grab a drink at Sal de Ball Breeze. The fate of the mobsters he frequently associated with was of lesser concern. Mobsters knew they had to be prepared for such eventualities. Franco was momentarily taken aback but quickly grasped Lumian's underlying worry. Loki had hooked a big fish but failed to capture it. It was clear he had seen through their true appearances. He could hide in the shadows and wait for the perfect moment. As for Lumian and herself, unless they abandoned their current identities and used their anti-divination and anti-tracking abilities to survive elsewhere, they would be left in a state of constant suspicion, fearing that any rat they saw might attack them. Compared to Aubert's Du Coq door, the second floor of Sal de Ball Breeze offered a quieter and more defensible location. Furthermore, in the event of a beyond-a-level confrontation, it was better to involve mobsters rather than innocent bystanders. I'll change my attire as well, Franca hinted, indicating her desire to alter her appearance and remain hidden in the shadows, making it difficult for Loki to locate her and launch any potential attacks. Similarly, she intended to have Jenna return home and stay with her brother for a while to avoid becoming collateral damage. In the face of such a bizarre and terrifying adversary, the survivability of an instigator remained too fragile. Lumian gently patted the concealed Franca's mirror substitution hidden beneath his clothing with his right hand, signaling the need for them to watch each other's backs. Franca nodded solemnly, affirming her understanding of the situation. Sal de Ball Breeze, the café on the second floor. Lumian settled at the far end near the window and turned to his bodyguard, Sarkota. Go to Aubert's Du Coke door and fetch a bankrupt merchant named Fitz. With such an intermediary, Fitz would appear to have achieved his objectives through his association with the Savoy mob, and there was no direct connection to Seal Du Bois. If Loki intended to select a victim, he would likely focus on the Savoy mob members affiliated with Lumian. With the weighty satchel resting on his lap, Lumian patiently awaited Fitz's arrival while contemplating the Loki-related issues at hand. Having lost track of the April Fool's leader, Lumian was left with only certain phenomena to guide him in this matter. One of the details was an option Lumian had predetermined before taking action. If Loki had indeed taken the bait, why did I manage to elude this April Fool's leader's tracking abilities using anti-tracking techniques in my previous encounter but not this time? Upon leaving Sal de Ball Unique, Lumian had intentionally followed the same anti-tracking procedures as before. He reverted to his original appearance, changed his clothing, and modified his satchel. However, as he traversed Rouen Sien again and reunited with Franca, he refrained from employing any anti-tracking measures. This was done to establish a comparative sample and identify any discrepancies. After all, if he failed to capture the bizarre and seemingly unkillable Loki, his efforts would be in vain. He needed to gain something valuable from this encounter. This was a smaller trap concealed within a larger one. Logically, if my anti-tracking procedures had shaken off Loki previously, there should be no reason for an exception this time. I had meticulously paid attention to the people and creatures around me, even avoiding the watchful eyes of birds in the sky. Even if a mere insect became one of Loki's marionettes, it would struggle to keep up with my swiftness. Therefore, either Franca had been targeted early in the morning, or Loki recognized me when I passed through Rouen Sien again after my anti-tracking. Franca carried out anti-divination procedures and was a distance away from the alone bar and Sal de Ball Unique. She didn't even enter Rouen Sien and had used non-mystical methods to observe. It's unlikely that she'll be exposed so quickly unless Loki was aware from the outset that such an observer would be present. The likeliest scenario was that Loki had recognized me when I passed through Rouen Sien again after my anti-tracking procedures. But how had this recognition occurred? I had reverted to my original appearance, altered my clothing, and even chosen to pass through in a rented carriage to avoid suspicion. According to Anthony, this should have concealed my unchanged leather shoes from prying eyes and hidden my typical gait and body language. I had even applied cologne to mask my original scent. What unique characteristics do I possess that allows Loki to discern my identity within such a brief period? Lumian compared the differences and gradually arrived at a hypothesis. 
either a marionettist or one of his marionettes possesses the ability to directly identify a person at the level of their soul, consciousness, or some other aspect, or Loki can perceive distinctive traits that set me apart from others, such as Inevitability's Angel, Mr. Fool's Seal, or the Blood Emperor's Aura. Although Lie belongs to the Seer Pathway, it does not have a readily detectable convergence force that corresponds to Loki's sequence. The more Lumion pondered, the more convinced he became that Loki had a means of piercing his disguise, but his tracking abilities were limited. A vigilant target who remained wary of strangers, animals, birds, and insects while being impossible to carry out any direct divination would successfully evade him. Regardless of how Loki told him apart, this was the best explanation when carrying out the before and after comparison. With this in mind, Lumian had a new idea. Lumian's lips curled slightly as he cast his gaze toward the dark night sky. Fifteen minutes later, Fitz, the bankrupt merchant, was brought into the café by Sarkota Lumian signaled for Sarkota to step aside momentarily and addressed Fitz, I've already recovered the money. How much do you think you should receive? As he spoke, Lumian emptied the banknotes, gold coins, and valuable accessories onto the table, his eyes briefly scanning over them. About 130,000 verl d'or in total. Fitz blurted out, 60,000, no, 50,000. No, just give me 30,000 verl d'or. With a smile, Lumian separated a few bundles of neatly bound banknotes and tossed them to Fitz. As we agreed, the interest belongs to me and I'll take 50% of the principal. Here's 50,000 verl d'or. Fitz accepted the money with gratitude, expressing his heartfelt thanks. While he didn't receive the full amount, 50,000 verl d'or was a substantial sum that would enable him to start anew with hope in his heart. 50% of the principal along with interest was a fair arrangement. Lumian was equally pleased. Through the operation facilitated by the Angel of Time by Mr. Fool's side, he had effortlessly gained 50,000 verl d'or in banknotes and 30,000 gold coins. After all, he had worked so hard to gather gold, but in the end, he only accumulated 75,000 gold. Deep in thought, he contemplated the idea of purchasing sacrificial offerings from the corresponding domain as a token of gratitude to Mr. Fool and the Angel of Time. After waiting for over half an hour, Lumian ascended to the bedroom on the second floor. He discarded his satchel and employed Lai to alter his appearance once more, assuming the likeness of a male aurora with black hair and brown eyes. He changed into a shirt, vest, trousers, and leather boots, stowed away Lai, and transferred the flawed boxing gloves into his briefcase. He carefully surveyed the scene beyond the window. Once he confirmed that no humans, rats, or birds were in the vicinity, Lumian pushed open the window and gracefully leaped out seemingly unaware that Loki might possess the ability to see through his disguise. Chapter 386 Caution In the dark and deserted back alley, Lumian carefully navigated the maze of discarded refuse infested with rats and cockroaches. His movements were deliberate, alternating between rapid dashes and cautious steps, sudden changes in direction, and even a few circles as if he were evading an unseen pursuer. Finally, he arrived at Rue de Blouse's Blanches and entered the seemingly abandoned safe house, whose lease had not yet expired. Following a process, he pulled the heavy curtains shut and meticulously inspected every corner of the room. Compared to before, he not only eradicated the bedbugs and routed the rats, but he also left no room for tiny, rice-grain-sized flying insects. He demanded absolute cleanliness. With that done, Lumian seated himself at the table. He smoothed out a sheet of paper and began to write. Honorable Madam Hila, when I took part in the April Fool's team discussion masquerading as my sister, Muggle, I couldn't help but notice the peculiar reactions of Hisoka, Mad Lady, Bard, and Ultraman upon Muggle's unexpected return after her prolonged absence. I suspect I know someone was the psychiatrist Muggle sought in her final moments. Simultaneously, they were collaborating with Loki in a ruse, hoping to entice members from other teams to embark on a subterranean quest for the remains of the ancient sun god. I believe Loki is the de facto leader of April Fools. If there's anything awry with the others, it undoubtedly concerns him as well. 
Consequently, I acquired a copy of the ancient sun god's information from him and enlisted divination services to examine the mechanical typewriter responsible for producing the text. It happened at the Alone Bar on Rouen Sien and Trier Cartier de l'Observatoire. Following some field investigation, it became apparent that this locale serves as the stronghold for Bureau 8. However, Loki appears to have set his sights on me. I was assaulted in the evening and narrowly escaped becoming his marionette. My escape, though, exposed my true identity to him. As I write this letter, I find myself in the safe house I had previously prepared. Nevertheless, I can't be certain whether I have eluded Loki's pursuit. I strongly suspect there's something amiss with him. If left unchecked, he could pose a grave threat to the research society in the days ahead. I hope to receive your assistance. Lumian felt no shame in laying out his intentions plainly. His plan was to make himself the bait that would draw Loki out of hiding, while Hela, with her ability to harness concealment, would lurk in the shadows, ready to deliver the decisive blow to the leader of April Fools. Perhaps only Hela, with her superior sequence and mastery of concealment, had a chance of evading detection and discovering the true body of their bizarre and unkillable adversary. After folding the letter, Lumian swiftly arranged the altar and summoned the pure silver skull adorned with pale white flames in its eye sockets. Franca stealthily made her way back to apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. She used her persuasive abilities to convince Jenna to temporarily vacate the premises for a couple of days. Only after Jenna repeatedly confirmed that she would be of no assistance did she reluctantly give up her facade of bravery, departing amidst a string of curses. Quickly, Franca changed into different attire and donned the disguise props she had acquired from Rentis, a member of the Bliss Society, transforming her appearance entirely. As she applied makeup, she couldn't help but curse Fate's mother. Damn it, I shouldn't have let Jenna go so soon. She's much better at handling these things than me, and her makeup skills are superior. Such skills were fundamental for an apprentice actress. With a simple disguise in place, Franca seamlessly shifted between invisibility and concealment within the shadows, weaving her way through the market district. She made a concerted effort to thwart any attempts at divination and employed anti-tracking techniques learned from Lumian. Finally, she returned to Rue de Blouse's Blanches and entered Building 6. This was the safe house she had prepared for herself, conveniently overlooking her original residence. Phew. Franca, having completed all the procedures, heaved a sigh of relief and lay down in the Lowen-style recliner. Simultaneously, she muttered to herself, I've only known Seal for less than three months. Why does it feel like I've experienced more in this time than in the past year? Is this guy some sort of jinx reincarnate? In the secure confines of the safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches, Lumian patiently waited for nearly fifteen minutes. Then, from the abrupt darkness, the pure silver skull's head emerged, clutching a simple folded letter in its skeletal teeth. Thank you, Lumian replied habitually, accepting the letter. If Hila was unwilling to engage with a suspected member of the curly-haired baboon's research society, Lumian had no choice but to abandon his current plan and swiftly locate Franca. He would guide her through spirit world traversal to distant locales like the Hill District, Cartier Arast, and other suburbs before returning. He felt that it was the only way to evade Loki's pursuit or lock on. Moving openly was out of the question unless he shifted to an entirely different area. Lumian unfolded the paper and discovered that Hila's response was succinct, got it. A wry smile curled at the corners of Lumian's mouth as he conjured crimson flames from his hand, igniting the reply. Without delay, he restored the table's surface to its ordinary state and reverted to his original appearance, aided by the lie earring. Next, Lumian extinguished the carbide lamp and reclined on the bed, closing his eyes and feigning slumber. As minutes slipped away, night settled in, and Rue de Blouse's blanches descended into stillness. The crimson moonlight filtered through heavy curtains, casting a subdued, eerie glow within the room. After an indeterminate span of time, a small, grayish-black figure emerged from a concealed crevice in the corner, a nondescript rat. Soundlessly and stealthily, the rat approached the table, ascending its surface. It moved about with deliberate intent, as if surveying its territory for any signs of intrusion. 
After a brief inspection, it halted its actions and retreated into the shadowy corners untouched by the dim moonlight. Its body now faced the bed. The rat fixated its gaze upon Lun Lian with an unervingly human-like intensity. It appeared to meld with the darkness, assuming a statue-like stillness, completely immobile and unwavering in its focus on Lun Lian. Nearly ten minutes passed, and faint, nearly imperceptible footsteps echoed from the corridor outside the apartment. Tap, tap, tap. The footsteps drew nearer. Abruptly, the footsteps vanished as if they had never been or had come to a standstill at some unseen juncture. The rat retreated from the shadowy realm untouched by the crimson moonlight, traversing the table and vanishing through the same crevice it had emerged from. With swiftness, it disappeared, leaving the room in an even deeper silence, broken only by the faint sound of Lumian's slow, rhythmic breathing. Lumian didn't open his eyes. His body was very relaxed as if he had truly fallen asleep. Six Rue de Blouse's Blanches, in an apartment. Franca reclined in the recliner, swaying back and forth with the chair. Troubled, she pondered what to do next. With such a bizarre and terrifying foe lurking in the shadows, the constant sense of being watched had left her restless, and she couldn't find solace whether sitting or standing. I need to resolve this quickly. One can be a thief for a thousand days. But how can you guard against a thief for a thousand days? One misstep, and it's all over. Why don't I abandon the mission and relocate? Or I can go all out and ask Madam Judgment for help to apprehend Loki under the pretext that the mission will likely fail. It's feasible, but I'll shoulder a debt that I won't be able to repay until I become a demigod. Even if Seal takes half of it, it'll be a heavy burden. We can also ask Madam Hela to convene an emergency gathering and accuse Loki and the others of causing Muggles' death on the spot. We can request that we find reliable members to interrogate each other and see which side is lying. Ah, uh, we can't be entirely sure if there's really something wrong with Loki and the others, but it's certain that I colluded with an outsider and lured in a spy. The more Franca thought about it, the more frustrated she became. She used proverbs from her homeland and didn't deliberately change it. Suddenly, an overwhelming sense of danger gripped her, and simultaneously, an eerie chill crawled up her spine. Her body stiffened, and a figure reflected in her lake-like eyes. Clad in a short black formal suit typical of clerks, with neatly combed brown hair, a face bearing southern continent heritage, and dull green eyes. Wraith! The word flashed through her mind as she recognized the nature of the impending attack. Franca's thoughts became hazy, and her right hand instinctively rose, as if resisting an unseen force. She channeled the spirituality within her soul body, preparing to unleash the black flames of a demoness. This ability targeted a spirit body and was capable of incinerating wraiths. Demonesses possessed a heightened resistance to such flames compared to other pathways and they could even use injuries to escape or severely harm their adversaries. At that moment, Franca heard a magnetic voice. It's futile. Surrender. The sound pierced Franca's mind like sharp arrows, interrupting her attempt to condense the black flames. As soon as the voice faded away, her mind seemed to be shrouded in a thick fog, and a thick frosted glass appeared in front of her. The voice continued. I didn't use my full strength in the evening to test the waters. The person impersonating Muggle with a high-level existence sealed in him must possess some special abilities. If I hadn't done my best to gather information, I might have been the one to die. After the probe, things got even more interesting. I went to his place just now and felt that it wasn't safe enough. Therefore, I plan to turn you into my marionette and launch a surprise attack. <laughs> Do you think you can escape my grasp? There's something special about us. As long as we're within a kilometer of each other, I can use the power of a great existence to sense your location. I've long yearned for a demoness to be my marionette. It'll definitely taste good. Franca's spirit body was repeatedly affected by the sound, interrupting her efforts to activate mirror substitution and condense black flames in advance. Her thoughts became increasingly sluggish, and her joints felt as if they were filled with glue. Can Loki sense my location? What's so special? Why can he 
Before Franca could piece together any answers or formulate a complete response, the magnetic voice, now with a sinister smile, continued, I can't waste any more time. I must accelerate to avoid unforeseen complications. At this point, the voice turned respectful and recited in Franca's unusually familiar language, the immortal Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings, the Sky Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings. Chapter 387, Vile In the room with the thick curtains, Lumian suddenly felt the mirror substitution inside his clothes turn abnormally cold. Even through the linen shirt, he couldn't help but shiver. His heart tightened. He couldn't afford to feign sleep anymore. He sat up and took out the mirror. Beneath the faint crimson moonlight, the mirror lost its luster, its surface resembling ice. Lumian knew that Franca was in danger. Without hesitation, he activated the mystical connection between the substitute and its true form, emitting a dim light from the black mark on his right shoulder. In an instant, Lumian vanished from the bed, reappearing in the living room at six Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Almost simultaneously, Lumian saw the surroundings engulfed in an eerie grayness, a fog obscuring the crimson moonlight. Franca lay in a recliner, her body contorting as if she fought for survival. Her lake-colored eyes were filled with a turbulent mix of emotions, anger, fear, anxiety, and worry. A vague figure seemed to encircle her. Her head tried to move, but her movements were restrained by invisible threads. Suddenly, the sound of nails scraping on a blackboard assaulted their senses, incomprehensible words piercing their spirit bodies. Their consciousness soared upward until they reached a dark void shimmering with countless stars. In the highest reaches of this void, mysterious symbols swirled, their forms beyond description. They coalesced into a dynamic, otherworldly door that defied the intrusion of even the moon's crimson light. Lumian and Franca's spirits were drawn inexorably toward the door. As they approached, a faint voice emanated from within, a voice that seemed to hold the secrets of the entire universe, as well as the madness, self-destruction, and darkness lurking within every heart. With each step toward the dynamic door, the maddening ramblings grew more intense, causing their heads to throb in agony. Yet an overpowering, primal urge compelled them to enter, to merge with the formless entity behind the door, and to partake in a clandestine pact that promised essential, primordial, extraordinary, and potent knowledge. Amidst the sea of incomprehensible symbols, the door stood slightly ajar, allowing invisible entities to pass through. With a resounding hum, Lumian and Franca's minds were plunged into a state of blankness, as if struck by a relentless force. The chaotic ravings they had heard coalesced into grotesque, shadowy entities that corroded their very soul bodies and physical bodies. Franca's eyes widened, and her flaxen-colored hair fluttered in the windless air, vaguely thickening. Blood seeped from the corners of her eyes, nostrils, ears, mouth, and pores, as if a demon was trying to separate her flesh from her skin. Franca's thoughts were in a state of intense disorder, as if a human had been thrown into a factory blender. Seizing the moment, the wraith that had been attached to Franca detached itself from the demoness of pleasure. This wraith, dressed in a sleek black suit, its eyes flickering with a sinister green hue, let out a piercing shriek. A cacophonous shattering sound, both illusory and real, filled the room as Franca's body vanished from the recliner and reappeared in the bedroom. Her mirror substitution had been activated instinctively, saving her from losing control, but she remained unconscious, collapsing on the spot. Beneath the shattered mirror's reflection on the recliner, Lumian, though still affected by the ravings and shrieks, fared better than Franca. His extensive experience with advancing sequences and invoking boons where he met with more potent and terrifying murmurs had fortified his resistance against such assaults. Despite the excruciating headache, scattered thoughts, and ruptured capillaries in various places, he retained some semblance of instinctual reaction and basic cognition. His face contorted grotesquely amidst the blood, but he held on. In the next moment, the wraith disappeared from the recliner and manifested within Lumian's blue eyes. His mind instantly fogged, and his body grew frigid, as if his very blood had turned to ice. Still capable of thought, Lumian promptly utilized his spirit world traversal ability to escape the room, teleporting several hundred meters away. 
he understood that a marionettist couldn't naturally transform into a wraith, and the wraith that possessed him was likely a marionette. With their distinctive combat styles, it was improbable for a marionettist to engage directly. Therefore, once the marionette was beyond the marionettist's range, it would lose control and become useless. When the time came, Lumian would teleport back and attempt to take Frank away. While this would leave him essentially incapacitated, it would also disable Loki's marionette. The adversary would then need to decide whether to launch a direct assault or retreat cautiously, as he couldn't predict how many teleportations Lumian's spirituality could endure, a capability unusual for a pyromaniac. Loki's assessment might not be entirely accurate in this regard. Just as Lumian was on the verge of activating his spirit world traversal mark, he heard a magnetic voice, give up. The words pierced Lumian's spirit body, disrupting his intentions. Subsequently, his thoughts grew sluggish, and his body stiffened. The magnetic voice chuckled softly. I don't know what kind of trap you've set in your room, but it likely involves Hela, doesn't it? After all, without her cooperation, you couldn't have masqueraded as Muggle and infiltrated the research society, could you? Lumian Lee, Aurora Lee's brother, I've seen your wanted poster. In Trier, the easiest beyond her to come into contact with is from the Hunter Pathway. That's why there's a saying, never fight a hunter on his turf. No one knows what sort of strange traps hunters have laid in their turf. I didn't want to take that risk nor did I plan to face Hela directly. Although I'm not overly concerned about her unless she's found a way to become a demigod, why would I engage her on a hunter's turf? My choice was to stage a surprise attack on Hidden Blade, drawing you out and away from your turf to fight on a ground of my choosing. After this afternoon's reconnaissance, I confirmed that both of you possess an item capable of monitoring each other's condition or a mysticism connection, likely the exchange of mirror substitution. <laughs> Ever wonder what my other marionette was doing during that time? In truth, I have no intention of killing Hidden Blade or turning her into a marionette. A living demoness serves my purposes better. I can use this encounter to make her suffer and despair. When she advances to sequence for using that, I'll have a demigod marionette. The voice carried no provocation, yet each word ignited a burning rage within Lumian. These words continued to disrupt Lumian's mind and spirit body, interfering with his abilities. With the dual constraints of wraith possession and marionettist, Lumian resembled a statue, unable to speak or move. He stood frozen, awaiting the inexorable verdict of fate. A thin gray fog enveloped the room, sealing off all sound from the outside world. The magnetic voice chuckled again, its taunting words continuing. It really shouldn't have been so complicated but you see, you have a high-ranking individual sealed within you. To ensure my own safety, the only option is to turn you into a marionette. I have no desire to face a high-ranking being after your demise. Who knows if he'll thank me or finish me along the way. Curious how I recognized you, aren't you? It's highly unlikely that others would sense the seal within you, but in my eyes, it's as conspicuous as a firefly in the night. The moment you entered the room with the typewriter, I knew you were the one impersonating Muggle. So, unless you could maintain a considerable distance from me, like the first time you tried to evade my tracking, I could have followed you without the aid of my marionette. Indeed, when you showed up at the gathering and joined our April Fool's team, I sensed that something was amiss. I suspected that Muggle had used a seal to escape the fragmentation of her soul. Little did I know, she was truly deceased. You are her brother. Ha ha, I still remember, in the latter part of last year, every time she attended a gathering, she sought out I know someone to treat her psychological issues and the hidden dangers arising from the improper use of the soul summoning spell. And I know someone would divulge her pain, struggles, vulnerabilities, and transformations to all of us each time. It's quite vile, completely against the doctor's principles, but it's fun and interesting. It gave us a sense of accomplishment and made us all laugh. Upon hearing this, Lumian's mind buzzed. He had been mildly annoyed by Loki's earlier critiques, but now, as Loki recounted Aurora's experiences, his anger reached a boiling point. Aurora had been genuinely unwell, seeking treatment from a doctor. However, not only did this doctor patronize her, 
but he also derived amusement from her suffering. He repeatedly violated her privacy, sharing her struggles and illnesses with others, leading them to mock her behind her back. What made it all the more despicable was that this group of individuals had sold Aurora the soul summoning spell. Damn it. Every single one. Of them. Deserves death. They deserve. The most tragic way. Of death. Though Lumian's mind remained ensnared in stasis, his anger finally erupted. It surged through his spirit and coursed into his flesh. He couldn't control it not under the constant interference. Crimson flames erupted from Lumian's body, and small red tendrils protruded from his eyes, radiating a malevolent blood-red hue. It was a precursor to losing control. If this continued, he would truly lose control. But Lumian felt no fear. Instead, he cooperated. Even if I lose control and turn into a monster. Or a lunatic. I will drag you, all of you, into the abyss. Relying on his body's instinctive reaction, crimson flames spread in all directions, incinerating the wraith, igniting furniture, and causing a fire. Unfortunately, this fiery onslaught proved ineffective against the wraith form Marionette and Loki, who remained concealed somewhere beyond reach of the flames. Its sole purpose, for those brief two seconds, was to disrupt the magnetic voice. It's useless. I know you mainly aim to use the flames to signal for help from the outside world rather than attacking me directly. But I've previously deceived Hidden Blade. Despite my claims of accelerating the progress, I actually harness the power of the Grey Fog to create a unique environment that isolates information here. While you can indeed break through the residual fog barrier if you go all out since I can't ask for too much power, I can't allow that. As Loki finished speaking, a frenzied, terrifying, violent, and exaggerated aura exploded from Lumian's body. It shredded the thin fog and shot skyward. Chapter 388 An Unquiet Night As the frenzied and violent aura surged out of the thin gray fog, six Rue de Blouse's blanches trembled slightly, as if in shock. In the various rooms of the building, the bodies of those who were already sound asleep involuntarily trembled, plunging into a blood-red nightmare. Those who were still awake looked around in surprise and confusion, as if they had been transported back to a time when barricades were everywhere and gunshots echoed through the air. On a bed in a quiet room diagonally below Franca's apartment, a man whose eyes had been tightly shut, seemingly asleep, suddenly snapped awake. He gazed up warily and fearfully at the source of the terrifying aura. At the same time, beneath at least St. Robert, within the Market District's Inquisition's office, Angouline de Francois, who was on night duty, leaped to his feet and prepared to rush to the area where mystical items were sealed. He hoped to enhance his ability to handle accidents and disasters in a short period. In other rooms, Imra, Valentine, and the others also sensed the violent aura that seemed to shake all of Trier. Some trembled, while others turned pale. This was even more terrifying than the Tree of Shadow disaster. However, they didn't stand still. Some dashed out of the room to rendezvous with Angulim, while others raised their arms and hastily prayed to the sun before sprinting toward the Eglise St. Robert above. Cartier de la Cathedral Commemorative, 11 Rue de Fontaines. Gardner Martin, who had been stroking his full-body armor, furrowed his brow and cast a puzzled glance toward the southeastern region. He felt something calling to him, causing his blood to boil. Deep underground in Trier, Olsen, the starved bear-like man who had been lugging a small brown suitcase, suddenly perked up his ears to listen for any nearby movements. The distant sounds of killings and shouts faintly reached him. The supervisor of the Iron and Blood Cross Order's eyes flashed with ferocity and madness. He extended his right hand and pressed it against his neck. An indiscernible thread emerged, emitting fiery blood. In the island district at the center of the Srenzo River, the eternal blazing sun church's St. Vive Cathedral was already shrouded in darkness. Only the nearby bell tower remained lit, but at that moment, the slumbering cathedral suddenly bathed in brilliant sunlight. Sunlight flooded the onion-like domes, illuminating every stained-glass window. 
To the north of Trier, in the heart of the cathedral district, towering iron-black chimneys loomed above the god of steam and machinery's patriarchal cathedral. Rumbling sounds echoed as the massive steam engine installed within the cathedral roared to life. Vast amounts of pale white fog billowed forth from the forest-like chimneys, enshrouding the night sky. In Cartier Arast, a small town very close to the Sacred Heart Cloister, a golden retriever and the lady beside it turned and gazed into the distance of Trier's metropolis. Within Red Swan Castle, Count Poufer, already lying on his bed, opened his eyes. He sensed the entire ancient castle become extremely oppressive, and nightmarish roars and screams echoed from deep underground. At that moment, the Beyonders in the Market District and powerful figures elsewhere in Trier were distracted by the undisguised and flamboyant aura of madness. Hidden in a room diagonally below Franca's apartment, Loki had just reacted to the violent and terrifying aura. Before he could summon back the wraith that had possessed Lumian and use it to escape through the spirit world with him out of caution, the surrounding darkness instantly intensified, swallowing the crimson moonlight and bringing an extreme calmness to the area. He couldn't resist closing his eyes, he wasn't even aware of it. He tumbled backward onto the bed and fell into a deep slumber. Lumian's thoughts returned to normal. He channeled his anger, pouring all his pent-up emotions into the crimson flames. Go to hell! With a low growl, he took a left step forward, his eyes protruding with red vessels while twisting his waist and swinging his right fist with all his might. With a muffled explosion, the flames on Lumian's body coalesced on the surface of his fist, naturally condensing into a blazing white fireball. The blazing white fireball shot from Lumian's right fist, following a predetermined path, and crashed into the wall beside the apartment. The voice he had just heard emanated from behind the wall. Boom! A large hole tore through the wall, revealing a man standing in the corridor. He had brown hair, brown eyes and a gaunt face. He was the marionette Loki had employed that evening. He was the one who had been speaking. Before Lumian could realize that he hadn't found the real Loki, darkness surged over him like a tidal wave, engulfing him. Having already vented his anger in flames, Lumian's heart quickly calmed. He subconsciously closed his eyes and slowly sank to the ground. His contorted face began to relax, and his body and soul found peace. He no longer showed any signs of losing control. Dressed in a black widow-like dress and a veiled bonnet, Hela emerged from the darkness. Being the closest to the apartment while searching for traces of the battle between Loki and Lumian, she was undoubtedly the first to arrive. Without hesitation, she made Lumian, Franca, Loki, and the two marionettes vanish. Her figure faded, and the dense darkness rapidly dissipated. Apart from the collapsed wall, no evidence remained at the scene. Two seconds later, the apartment was suddenly bathed in sunlight. In an uninhabited mine beneath Trier, Lumian, Franca, and company swiftly materialized. They were all in a deep slumber, except for Hela. Her pale face remained conscious as she stood to the side. The vice president of the curly-haired baboons research society no longer had the dry, withered hair she'd had before. It had transformed into smooth strands, now bearing the color of the night. She pulled out a flask filled with liquor and downed a third of its contents before fixing her gaze on Lumian. Hela's forehead began to crack silently, emitting an eerie, ancient glow that manifested into an indescribable, ancient bronze door. The door swayed and creaked, revealing a narrow gap. Beyond it lay endless darkness, filled with countless dense, indescribable eyes seemingly lurking within. Under the influence of this deathly aura, the wraith attached to Lumian flew out without resistance. In an instant, it landed on the ground, and Hela raised her right hand, pressing it against its forehead. The ancient bronze door vanished, and the dim light receded into the crack. Hela shifted her attention to the still slumbering Loki. The leader of the April Fools had an ordinary face, blending into the crowd like any other resident of Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Hela stared at him for a brief moment before her eyes lost focus. In Loki's dream, Hela appeared, clad in a black widow-like attire, in front of an ancient castle shrouded in a thin gray fog. The castle's massive doors stood wide open, eerily silent like the entrance to a cemetery. 
Hila glanced up at the pitch-black castle with its numerous spires and thin form before stepping through the door. She passed through the dimly lit atrium and proceeded into the hall, where peculiar chandeliers with unknown light sources hung. Numerous guests filled the hall, their expressions frozen like wax statues, unmoving. Surrounded by dozens or even hundreds of wax statues was a gray platform with three stone steps. In the middle of the platform was an ancient dark red chair. A man in his late twenties occupied the seat. He wore a silk top hat and a black tailcoat, with dark gray eyes and short, brown hair. Under his high nose bridge, the subtle curl of his mouth hit a non-obvious smile. Pressing down on the armrests on both sides, the man relaxed and leaned back in his chair. Who are you? His voice echoed through the ancient castle, as if questioning Gila. Gila walked past the crowd suspected to be wax statues and arrived in front of the man. Her cold voice remained impassive as she inquired, Loki, don't you recognize me? Loki's grin intensified. Gila, you've come after all. Seizing the opportunity presented by his dream state, Hila confronted him directly. Why did you harm a member of the research society? Loki's gaze shifted upwards, and he let out a laugh. The only purpose those fools serve is to amuse us. You must know that the apocalypse is imminent, just a few years away. They're all destined to die, sooner or later. It's better for them to sacrifice themselves now to provide us with entertainment. Hila fell silent, and a chilling silence enveloped the dream, the air growing colder. Decaying, pale white hands extended from the stone floor and surrounding walls. After a few moments, Hila spoke again. Why did you harm Muggle? Loki's laughter ceased abruptly, replaced by a smirk as he looked at Hila. Because. His expression shifted suddenly, and Hila sensed imminent danger within the dream because the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. Loki's voice faded rapidly, and the entire dream began to crumble under Hela's will. The ancient castle disintegrated into fragments, vanishing into an eerie, yet pure darkness. Back in the real world, deep within the uninhabited mine beneath Trier, Hela opened her eyes. Countless tiny creatures wriggled beneath her pale white skin. In an instant, her form shifted and reassembled, no longer exhibiting the eerie abnormalities she had displayed earlier. Loki's body had disintegrated into a pool of flesh and blood, with grotesque maggots crawling in and out of it. Hela observed silently, but no beyonder characteristics emerged from the remains. Within the pitch-black castle enveloped in a thin fog, a dark red coffin lay in a sinister chamber. Suddenly, a pale white hand emerged from the coffin, gripping its wooden edge. Chapter 389, Suspected God In the uninhabited quarry cave beneath Trier, Hela observed as the transparent and distorted maggots perished, yet she didn't detect any beyonder characteristics emerging. She turned her attention to Lumian and Franca, who were sound asleep. Satisfied that they had regained control thanks to the night and their dreams, and their breathing had steadied, she ended her forced slumber. Two seconds later, Lumian's eyes shot open, and he leaped up with the agility of a leopard. In an instant, he summoned three crimson flames that illuminated the cavern. As he kept a vigilant watch over his surroundings, Franca, still recovering from severe mental injuries, rubbed her head and slowly got to her feet, fear in her eyes. Then, she spotted Gila in her distinctive black widow-like dress and the familiar bonnet with a veil. She blurted out, Madam Gila, what brings you here? Instant regret washed over her. She had inadvertently revealed her affiliation with the curly-haired baboon's research society. If she hadn't spoken, she could have pretended to be nothing more than a friend of Seal, that she wasn't Hidden Blade. Hidden Blade? Gila inquired. Franca let out a dry laugh. Yes, how did you recognize me? You're the only demoness in the research society, Gila replied calmly. Franca felt even more embarrassed and replied ridiculously, I recognized you based on your attire and demeanor. You never showed your face at the gatherings. As the two acknowledged each other, Lumian's weariness visibly eased. With Madame Hila's presence, he felt his safety was assured. 
Then, he noticed the two marionettes lying lifeless on the ground, surrounded by a pool of flesh infested with translucent maggots. Is that Loki? Lumian pointed at the grotesque, horrifying mass. Hela cast her gaze over. Yes. Lumian fell silent for a moment before asking, is he dead? Hela nodded slightly and said, he succumbed to his own loss of control, but it's not a complete demise. Huh? Franca asked in confusion. Look at how badly minced he is. Maggots are crawling out, but he's not completely dead. She had already figured out why Madame Gila had appeared. Seal, that scoundrel, must have used her as bait again and written a letter to Madame Gila to clean up the mess. Gila looked at Lumian and said coldly, High-level demonesses aren't the only ones capable of resurrection, high-level seers can do it too. Loki likely worships an evil god in this domain. Combined with his uniqueness, he can abandon his body upon death and revive in a pre-prepared location with his characteristics intact. Unfortunately, I didn't foresee this. If I had prayed for true concealment in advance, he wouldn't have been able to revive, and he'd leave behind his beyonder traits. The woman calmly recounted her oversights, offering no excuses and showing no frustration. Lumian's eyes remained fixed on the grotesque mass of flesh infested with dead maggots, a slow smile spreading across his face. The corners of his mouth curled upward as he remarked, not bad at all. If he were to meet his end like this, I'd be disappointed. How can I not be the one to kill him with my own hands? As Lumian spoke, a burning desire for high sequence beyond her powers ignited within him. Loki was undeniably formidable. Even when he and Franca had joined forces, Loki had come dangerously close to turning Lumian into a marionette. Yet, Hela, suspected to have advanced to sequence four, had effortlessly dispatched him in less than ten seconds. Lumian understood that unleashing the Blood Emperor Aura would undoubtedly draw the attention of official Beyonders from the Market District, possibly prompting them to seek assistance from the Church's saints. Therefore, after Hela had sought him out, she had to subdue Loki and relocate him within ten seconds. Otherwise, the chance of being intercepted by Trier's saints and angels was exceedingly high. This was what a demigod was like. Lumian eagerly looked forward to summarizing more pyromaniac acting principles and digesting the potion over the next two to three months. His goal was to attempt an advancement to conspire. He recollected his plans for revenge against Loki and the others, the eradication of heretics, and his insatiable thirst for mystical, high-end powers. Seeing Lumian's lack of regret or disappointment, replaced instead by an unwavering fighting spirit, Hela subtly nodded in approval. Lumian's gaze remained fixed on Loki's corpse. Which evil god does he worship? Franca's heart skipped a beat at this question. She turned to Hela and asked, could it be? The demoness of pleasure paused briefly before switching to a complicated language that Lumian couldn't understand. The immortal lord. Hela abruptly cut her off. Have you forgotten that I don't understand that language either? Ah. Uh. Franca couldn't help but slap her forehead. My pig brain. Hela continued, speak in ancient Faisak or in Tishan. Also, remember, pause after each line and tell me something else. Franca quickly acknowledged her instructions, organized her thoughts, and began speaking in ancient Faisak. The immortal lord of heaven and earth for blessings. Hela interrupted her once again and engaged in a brief discussion about Loki's assault. Franca continued, the Sky Lord of Heaven and Earth for blessings. Lumian, paying close attention, began to grasp the purpose of Madame Hela's request. It was a precaution to prevent Franca from reciting the evil god's full honorific name and potentially attracting unwanted attention. The exalted the Arch of Heaven and Earth for blessings. Franca repeated the third line and massaged her temples. When I heard Loki recite it, it felt like I had been transported to another world. Everything was shrouded in fog, and I couldn't discern anything clearly. My thoughts slowed to a crawl. I vaguely recall that there should be another phrase. Hela chimed in with her own addition in ancient Faisak, the celestial worthy. Of heaven and earth. For blessings. This time, she even paused the simple line twice. Lumian couldn't help but express his confusion. 
this name has a rather odd style. It differed significantly from the honorific names of deities like Mr. Fool, the Eternal Blazing Sun, and others he was familiar with. The format and words gave off the impression of belonging to a distinct civilization. Franca furrowed her brow and thought. Now that you mention it, I recall something. Lumian inquired, what is it? Franca was about to speak but then abruptly closed her mouth. She looked at Gila with a sheepish smile. Do you mind if I assisted Seal in infiltrating the research society to investigate the April Fool's team? He had my approval, Gila replied calmly. Franca maintained her submissive smile. Then, would you mind if I had shared the secret of our transmigration with Seal? Gila fell silent for a few moments before responding, does it matter if I mind now? Should I conceal both of you? Franca suddenly realized that this situation might not be entirely negative and hastily explained, you see, the April Fool's team is under suspicion for Muggle's death, and there's no way around revealing our secret when investigating them. That's why I told Seal about it. Besides, Seal has genuinely helped us find clues related to transmigration and the possibility of returning to our world. She wore an expression as if she had already made up for her mistake. What clues? Gila blurted out for the first time. Franca exhaled and said, this is somewhat complex. Let me start by recalling what those honorific names reminded me of. We've been communicating, trying to find commonalities and similarities in what each of us did before transmigration to uncover the reason. Some received mysterious phones, others entered abandoned ancient temples in the mountains, and some were studying folklore culture. But I can't pinpoint what I did that led to it. It's not that I can't remember, but I've done so much. As you all know, I enjoy novelty. I buy new phones, play new games, try out new restaurants, and even create clothing and cosplay at major conventions. I engaged in a multitude of activities before transmigrating, making it difficult to determine which one triggered the transmigration. However, when I heard the honorific name Loki recited, I recalled that on that particular night, I had played a new video game called Terror Attack. In the game, there was a hidden monster that had faith in something called the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth. Though Lumian didn't comprehend the concept of a video game, he grasped the essence of Franca's explanation. Her transmigration in this world appeared to be connected to the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for blessings, whom Loki worshipped. Gila, her light blonde hair flowing naturally over her shoulders, listened attentively and contemplated for a moment before speaking, I don't have similar recollections. As I mentioned earlier, before transmigrating, I delved into non-mainstream mythological books. There was a deity skilled in deception and pranks who bore a striking resemblance to Loki. Franca's eyes gleamed with insight as she ventured a hypothesis. Could Loki have transmigrated by reciting the four lines of the honorific name? So, upon his arrival in this world, he recollected his actions from that time and attempted to recreate them, forging a connection with that evil god? Yes, he spoke vaguely when discussing such matters. The members of the April Fool's team shared a similar experience. Could it be that we were all brought here by the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings? Or did he summon us to this world? He's highly suspicious. Hela contemplated this for a moment and nodded slightly. At our next gathering, we can revisit this topic and communicate with others with a clearer focus. Franco was taken aback. Will the members of the April Fool's team still attend? The problematic ones probably won't, Gila replied calmly. Even if we hastily arrange a gathering now, we'd have to notify them individually. This period of time is sufficient for Loki to revive and alert his associates. Lumian raised his eyebrows. Why does everyone need to be notified individually? Just invite the April Fool's team to an emergency meeting. They won't know if others will attend. It won't take long to inform a dozen of them. Chapter 390 Hidden Danger Gila glanced at Lumian and fell silent for two seconds before saying, All right, I'll get ready now. But don't get your hopes up. No matter how urgent the gathering is, you have to give others ten minutes to disguise themselves. Otherwise, they probably won't come. 
Ten minutes, combined with the discussion they just had, was enough time for Loki to revive and alert his accomplices. Lumian's expression remained unchanged as he nodded gently. We have to give it a try. That's right. Capture as many as we can. With an incisive point, it'll be much easier to find the others, Franca agreed with Lumian. She suspected that Loki and his crew were responsible for the deaths of some members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Without wasting any more time, the surroundings around Gila suddenly darkened, resisting the light of the three flames. Her figure vanished without a trace. This marked the beginning of preparations for the emergency gathering. Lumian's eyes flickered as he gazed at the decaying flesh teeming with dead maggots, lost in his own thoughts. Franca carefully examined her body and realized that there were no substantial or obvious injuries. The pain she had previously endured was a result of the impact on her mind. As her spirit body was soothed and treated, only faint cracks remained. Franca let out a long sigh of relief and said, Loki is truly cunning and powerful. Fortunately, you thought to seek Madame Hela's help. Otherwise, we might have become his marionettes by now. Lumian wholeheartedly agreed. If he hadn't considered borrowing Hela's power and guessed that Loki could detect a certain trait in him, leading to the decision to bait him out tonight, perhaps the outcome wouldn't have been in their favor. When they were unprepared, Loki had approached them and attacked with full force. Neither he nor Franca could retaliate. He could still use the Blood Emperor's aura, which was relatively easy to activate and didn't require complicated procedures, to attract all official beyonders. Then, he could exploit the time difference to escape using teleportation. However, it would condemn Franca to be controlled. Of course, without the baiting operation, Lumian might have chosen to leave with Franca by traversing the spirit world and slipping out of Loki's sight before returning stealthily. You don't have to worry about becoming a marionette. Loki wants to groom you into a sequence for Demoness, Lumian casually reassured Franca. Franca was taken aback. He told me he's been yearning for a Demoness marionette for a long time. Lumian calmly pointed out that Franca had been deceived. He lied to you. He even said that the four-line honorific name meant to accelerate the progress was, in fact, a trap for me that could isolate most of the struggling commotions. Dot. Franca couldn't help but curse. Damn it. Is there any truth in his words? As expected of the leader of April Fools, the New Age swindler who lives diagonally opposite Sal de Ball Unique. Franca muttered to herself, the honorific name he recited must be real. Him being able to use the traits we share and the power of that celestial worthy to directly locate me should be real too. As for the exact range, given the style he displayed, there's a high chance that it's nonsense. It can't be believed. What kind of traits could it be? If the transmigration was indeed caused by that celestial worthy, it's very likely that we have his aura or brand on us. And with his power, Loki can easily locate us within a certain range. Franca suddenly turned to look at Lumian. Loki should have recognized that you were fake during the gathering. You don't have the aura or mark of the celestial worthy on you. Yes. Lumian's mood sank. I'll have to share this detail with Madame Hela later and see if anyone can come up with a way to eliminate the celestial worthy aura on them. Otherwise, they'll be hunted down by Loki and the others in the future, Franca said as she looked at the wraith that had a dark green light seeping out and merging with a certain part of the corpse. What should we do with this Beyonder characteristic? This was a Sequence 5 Beyonder characteristic. She had her own thoughts about this spoil of war, but she didn't know Lumian's attitude. Madame Hela killed Loki herself, so the spoils of war must belong to her, Lumian said nonchalantly. He then pointed at the corpse of the other marionette. Why hasn't he manifested any Beyonder characteristics? That's right. He can't be resurrected too, can he? Franca muttered. Could it be that he's a bestowed who doesn't have Beyonder characteristics? Her plan was to give Madame Hela the Wraith Beyonder characteristic. Lumian nodded slowly. In the evening, I thought he was a marionette of the Sun Pathway. Later, when I was under his control, every word he spoke sounded like crazy ravings. 
it could affect my mind and spirit body, which was different from the Sun Pathway style. Yes, he should be a bestowed of an evil god, made into a marionette by Loki. I'll ask Madame Hela later. Just as Franca finished speaking, Hela's figure in a black widow-like dress outlined itself in the empty mine. She said to Lumian and Franca, in five minutes, we'll recite the incantation and enter the nation of the Evernight's palace. All right. Lumian took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Franca immediately informed Hela about the possible common trait among the members of the research society. Finally, she asked, is there a way to confirm and eliminate it? A marionettist like Loki lurks in the shadows and can find us at any moment. It's truly terrifying. Hela pondered for a moment and replied, firstly, advance to sequence four and become a demigod. Only then can you barely suppress the aura left behind by celestial worthy. Secondly, search for mystical items with hidden and secret keeping effects. I can only think of these two solutions at the moment. I'll see if anyone else has a better idea at the next gathering. At that moment, Lumian looked at Hela and asked anxiously, Madam, did you find out anything from Loki? Hela took out a flask and downed another third. Her pale white face flushed as she said coldly, when I asked Loki why he wanted to harm the other members, he said it was for fun and to create pranks to satisfy his emotions and mind. However, when I asked him why he wanted to harm Muggle, his answer was celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. Hela didn't finish her sentence, but both of them understood what she meant. Selling the soul summoning spell to Aurora and guiding her to use it on herself seemed to be the will of the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. Why does he want this done? Aurora is only a sequence seven. She's just a nobody. Lumian lowered his head and muttered in pain. Hela replied coldly, probably because the original body of Muggle and her family are problematic. Lumian fell silent for a moment before saying, Could Loki be lying? A person full of lies like him might not be telling the truth. In the dreamscape I created, he can't lie unless he gains the ability to maintain lucidity in advance, but that's impossible. Hela denied Lumian's guess. Dreamscape. Franca glanced at Hela and felt that this didn't match her impression of her sequence pathway. Lumian fell silent once again. Aurora's transmigration was suspected to have been brought about by the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. After her resurrection, she had been targeted by the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings because Roche Louise Sanson and her family were believers in inevitability. This made Aurora's subsequent encounter seem like a predetermined tragedy. Seeing this, Franca changed the subject and pointed at the two marionettes' corpses. Madam Hela, that beyonder characteristic is the spoil of war you deserve. What we want to know is why this marionette didn't produce any beyonder characteristics. Hela didn't refuse. As she watched the wraith beyonder characteristic emerge, she inquired about Franca and Lumian's feelings when they were controlled. After a brief exchange, she pondered and said, this should be a bestowed who believes in an evil god. The corresponding sequence 7 is an orator, and sequence 6 is a singer. These two sequences can transmit different mystical powers with their voices, matching their descriptions. In addition, beyonders of this pathway often perform secret deed rituals at sequence 9 and obtain mysteries and knowledge through a formless door. Different people hear and experience different things, and the subsequent abilities they obtain will be different. Being able to use singing to create a sun's blinding effect should be one of these manifestations. Which evil god? Franca blurted out. Hela shook her head. I don't know the exact honorific name either. It's dangerous for us to know anyway. I've encountered his believers. They sometimes refer to this evil god as the first philosophy or arcane controller. Without waiting for Franca to ask further, Hela nodded slightly and said, we should head to the gathering. Lumian and Franca recited the incantation simultaneously. A beyonder from ancient times, ruler of the nation of the Evernight, noble mother of the sky, I beseech your permission to enter your kingdom. As the surrounding darkness and slumber dissipated, Lumian and Franca arrived at the ancient and dilapidated palace again. There was no one here yet. It was empty and silent. 
Franca felt that something was amiss. After thinking for more than ten seconds, she realized something. We haven't disguised ourselves. Just as she finished speaking, she saw Lumi enshrouded in a hazy dreamlike fog, obscuring his exact form and appearance. Lumian then used the knee's face to transform himself into a hooded muggle clad in a warlock's black robe. With Madame Hila's help, Franca breathed a sigh of relief and waited patiently for the April Fool's team to arrive. As time ticked by, two figures suddenly outlined inside the silent palace. Chapter 391 Idiots The figures entering the ancient palace were Black Earth and Bax. Black Earth sported a furry hat and a thick leather mask, while Bax, on the other hand, had opted for just shorts and a brass mask. Upon spotting Gila, they acknowledged her with a slight nod as a greeting. Their eyes then roved over Franca, who hadn't tagged her code name, and Muggle, enveloped in a dreamy mist. Who's this? Black Earth, clad like a hunter from the mountains, pointed at Franca, a note of confusion in his voice. Hidden Blade I rushed and forgot to tag myself, Franca replied. Black Earth and Bax promptly dropped their suspicions and relaxed. In a situation like this emergency gathering, it was perfectly normal for Hidden Blade to slip up. This was her style. Soon after, other members of the April Fool's team arrived one by one, but Lumian didn't see the five most suspicious targets. I know someone, Hisoka, Bard, Mad Lady, and Ultraman. His expression darkened gradually, sensing that Loki had been resurrected and the problematic members had been alerted. The dozen or so individuals gathered here were potential pawns. If Loki and his gang went too far and were discovered by other members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, they could be used as scapegoats for the investigation. There was nothing to find fault with them, thus ensuring the six true believers in the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings remained concealed. At that moment, Black Earth and the rest started to realize that something was amiss. Why were there so few attendees at the emergency gathering? The agreed time had already passed, and typically, at least half of the society should have shown up by now. Gila, what's going on? Bax, wearing nothing but a mask and shorts, asked in a deep voice. Lumian sneered, looking at them as if they were a bunch of fools. If Loki and his crew were evil, then these people were simply fools. They believed they were clever and had uncovered the truth, thinking they were indulging in pre-apocalypse pleasures. In reality, they were just being used as pawns and shields. Lumian was willing to bet that Loki, I know someone, and the other core members of the April Fool's team would mock these fools during their private gatherings. Gila's tone remained as cold as ice as she began, I summoned you to this gathering because Loki betrayed us. Black Earth, Bax, and the others were taken aback. They glanced around, but Loki was nowhere to be seen. Gila continued, he believes in an evil god and let I know someone and the others to harm numerous research society members. Such accusations require evidence, Bax instinctively retorted. With the lie earring on, Lumian spoke in Aurora's voice, I'm the evidence. You must have seen me by the soul summoning spell. This caused a mental problem and nearly caused me to lose control. Fortunately, I found someone to help me in time and sealed my split personality. Before this, I've been seeking treatment from my know-someone, but instead of improving, my condition only worsened. I approached them to reason with them, but they ended up planning to murder me. Black Earth fell silent for a moment before saying, I remember that you bought it from Mad Lady. They lied to you because transmigration should be a matter between two parties, not a one-sided reason. Otherwise, why did you transmigrate to this world and happen to possess such people? The original bodies must have done something to establish the connection between the two worlds. Therefore, before figuring out what caused you to transmigrate, finding the remnant soul of the original body and asking might gain something unexpected. Muggle, weren't you homesick back then? How could you believe such a reason? As they heard this, some of the April Fool's team members present couldn't help but show teasing and mocking expressions in their eyes. Muggle had fallen for a trick that could only fool children. None of them had been fooled by Mad Lady. Even if she claimed to have tried and achieved certain results, it couldn't be considered a clue. 
Mad Lady. Lumian repeated the code name inwardly. A chuckle escaped him as he continued, I was indeed blinded by the desire to return home, but you weren't any better. Take a look. Are Loki, Mad Lady, and Bar here? They know what they're doing, and they understand that if they're exposed, they have to leave the research society immediately. But you, fools, and idiots, don't know anything and are still cooperating with them. Even pigs and dogs are smarter than you. The absence of Loki and the others was like Muggle's mocking arrow, piercing the hearts and minds of Black Earth and the other April Fool's team members. Some of them erupted in anger, feeling humiliated and wanting to retort. Others swayed in despair and confusion, while some felt as if countless insects were gnawing at their hearts. The pain was palpable. Witnessing this, Franca entered instigation mode and delivered a decisive blow. Don't you understand? You're discarded pawns, abandoned targets, mere agents who have lost their usefulness. You've never been core members of April Fools. You've never earned Loki's trust. They only mock you behind your backs. Now that Loki and the others have been exposed, they can hunt down the research society members without fear. Who do you think will be the easiest for them to locate and target? The only thing you can do is recall the details of your dealings with Loki and the others, including the real-life pranks you executed, so that we can eliminate these traitors as soon as possible. Remember, leniency comes with honesty, resistance comes with severity. Black Earth, Bax, and the others followed Hidden Blade's logic and realized the grim possibility. They exchanged glances, their hearts clearly wavering. The few who had witnessed Loki and the others' capabilities couldn't help but tremble slightly. Finally, Franca dropped a bombshell. Don't think you can escape the hunt just because you can relocate. Let me tell you, Muggle's experience indicates that Loki and the others seem to have a way to track research society members within a certain range through some mystical connection. I'll share the specific method with everyone at the next official gathering. Black Earth gritted his teeth and said, There are too many details. I don't think I can recall them all in just a few hours. The other April Fool's team members nodded in agreement. Gila thought for a moment and replied, Go back, write down all the details, and send them to me. Remember, pack your belongings and stay at a motel or hotel at least five kilometers away. Bax and the others let out sighs of relief and agreed. Shortly after, Lumian noticed their eyes closing, as if they had fallen asleep while standing. He and Franca exchanged thoughtful glances and then realized that Madame Gila's eyes had lost focus before closing as well. After a moment, Gila opened her eyes and said to Lumian and Franca, There are no hidden Loki helpers or believers in the Celestial Worthy. This is a precaution in case Loki had risked leaving an accomplice to gather intelligence. Franca came to a realization. In the next instant, Black Earth, Bax, and the others awakened simultaneously, reciting the incantation discreetly as they left the ancient and decaying palace. Lumian dispelled the knee's face, took off the lie earring, and turned to Hela. Every time we use the incantation at a gathering, we should be tainted by the sealed artifact's concealment aura, right? Can we use this to track down Mad Lady and the others? Hela shook her head. They no longer have the corresponding auras. Clearly, she had tried it before. Lumian remained silent, exhaling slowly and silently. The trio left the nation of the Evernight and returned to the uninhabited mine beneath Trier. Gila put away the wraith beyond her characteristic and spoke to Lumian and Franca. If we can't uncover Loki and truly eliminate him, you can stay in Trier's market district for another three months at most. When that time comes, regardless of any unfinished business, you'll have to consider relocating. Why three months? Franca inquired, her confusion apparent. Staying even another week seemed perilous. Gila provided a simple explanation. While Loki has been resurrected with his Beyonder characteristics, he has lost all his marionettes. A marionettist won't rashly appear and attack others without a marionette, unless they are excessively confident and perceive you as weak. And you've already demonstrated significant strength. For a marionettist without a marionette, Acquiring a suitable and powerful marionette requires planning, luck, and frequent replacements. You should have a window of three to six months. 
Understood, Franca replied, deciding to inform Madam Judgment that if no progress was made within two months, she would request permission to abandon the Iron and Blood Cross Order mission and relocate. Lumian nodded in agreement. He contemplated whether he could digest the Pyromaniac potion within three months and gather the Conspirer potion formula and main ingredients. At that moment, Hela pointed at Loki's mushy flesh, twisted maggots, and said, The dead worms are excellent spiritual ingredients that can be used for many things. However, they also come with hidden issues. They have been corrupted to a certain extent, posing unknown dangers to you. Franca recalled her terrifying experience of almost becoming a marionette and shook her head, indicating she didn't want them. Lumian gazed at the countless maggots and the mushy flesh for a moment before suddenly summoning the crimson fireball floating on his shoulder. He directed it towards Loki's remains. Instead of exploding, the fireball ignited fiercely, casting a crimson glow. As he watched the maggots and flesh burn, Lumian felt as though he had digested the pyromaniac potion once more. This came from his experience of being controlled by Loki and using the near loss of control to ignite his own body, triggering the resonance of the Blood Emperor's aura. This led Lumian to formulate his own acting principle for pyromaniac. Pyromaniacs aren't arsonists. Only by daring to set themselves ablaze can they set others ablaze. Chapter 392 Switching Pathways The digestion of the pyromaniac potion progressed much faster than Lumian had expected. This quick reaction was likely due to the activation of Blood Emperor Alista Tudor's aura without proper protection, akin to setting a blaze in Trier. The flames burned even the St. Vive Cathedral and the Patriarchal Cathedral of the God of Steam and Machinery Church. Gila watched the flesh and maggots consumed by the crimson flames for a moment before turning to Franca. Can we now discuss the clues about transmigration? Franca tersely acknowledged her words and gathered her thoughts. Seal had previously attempted a unique summoning ritual, which inadvertently brought forth a shadow suspected to be from my homeland, the one I share with Muggle. He even formed a contract with this entity. After discovering this, I had Seal summon the shadow again to communicate with it. The shadow's language is remarkably similar to that of my homeland. When asked about its origin, it said, The blood son of heaven disrupted the netherworld, and the underworld Taoist sacrificed himself to enter the river. Franca translated the last sentence into intision. Hila listened attentively and then turned her gaze to Lumian. Could this be the apparition of Blood Emperor Alista Tudor? Underworld Taoist was the one who dragged him back. That's our hypothesis, Lumian replied succinctly, indicating that Franca was also aware of the Samaritan Women's Spring. There was no need for excessive secrecy. Underworld Taoist. Hila murmured the term softly. Franca continued to recount her and Lumian's theories, suspecting that the illusionary river behind the spring might connect to the original world of her and the curly haired baboons research society members. Gila remained silent, her dark eyes gleaming with a subtle brilliance, as though concealing a galaxy. That covers most of it. Once we've dealt with the traitors in the research society, I'll share this information with everyone, Franca said after a brief pause. She also reminded Gila, apart from April Fools, Loki's allies might be lurking in other teams. They tend to participate in activities without playing pranks and only reveal themselves during crucial moments. Gila nodded slightly and replied, I'll discuss how to handle this with Gandalf and the others. The woman then turned her gaze to Lumian. If there's nothing else, I'll take you back to the surface. Lumian withdrew his gaze from the flames and let out a deep breath. I'll take care of this. He crouched down and placed his hands in front of Loki's lifeless body. Rumble. Accompanied by a muted explosion and a slight tremor in the ground, the earth, carrying flesh, blood, and maggots, suddenly sank into the mire and rocks. Franca nodded in realization. This way, any remaining corruption on Loki's corpse wouldn't be exposed to cave adventurers who might pass by later. She assisted in carrying the corpses of the two marionettes over, contemplating whether to collect the wraith's teeth and nails. These were excellent spiritual ingredients that could be used to forge beyond her weapons. 
If the wraith had lost control and transformed into a monster, Franca wouldn't feel any psychological burden dealing with his corpse. However, he still retained his human form. Considering that she didn't lack offensive weapons or poison for coating them, Franca simply harvested the powder from the translucent wraith and absorbed its residual spirituality. After removing the clothes bestowed by the evil god and checking for any clues, Franca tossed the two corpses into the blazing pit. Once she had completed this task, she turned to Gila and asked with curiosity, Madam Gila, have you advanced to Sequence 4 and become a demigod? Otherwise, how could she have subdued Loki so effortlessly? Yes, Gila confirmed with a nod. Franca pondered for a moment and probed further, you used to follow the corpse collector pathway, but this time, you displayed the power of the Evernight pathway. Did you use a mystical item? Was it similar to using a sealed artifact to enable everyone to enter the nation of the Evernight in concealment and participate in the gathering? The corpse collector pathway was also known as the death pathway. Gila's voice was icy as she replied, I've switched to sequence 4 Night Watcher of the Evernight pathway. Why? Franca was intrigued by Gila's choice. While she had once contemplated switching to the neighboring hunter pathway when advancing to sequence 4, it was mainly to restore her body to its male form. Under usual circumstances, sticking to a single pathway until the end was generally the better choice. After all, the acting acquired in the earlier sequences were deeply ingrained in that pathway, making it easier and safer to become a sequence 4 beyonder of the same pathway. Of course, if one couldn't find the Sequence 4 potion formula and main ingredient for their pathway, they might consider switching to a neighboring pathway. It wouldn't necessarily lead to half-madness, and they could gain a mix of unique abilities. Franca had never seen any indication from Gila of wanting to switch pathways. When they discussed and exchanged information at the Research Society, Gila primarily focused on topics related to the corpse collector domain. Most of the materials and items gathered and sold were concentrated in this pathway. Could it be that the Sequence 4 potion formula, main ingredients, or corresponding rituals of the corpse collector pathway proved impractical? Franca speculated, drawing on her extensive knowledge of mysticism. Gila's pale face softened. She gazed into the darkness beyond the abandoned mine, her voice taking on a contemplative tone. If I continued along the death pathway, the deity I believe in would eventually transform me into a crucial vessel for specific moments. At this point, Gila wore a rare smile and spoke with a distant look in her eyes. It's already a challenge for her to maintain her humanity. So, I shouldn't burden her any further. Franca was initially perplexed but began to grasp Madame Gila's reasoning for switching pathways. Gila gave her a brief look and added, If I can advance to sequence 3. I should either revert to the Death Pathway or switch to the Warrior Pathway. The upper ranks of the Evernight Pathway are facing a severe resource shortage. Wow, Franca couldn't help but envision Gila wielding various sequence abilities from the Evernight, Corpse Collector, and Warrior Pathways. She found it both impressive and formidable. She, too, felt a sense of excitement about the possibility of acquiring the abilities of a Demoness and a Hunter in the future. Meanwhile, Lumian incinerated Loki's mutated remains and filled the pit. Gila promptly obscured the area in darkness. When Lumian and Franca regained consciousness, they found themselves outside the abandoned mine near the entrance to underground Trioran Ruanarchy. In the distance, they could hear faint movements coming from Rue de Blouse's blanches. Phew, this is the most dangerous situation I've encountered since becoming a Beyonder, Franca said, exhaling deeply and speaking with emotion. If Loki hadn't used me as bait to lure you here, there's a high chance I would have become a marionette. Lumian tersely acknowledged her words and remained silent. He took a step forward and began to walk down the street. Franca followed him and asked curiously, did Loki say anything when he tried to disrupt your mind with his trash talk? Although many of his words may be lies, they might contain valuable information. For example, the suspicion that every member of the curly-haired baboon's research society possessed the lingering aura of the celestial worthy. Lumian remained silent for a few moments before responding. He recounted how they harmed Aurora, how they repeatedly disclosed her mental state and psychiatric treatment process, and how they shamelessly mocked her. His explanation was concise, 
but the simplicity of his words couldn't mask the anger that rose in him again. Ha! Huh. Franco was initially surprised, but quickly grasped the gravity of the situation. That psychiatrist, I know someone. Lumian nodded slowly. Franca contemplated the situation carefully, her anger growing with each passing thought. Damn it. How can they be so evil? I fully support you in tearing them apart, dismembering them, skinning them, and stuffing them with grass. After several seconds of contemplation, she unleashed a curse. Lumian remained silent, seemingly weighing the feasibility of such actions. Franca glanced at him and hesitantly suggested, when you faced the other April Fool's team members earlier, you held back and didn't kill them directly. Lumian chuckled. Why should I kill those idiots? It's more agonizing, humiliating, and regretful for these individuals who believe they're clever when they realize how Loki and the others manipulated them. It brings me greater satisfaction than killing them. In the future, whenever anyone mentions Loki, it will be akin to insulting their intelligence to their faces and they won't be able to escape it. Franca breathed a sigh of relief. She said to Lumian, Ruta Blouse's blanches seems quite lively. I plan to stay at Jenna's tonight. Heh <laughs> heh. Yes, I'll be informing my major arcana card holder briefly about this matter. I'll convey that if Loki isn't completely eliminated within two months, I would like to request a transfer out of the market district. You, too, can apply to take charge of the Iron and Blood Cross Orders branch elsewhere. I'll also write to my major Arcana card holder, Lumian assured her, indicating that he wouldn't underestimate the potential harm Loki could cause. Lumian had always maintained a clear distinction between personal matters and official matters. Whether dealing with the Padre or investigating Loki, he had never considered seeking Madame Magician's assistance. However, this time, his use of the Blood Emperor's aura had caused quite a commotion, and it would be necessary to report it later. Seeing that Lumian remained rational, Franca felt at ease. She waved farewell and stealthily made her way toward Cartier du Jardin Botanique. Lumian averted his gaze and entered Aubert's du Coke door, walking along the still warm street. He had no desire to encounter the official Beyonders who might be searching for clues on Rue de Blouse's blanches at this late hour. As he pushed open the door to room 207, Lumian spotted a figure inside. It was Madame Magician, dressed in an orange waist-length dress and holding a wide-brimmed hat adorned with flowers. Were you waiting for me? Lumian inquired almost instinctively. Magician smiled. What else would I be doing? How did you know I would come back here? Lumian closed the door. Magician smiled and said, This is a revelation of fate. Now, tell me, why did you unleash the Blood Emperor's aura? Chapter 393 Information about Celestial Worthy Lumian was taken aback. Did it cause a huge commotion? He knew that once the Blood Emperor's aura was activated, it would undoubtedly attract the attention of nearby official beyonders and powerful figures. It would be akin to setting St. Vive Cathedral on fire. The commotion wouldn't be small, but he never expected this to catch the attention of Madame Magician, who didn't seem to be in trier, for her to rush over. He had intended to write a letter and report this matter. Madame Magician nodded seriously. Very. It even led some people to believe that the door to Fourth Epic Trier had opened. The commotion is even greater than I had imagined. As expected of Blood Emperor Alista Tudor. Lumian wasn't vexed or surprised, instead, he calmly sat on the edge of the bed. It had already happened, so there was no point in feeling vexed or surprised. Moreover, even if he had to do it again, he would still do it. Lumian began recounting how he had posed as his sister to infiltrate the curly-haired baboon's research society and determine if there was anything amiss with the person who had sold her the soul-summoning spell. He continued until Loki lost control and died, but no beyonder characteristics emerged. It was suspected that there was a way for him to revive. There was also the honorific name of an evil god that Hela and the Two of Cups had pieced together. Magician didn't interrupt but the smile on her face had vanished at some point in time. Do I need to recite the honorific names for lines intermittently, 
Or can I just say them? Lumian finally asked. Madam Magician's voice was calm as she replied, Just say it. It won't be a problem as long as you don't use ancient Hermes, Jotun, and other unprotected Beyonder languages. Lumian subconsciously surveyed the room and realized that it had grown dimmer. Although the crimson moonlight could penetrate the glass window, it seemed to be obstructed by an invisible, soundproof, and deep curtain. He then repeated Franca's translated honorific name. With that said, he saw Madame Magician fall silent, as if she had transformed into a statue. What's wrong with that? Lumian probed. Magician pondered for a moment and looked at him. You're saying that you relied on the brink of losing control from your anger to trigger the resonance of the Blood Emperor's aura and create a commotion that can break through the three layers of the thin fog's concealment? That's right, Lumian replied, still feeling a lingering fear as he recalled the situation. Normally, once my emotions exceed the limit, I would recall the cues left behind by Madame Susie. However, even the corresponding memories became intermittent and vague, preventing the cues from having the desired effect. In fact, if I hadn't held out hope when I was first controlled and instead tried to activate the Blood Emperor's aura immediately, Loki probably wouldn't have been able to truly stop me. When the control deepened, it wouldn't have worked. I could only rely on such passive reactions. Madam Magician wore a thoughtful expression and didn't respond. Is there a problem with this part of the situation? Lumian asked bluntly. Magician nodded slightly and said, There's nothing wrong with this detail. It's very reasonable. It's a normal development of the situation back then. The problem is that you just obtained the Blood Emperor's aura not long ago, so it came in handy. Lumian was taken aback for a few seconds before blurting out, Could Amon have foreseen my encounter tonight by stuffing the earth blood ore into my pocket? Is his purpose to help me? Help that nearly got me killed? This might be just one of the goals, and it's not his, Madam Magician said with a soft sigh. It's the goal of the one who's roughly equivalent to his father. Lumian was taken aback once more. The one the Aurora Order believes in? The one who inherited half of the ancient sun god's inheritance? For some reason, Mr. K's maniacal laughter echoed in his mind. Piousness is the only way out. Madam Magician muttered to herself, Previously, I thought I wanted to involve you more deeply in matters related to the Sauron family, the Iron and Blood Cross Order, and the Fourth Epic Trier. Now, it seems that I'll have to include disrupting that entity's plan. Seeing that Lumian still didn't understand why it involved the deity believed in by the Aurora Order, Magician explained, do you remember when you thought accepting another major Arcana card holder's commission was a normal and reasonable matter? You didn't need to tell me? I remember, Lumian replied, not seeing any problem with that. It's true that I made a mistake, but it has nothing to do with that person. It's a manifestation of my true thoughts. Madam Magician chuckled. Coincidentally, I didn't meet Miss Justice during that time, so there was an information gap. Lumian's eyes flickered as he caught a whiff of a conspiracy. Madam Magician continued, the combination of two coincidences might not be coincidental. Think about the complete honorific name of that entity. I can't recall, Lumian admitted. Madam Justice made a psychological cue. I can only recall it if I pray for Mr. Fool's angelic protection. There's no rush. When you can recall, you'll naturally understand the source of the problem, Magician warned him simply. You have to be vigilant once you encounter too many coincidences. Lumian nodded solemnly. Madam Magician consoled him, there's no need to be too nervous, let alone reject contact with Mr. K. This time, with that entity's arrangements so obvious, he's telling us that he knows, that he is watching and listening. This also means that he holds no ill intentions for the time being. Otherwise, not only would you be finished, but I would also be in danger. Lumian was burdened with numerous issues. He couldn't afford to fret at such a high level. It was pointless to fret. After all, he relied on the tarot club the most. He then inquired, Madam, which evil god does Loki and company believe in? Only by clarifying the evil god's domain and characteristics could he better guard against and deal with his believers in the future. 
Magician fell silent for several seconds, so silent that even a beyonder as bold as Lumian couldn't help but feel his heart race. Eventually, she let out a sigh and remarked, Actually, I have mentioned that evil god to you. Ha! Huh. Lumian had no impression of such a thing. Madam Magician fell silent for a few seconds before saying, I've told you before, Mr. Fool is facing off against an ancient deity. This outcome holds the power to shape our destinies and determine whether our world can survive the impending apocalypse. That ancient deity is known as the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings. It's actually Mr. Fool's enemy. Lumian hadn't anticipated such a revelation. Me branded by Mr. Fool. Aurora, possibly brought to this world by the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings. Loki and his associates, who are devout followers of the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings, sold the soul-summoning spell to Aurora, triggering a series of catastrophic events. Mr. Fool is in direct opposition to the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings. A torrent of information flooded Lumian's mind, leaving him feeling like he was on the verge of unraveling a truth that was still missing crucial details. Madam Magician pondered for a moment before continuing. I've also mentioned that if you address Mr. Fool using anything other than his three-lined honorific name or attempt to invoke him without following the proper ritual, I can't guarantee that he will be the one who responds. It might even lead to perilous encounters. Now, I can offer you a clear answer. Under those circumstances, the response you receive could very well be from the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. Praying to Mr. Fool in an incorrect manner might gain a response from the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for blessings. Lumian was overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information. His head felt like it was about to burst. Then, a crucial detail caught his attention. The title The King of Yellow and Black in Mr. Fool's honorific name bore a striking resemblance to Franca's translation of the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for blessings. With this revelation, a chilling sensation washed over Lumian. He hesitated for a few seconds before deciding to inquire, what's the connection between Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings? Madam Magician offered a wry smile in response. What I know isn't that detailed or precise. For example, after the one the Aurora Order believes and inherited half of the ancient sun god's inheritance, the ancient sun god was resurrected in some way. Lumian grasped the general idea and let out a relieved sigh. It seems to mirror Aurora's association with Roche Louis Sanson. This facilitated his understanding. Madame Magician seemed taken aback. Almost instinctively, she reached out as if attempting to retrieve a drink from thin air, but she restrained herself in the end. Lumian recounted the entire incident, a hint of pain and deep confusion in his voice. What could this celestial worthy be planning? Aurora was just a sequence seven. Even if Roche Louise Sanson and her family are devout followers of inevitability, they wouldn't be able to do anything of significance. Madame Magician sighed once more. Perhaps he intends to hasten the arrival of the apocalypse and allow the evil gods beyond the barrier to invade more easily. In that case, in order to protect this world and us, its inhabitants, Mr. Fool might consider abandoning the confrontation and permitting the Celestial Worthy's return intact. Lumian listened in a daze, a sudden thought racing through his mind. What would happen if Mr. Fool indeed chose to stop resisting the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for blessings? Magician didn't delve further into the topic. I can't share more information at this moment. In short, pursuing Loki and his associates is both your personal vendetta and a shared mission of our tarot club. If you're confident, take action on your own. If not, feel free to seek assistance from other major arcana card holders at any time to eliminate the minions of the Celestial Worthy to the best of your ability. With that, the woman stood up, and the room suddenly transformed into a celestial spectacle, filled with twinkling stars. It felt as if Lumian had been transported into the vast and dazzling cosmos. The stars revolved continuously, as if conveying a message. Madame Magician observed them for a moment before remarking, it's true that divination doesn't reveal Loki's whereabouts or identity after his resurrection, and the others lack sufficient information. Once Hela has organized the relevant data, provide me with a copy.
Chapter 394, Eye of the Storm Lumian was also waiting with anticipation for the abandoned April Fool's team members to recall useful details. He nodded and replied, Got it. Madam Magician fixed her gaze on him for a few moments, lost in thought. In the future, if I assign you a mission that seems clearly problematic, you have the option to either reject it or discuss it face to face with me while discreetly reaching out to other major Arcana card holders. Why? Lumian was a little confused. By doing so, isn't Madam Magician implying that something might happen to her? Magician chuckled self-deprecatingly. Because I'm a high-risk individual, susceptible to the influence of the Celestial Worthy. The Celestial Worthy holds the highest position in the Seer, Marauder, and Apprentice Pathways. The higher the corresponding Beyonder sequence, the more susceptible one is to his influence. Everyone carries an oldest one within them, you see. And as a high-level beyonder of the apprentice pathway and a believer in the fool, it's natural for me to occasionally be led astray, fooled, or deceived by the celestial worthy. Of course, Mr. Fool himself also stands at the pinnacle of these three pathways, which is why he opposes the celestial worthy. So, you need not worry about me. Most of the time, I'm under Mr. Fool's influence. There won't be anything wrong with my condition, but occasional anomalies might occur. It's akin to praying without a ritual or invoking a name beyond those three lines. All of that can draw the celestial worthy's attention and invite his response, potentially planting hidden dangers. High-ranking individuals in the seer, marauder, and apprentice pathways are closer to the celestial worthy and Mr. Fool. Even if one follows all the usual procedures, there's still a chance that something might go wrong. Lumian grasped Madame Magician's instructions before realizing that her words were revealing mysticism information that defied common sense. Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings could simultaneously hold the pinnacle of three pathways. Normally, reaching sequence zero in a pathway marked one as a true god. So what title did the individual at the peak of three pathways bear? A Great Existence? For the first time, Lumian began to comprehend that Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings might surpass even true gods like the Eternal Blazing Sun. Similarly, Amon's father, the ancient sun god, must belong to this echelon. After all, half of his inheritance had given rise to the one the Aurora Order believed in. Soon, Lumian remembered Madame Magician's distinct descriptions of different deities. Merely knowing of their existence and invoking their honorific names could corrupt certain deities, causing them to undergo mutations or face peril. Some deities could be mentioned in general terms, as long as one refrained from uttering their honorific names beyond the three lines of beyonder language, thus avoiding attracting their attention. This likely represents the division among deities. Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings occupy three neighboring and interchangeable pathways. Is this a hidden requirement for mastering a composite pathway? Lumian dared not probe further, fearing that knowing too much might lead to unintended consequences. As for Madame Magician belonging to the Apprentice Pathway, he had anticipated it. Aurora's grimoires had mentioned that Sequence 9 apprentices in this pathway excelled at opening doors. Sequence sevens were known as astrologers, aligning with Madame Magician's usual behavior and her occasional references to astrology, divination, and fate. Understood, Lumian replied. He went on to explain his plan, if he failed to eliminate Loki within two months, he intended to use the Iron and Blood Cross Order's internal processes to relocate from the market district, as well as the problem about concealing the sealed mark on his body. Magician was very understanding. No problem. Although you can also write to me and use yourself as bait, Loki might have the patience to wait a few more months, and I can't always be with you. As for the issue of the seal, if you don't actively activate it, only beyonders of the seer, apprentice, and marauder pathways who believe in the celestial worthy can sense it directly. This is different from the uncontrollable aura of the celestial worthy. If you need something quickly, seek angelic protection from Mr. Fool or write to me. I'll craft a charm that can safeguard secrets. That's the best way to manage the Celestial Worthy's aura on the Two of Cups for now. 
Fortunately, evil gods like the Mother Tree of Desire no longer paid special attention to people like them. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief and inquired, Can I share the information you just mentioned about the Celestial Worthy with the Two of Cups? Magician declined his request, explaining, Her major arcana card holder will give her a simplified explanation, but it won't be as clear as what I just said. She doesn't know enough either. If you reveal everything I shared with you, it could put her in danger. Lumian didn't press further and watched as Madam Magician used Starlight to create a dreamy door. She stepped through it and disappeared. The room's soundproof glass receded to its original state, and the crimson moonlight poured through the window, casting a glow on the table with the carbide lamp. Lumian settled by the bed, his mind racing, and he couldn't help but recall Loki's description of his exploits against Aurora. Taking a deep breath, he decided on his next course of action, digesting the pyromaniac potion. Cartier du Jardin Botanique, Rue Pasteur. As dawn broke, Franca and Jenna made their way back to the market district along this street. For the time being, Franca hadn't figured out how to broach the subject of the dangerous situation from last night with Jenna. She used the excuse that Jenna's brother was at home and might overhear them, so she decided to delay the conversation until tonight. When they returned to Avenue du Marquet, Jenna waved goodbye and headed towards Theatre de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons. However, before she could enter the modified brick-red three-story building, she noticed graffiti in a corner, almost resembling the work of a child. It served as a sign that the purifiers were calling for an urgent meeting, complete with time and location details. Jenna naturally averted her gaze and entered Theatre de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons. After about 15 minutes, in her role as the boss's lover, she left through the back door without any hindrance and arrived in a secluded alley near Eglis St. Robert. Before long, Valentine and Imra appeared. The former didn't waste time with pleasantries and got straight to the point, asking, Have you received any news about the terrifying aura from last night? Jenna was perplexed. What terrifying aura? You didn't sense it? Imra, who had some southern continent heritage, inquired with a furrowed brow. You didn't experience any nightmares? Jenna shook her head. I wasn't in the market district last night. I went home to visit my brother. Is that so? Imra examined Jenna's expression and concluded that she was telling the truth. She genuinely had no knowledge of the terrifying aura. The two purifiers briefly recounted the sudden appearance of a terrifying and violent aura on Rue de Blouse's blanches the previous night, urging Jenna to be more vigilant towards anyone displaying unusual behavior lately. Jenna agreed and asked with curiosity, was that aura very noticeable? Why were you able to sense it even from the cathedral? It's hard to describe, Imra admitted. If you ever have the chance to experience it, you'll understand. He himself couldn't fully grasp the extent of the influence of the terrifying aura. After bidding farewell to the two purifiers and returning to Theodore Delancey and Kajah Pigeons, Jenna's thoughts turned to Franca, who had acted strangely last night. She had cryptically mentioned danger and advised Jenna to go home for a while. Eventually, she had come to share her bed late at night, explaining that something had occurred on Rue de Blouse's Blanches and that she couldn't return. That terrifying aura had appeared on Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Jenna nodded, piecing things together. Meanwhile, Franca finished her coffee and returned to her apartment on Rue de Blouse's Blanches, which had returned to its usual state. However, upon opening the door to apartment 601, she noticed that the invisible spider silk she had concealed in the crack had fallen. This could only mean one thing, someone had entered. In the next instant, she spotted someone sitting in her recliner. It was Gardner Martin, a man with distinct facial features, brownish-red eyes, and a genial demeanor. A few gray strands of hair adorned his temples. Startled, Franca exclaimed, Why are you here? She was relieved that she hadn't returned with Lumian. Gardner Martin asked, bemused, What's your take on the aura from last night? What aura? Franca was perplexed. Gardner Martin, dressed in a formal suit without a bow tie, examined Franca closely and explained, a terrifying aura reeking of blood and rust. When did this happen? Franca recalled and shook her head. I was at Jenna's house last night. 
I wasn't in the market district. Gardner Martin nodded slowly and smiled. No wonder you didn't sense it. Apart from Seal, Madame Hila, and me dealing with Loki, did anything else happen last night? Franca walked to the coffee table in confusion, picked up her cup, and took a sip of water. What happened? Gardner Martin stood up and approached the window, looking down at Rue de Blouse's blanches. Late last night, a violent and terrifying aura emerged from Building 6 on this street. It lasted nearly ten seconds. Building 6. Building 6? Franca nearly choked on her own saliva. Isn't that the safe house I had rented through a loan merchant who had already left Trier? Isn't that where I fought Loki last night? Could Madame Hila or Loki have caused the commotion? Or was it Seal? Franca quickly regained her composure before Gardner Martin turned around. She felt as though she had missed many crucial details due to her fainting. Rue Anarchy, Aubert's Ducoke door. Lumian, who had just returned from his morning exercises, had just changed into fresh clothes and was making his way to the first floor hall when he encountered Anthony Reed, who had been deeply engrossed in his investigation regarding General Philip's widow and child. The psychiatrist glanced at Lumian and inquired, What happened in the market district last night? I've had numerous individuals attempting to buy information related to it from me. Lumian chuckled. Perhaps a strange aura erupted from Rue de Blouse's blanches. Chapter 395 Progress on the Other Side Anthony Reed, the middle aged psychiatrist, observed Lumian's smile and mused, Your performance suggests that this matter is personal to you. Damn it, you can tell from that? Lumian had thought his smile, expression, and body language appeared normal. His response hadn't been exceptional, but he hadn't made any obvious mistakes. Anthony Reed continued, Your smile and actions betrayed a sense of smugness. And your reaction tells me this matter is deeply intertwined with you. Could it be discerned even without mind reading? It wasn't until that moment that Lumian realized his seemingly ordinary expressions and actions might conceal hidden information in the eyes of a psychiatrist. Anthony Reed calmly advised, I'm telling you directly how I've interpreted your cues. In the future, when you find yourself facing a psychiatrist and wish to deceive them, it's best to prepare your emotions in advance and mentally rehearse your narrative as if it were genuine. If you'd rather not discuss the strange aura on Rue de Blouse's blanches, that's perfectly fine. I don't have the energy to gather information and trade it for money. Lumian contemplated Anthony's words and nodded gently. He then inquired, How's your investigation into General Philip going? Do you require our assistance? Anthony Reed glanced around, confirming there were no passers-by in the hall at this late hour, and Madame Fells was at a considerable distance. He whispered, General Philip's widow, child, and his closest friends during his lifetime don't seem to be a concern. They are leading normal lives. However, I've discovered that General Philip's widow donates a substantial sum to a charitable organization called Dream Seekers every quarter. The total donation amounts to nearly half of their apparent family assets. Lumian pondered for a moment and asked, quite generous. What can you tell me about the Dream Seekers charity? Anthony Reed replied, that's the subject of my next investigation. At present, I only know that their mission is to assist talented young individuals who have come to try or to pursue their dreams but have encountered temporary hardships. They are not affiliated with the two churches or established by government entities. It's a private charity primarily funded by donations from high society. Lumian smiled and issued a warning with a hint of mockery, be cautious when delving into the dream seekers. Of course, if you happen to be reckless, it won't matter. At the very least, I'm already aware that if you were to suddenly vanish or meet an untimely demise, the source of the trouble likely stems from that charitable organization. Anthony Reed stroked his light yellow hair. Don't worry, I'm timid and value my life. I duck for cover at the sound of gunfire. If I ever sense danger, I won't be too proud to seek your assistance. Besides, this is what you promised me. Without waiting for a reply, he continued, Guillaume Benet's wife has been residing at 20 rooted terraces in the library district and hasn't attempted to relocate. 
I've bribed some ordinary folks around her. Recently, they've informed me that a mysterious man occasionally visits her late at night, raising suspicions of an affair. Condiment Beauty Paulina Her decision to stay put on route at terraces likely means she feels more secure now. Combined with the neighborhood rumors, there's a strong likelihood that she has re-established contact with Bouvard Pompero of the Sinners Organization. Lumian smiled once more. Instruct your informants to compile a summary of the mysterious man's visitation patterns. This way, we can catch them in the act more precisely. It was imperative to apprehend the sinner's liaison, Bouvard Pompero. Only then could Lumian hope to trace the sinner's organization and locate Roche Louise Sanson's family. Initially, he had hoped to start his investigation with the Sanson family name, possibly targeting Jacques Sanson, who had once run for parliament in the market district. However, he soon realized that Sanson was a common surname in Intis, and Jacques Sanson's family connections appeared straightforward. There were no apparent issues on the surface, and there were no reports of disappearances involving his sister, daughter, or other relatives. After much contemplation, Lumian concluded that, for the time being, his focus needed to shift to the sinners, an organization dedicated to the belief in inevitability. His goal was to locate someone connected to the original Aurora's body. He couldn't shake the feeling that there were still mysteries surrounding Loki and the others who had targeted Aurora. It was impossible that the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings had directly sent a revelation instructing Loki and the others to guide Muggle into using the soul-summoning spell on herself, right? Such a direct involvement didn't align with the typical status of a deity and considering the Celestial Worthy's ongoing conflict with Mr. Fool, his condition shouldn't be that favorable. Moreover, Aurora had never participated in the April Fool's team's real-life gatherings. How then could Loki determine that her original body was a follower of an evil god? Lumian contemplated two possibilities. Either Aurora had long been tormented by Roche Louise Sanson's lingering will and sought help from I know someone, inadvertently revealing her secret and drawing their attention, or one of the core members of the April Fool's team had a close connection to the Sinners organization and stumbled upon the matters related to Roche-Louise Sanson. Anthony Reed nodded in approval as he observed Lumian's patience in waiting for the mysterious man who had visited Guillaume Benet's wife to provide more clues. Avenue du Marquet, Sal de Ball Breeze. Just as Lumian reached the staircase, he spotted Sarkota waiting there. The boss is upstairs, Sarkota whispered. He had been a part of Baron Brignet's operation for a long time, but he had no inkling about the true identity of the elusive boss of the Savoy mob. By the time Seal had taken over Sal de Ball Breeze, the boss had made two visits. What's the boss doing here? Lumian's mind raced as he quickly recalled the events of the past two days. A rough idea began to form. Ascending the staircase to the second floor, he spotted Gardner Martin, impeccably dressed in formal attire, sans bow tie, leisurely savoring his coffee. Gardner Martin put down his cup and asked with a smile, Where did you go? Lumian responded with candor. I had a chat with Anthony Reed, the information broker. I assigned him a mission, keeping tabs on the widow of Guillaume Benet, the enemy I just dispatched, and observing her associates. I suspect that Guillaume Benet might be backed by a secret organization that worships an evil deity. Gardner Martin chuckled and remarked, You're not leaving any room for mercy, are you? You're even more ruthless than I thought. Yes, we can enlist the authorities' assistance to deal with these secret organizations of evil gods. Without allowing Lumian a chance to reply, he inquired further, Did you sense that menacing and terrifying presence last night? Lumian nodded honestly. I felt it. I was present at the scene. Recalling the sensation coursing through his veins when he resonated with the Blood Emperor's aura, he added, Back then, my blood seemed to be on fire. I wanted to investigate the origin of that aura, but the official beyonders were quicker and sealed off Rude de Blouse's blanches. Gardner Martin appreciated Lumian's forthrightness. When the official beyonders are less vigilant, pay a visit to six Rue de Blouse's Blanches and do some digging. You might stumble upon something. All right, Lumian agreed readily. A return to the crime scene promised its own brand of intrigue. Late at night, 
3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches, Apartment 601, Franca's Room. Sitting beside the typewriter and radio transceiver, the demoness of pleasure perused the information before turning to Jenna, who sat by her bedside. The gist of the matter is that Seal has stumbled upon a new enemy. This guy is a Sequence 5 marionettist of the Seer Pathway, a member of Bureau 8. He's sinister and powerful. Not only did he detect our surveillance, but he also traced us back and launched an ambush. Franca skipped over the part about the curly-haired baboon's research society and recounted the entire incident. In this narrative, Gila's identity had been that of a formidable beyonder hired through a mysticism gathering. Franca spread her hands and said, I was out cold and unaware of the terrifying and violent aura that permeated the scene. When I came to, we were all underground. The marionettist, who went by the codename Loki, was already dead. Seal was incinerating his body, and that woman was watching. Jenna was astounded by the capabilities and performance of a marionettist. She tensed, feeling the summer night grow colder. Seeing Jenna's reaction, Franca seized the moment to add, but there's something even more chilling. She proceeded to recount everything she knew, sending shivers down Jenna's spine. Jenna involuntarily took a few steps closer to Franca. Damn it, what else have you guys been up to that I don't know about? Jenna mustered her courage, spewing out a few choice expletives. It's not us, it's Seal. Franca was about to delve into the horror when a message crackled through the radio transceiver. The intricate analyzer automatically translated it, spitting out a piece of paper through a connected mechanical typewriter. Franca picked it up and saw it was from 007. Hidden Blade, do you have any information about the terrifying aura in the Market District last night? Franca typed out her response, I don't reside in the Market District. Why would I know anything about it? 007 quickly replied, Most of the information you provide and the favors you ask from me are related to or within the vicinity of the Market District. If you haven't set foot there in the past six months, I'll eat my own hat. Franca chuckled dryly and responded, under Jenna's watchful gaze. I do have some knowledge about this incident. But I can't spill the beans right now. You'll get the scoop at our next gathering. As Franca conversed with 007, Lumian was resting in room 207 of the Albert's Du Coke door. For the moment, he refrained from finding any acting possibilities. Despite having received treatment from Madame Gila and no longer teetering on the brink of losing control, as well as the auto recovery at 6 a.m., there were lingering mental issues that required time and rest to slowly mend. Additionally, he needed to wait for Madame Gila to extract confessions from the April Fool's team members. Just before midnight, the pure silver skull emerged from the shadows, its teeth gripping a thick stack of papers. Chapter 396, Pure Evil Lumian expressed his gratitude and took the stack of papers. He lit the carbide lamp and quickly skimmed through the confessions. Gila had already thoroughly read through them and had made notes on the essential information. This saved Lumian a lot of time. Besides, he didn't know much about the curly-haired baboon's research society's history. If he were the one making the choice, he might struggle to grasp the key points accurately. After nearly an hour of reading, Lumian had a rough understanding of the overall situation. There aren't many April Fool's members, and they don't meet often or play pranks frequently. They mainly operate in three areas, Trier, the coastal province of Gaia in the Fainapotter Kingdom, and the West Balam region of the southern continent. The core members involved in the gatherings in Trier are Loki, I Know Someone, and Mad Lady. In the Gaia province, during the sea prayer rituals at Port Santa, the April Fool's team members who pulled pranks were Bard, Ultraman, and Mad Lady. Bard and Ultraman incited local college students to march in Torres, the capital of Gaia province. In the pranks that took place in the southern continent's West Balam, the core members involved were Ahsoka and Mad Lady. At a private gathering in Trier, Loki jokingly mentioned that he had inherited an ancient castle. At another Trier gathering, I know someone suddenly felt inspired and wanted to hypnotize certain psychiatrists to make them conceive a solution to treat certain mental illnesses by destroying the frontal lobe. 
Madam Susie's accusation of malicious treatment that would forever calm patients turns out to be a prank by I know someone. That's true. Only someone from another world could skip previous speculations and come up with such an idea. His sole purpose was to see if the psychiatrists of this world were as foolish, bigoted, and despicable as to create an absurd tragedy that would leave a mark on medical history. The dozens or hundreds of patients who had completely lost their souls would never expect their tragic encounter to stem from an inhumane prank. Loki and I know someone are worse than I imagined. Lumian couldn't help but shake his head as he read the last page of the confessions. He believed that he had already witnessed the worst side of humanity during his tramp days. People had committed heinous acts for food, to escape trouble, to vent their emotions, they had murdered other tramps, sold companions to the mines while they were asleep, abducted children from the streets, bullied the weak, and humiliated them in various ways. Some had formed gangs and chased away other tramps every day, turning a blind eye to their suffering. But now, Lumian realized that these evils were clearly inferior to those of Loki, I know someone, and the other core members of April Fools. They were on a whole other level. Even demons from the abyss would have to address them as godfathers when they see them. Compared to them, the Padre can be considered a saint, Lumian muttered, setting fire to these people repeatedly in his mind. He exhaled and extracted useful information from these confessions and Madame Hila's markings. At least eight members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society are suspected to have perished as a direct or indirect result of pranks by the April Fool's team. I know someone, like Loki, participates in every private gathering in Trier, but he has never been to Faina Potter's Gaia Province or West Balam. This suggests he likely resides in Trier as well. Similarly, Bard and Ultraman are suspected to be in Faina Potter's Gaia Province. Hisoka is located in the southern continent's West Balam. Mad Lady participates in private gatherings everywhere, and these gatherings occur within a month after an agreement is made. This implies that Mad Lady has a teleportation-like ability or item. The joke about Loki inheriting the ancient castle aligns with his dream. Perhaps I can start with investigating the appearance of the ancient castle to find Loki's whereabouts. I know someone displayed extensive medical knowledge at gatherings, not limited to the psychological domain. He was either a formidable general practitioner before transmigrating or possessed the body of a senior doctor. Could such a person be usually a doctor in disguise? He has the qualifications and ability to impersonate and earn a large sum of money. Bard loves to collect Emperor Roselle's diary pages and mock him in various ways. Could he have written Emperor Roselle's secret chronicles? Ultraman and Ahsoka keep a relatively low profile during the gatherings, leaving no details worth pondering. Based on this information, Lumian finalized his next course of investigation. Firstly, he wanted to find the ancient castle from Loki's dream. Secondly, he aimed to delve into the medical profession, seeking clues about I know someone. Thirdly, he planned to wait for the next gathering to confirm whether the author of Emperor Roselle's Secret Chronicles was among the current research society members before pursuing the original author. As for the others, he would consider them after dealing with these matters and gaining something more valuable. Lumian summoned the Rabbit of Knowledge and had it copy the information before sending it to Madame Magician. What's this? Jenna looked at the pure silver skull emerging from the darkness, a little afraid to meet the pale white flames in its eye sockets. Franca smiled awkwardly and said, This is the messenger of that formidable lady. She helped us organize the accomplice's statements. Franca snatched the thick piece of paper from the skull's mouth not wanting Jenna to see the first-hand information, revealing it would expose the curly-haired baboons' research society. Jenna looked at the pure silver skull disappearing into the darkness and asked in confusion and curiosity, what's a messenger? It's like a postman in the world of mysticism. It's a postman for private use, Franca explained simply. Jenna shifted her gaze to Franca. Do you have one? Franca fell silent. This can only be obtained by a specific pathway at a specific sequence or with their help. Oh, you don't. Jenna deciphered Franca's words. Intrigued, she asked, at which sequence in the Demona's pathway does one need to reach before they can have a messenger? Franca fell silent again. 
not even at sequence four that I know of. With that, she muttered under her breath, you can switch to the hunter pathway with your provocative abilities. Jenna chuckled and thought for a moment. The last time I helped Seal read about spirit world creatures, I seem to have noticed a description of a few spirit world creatures that said they were suitable as messengers. Can we summon them and sign a messenger contract? No, uh, it's not impossible. Franca suddenly realized that she could use Mr. Fool's power to summon creatures from the spirit world and ask him to be a witness to the contract, just like Seal's contract ability. Seeing Franca deep in thought, Jenna waited silently. After a moment, Franca nodded slowly. I've come up with an idea. We'll try it later. She then said to Jenna, I'll sort out these statements. Don't stay up too late. You still have to go to Theater Delancey and Cage Up Pigeons tomorrow morning. Jenna didn't inquire further and left Franca's bedroom. Franca let out a sigh of relief and took a telegram that had just been received. It also came from 007. Hidden Blade, where are you moving out of the market district? Ever since you arrived here, all kinds of troubles have been happening one after another. I'm about to become a real 007. I suspect you're the walking source of disaster. Pfft. Franca spat and muttered to herself, is the problem me? It's Seal. Ever since Lumian arrived in the market district, her life hadn't been as leisurely as before. The incident with Loki had just subsided, and the small cracks on her skin had yet to fully heal. She had to go to Trocadero tomorrow afternoon to interact with the participants of the Red House Cafe's female orgy and the woman suspected to be a member of the Demonist sect. Around 9 a.m., Lumian, having completed his morning exercise and breakfast, found himself with a rare moment of leisure. On the Iron and Blood Cross Order's side, he awaited Pufer Sauron's next summoning. Concerning the Sinner's organization, he patiently gathered information without alerting the occasional mysterious visitor. Anthony Reed would handle matters related to Hugues Artois, but his assistance wasn't needed yet. It proved challenging to discreetly tail Franca during the Bliss Society investigations as she needed to make contact with the Demonist sect. Lumian had leads on Loki's ancient castle and I know someone, but lacked a clear breakthrough. After careful consideration, Lumian decided that acting as a pyromaniac was the best course of action. However, the market district was in a delicate state closely monitored by numerous high-ranking individuals. Finding a safe opportunity was crucial. Should I take the opportunity to report to Mr. K and inquire if he has a suitable mission for me to act as a pyromaniac? Lost in thought, he walked past the Sal de Gristmill on Rue Anarchy's other side. The establishment was under Lumian's ownership, currently overseen by the bounty hunter Lugano Toscano and Louis of the Savoy mob. After a brief moment of reflection, Lumian decided to enter the Salle de Gristmill. The dance hall was closed at that time, and every waiter greeted Lumian respectfully but kept their distance. Lumian quickly spotted Lugano Toscano, the well-built bounty hunter with sharp features, thick eyebrows, and large eyes. He was dressed in a simple formal suit and a black top hat. Holding a magazine, he smiled at Lumian. Boss, what brings you here? Lumian didn't respond immediately. His attention was drawn to the magazine in Lugano's hand. What magazine are you reading? Basics of Medicine, Lugano replied, displaying the book. Basics of Medicine. Lumian's eyebrows twitched. Why are you reading such books? He could understand if it was the first aid manual. Lugano smiled and explained, my next sequence is Doctor. Although the potion will directly grant me corresponding beyonder powers, having more medical knowledge will enhance my abilities. Plus, I aim to pose as a genuine doctor to earn some extra income. Stumbling on the acting method coincidentally. Doctor. Lumian's heart stirred as he asked, Have you ever heard of frontal lobe removal surgery? Chapter 397 Execution Ground Lugano cast a puzzled glance at Lumian. You've heard about this surgery too. After a moment of thought, he forced a smile. As expected of you. You're knowledgeable and have a wide range of interests. You even know about such cutting-edge surgeries. 
Seems like you know a lot, Lumian brushed off Lugano's ingratiation. Lugano nodded quickly. I've read in several magazines that doctors believe the essence of such surgery is to destroy the patient's brain, and it's irreversible. In other words, while it appears to cure the patient's madness, it leaves him with lower intelligence and eternally calm, devoid of emotional fluctuations. They believe that if we don't use this surgery, there's still a chance of recovery from the madness through other methods, but once they become stupid, there's no hope of recovery. Intus still has many doctors with high academic standards who dare to speak the truth. Their professional ethics aren't bad either. Lumian nodded inwardly. After confirming that Lugano had a certain understanding of the medical world, he casually asked, Any strange medical cases recently? Lugano pondered for a moment and slowly shook his head. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just as Lumian was about to change the subject, Lugano added, If you insist on something strange, there's a folklore that's been trending on a small scale recently. Medical-related folklore? Lumian discerned the underlying meaning in Lugano's words. Lugano, with his brown hair and eyes, replied with a smile, sort of. It's probably because a group of Trier citizens believe that the blood shed by a death row inmate carries the last vestiges of life's resilience. If you eat some bread dipped in it, it can treat various illnesses. This infuriated many medical columnists, who called it a retro, bloody, and foolish act. In comparison, going to the cathedral to seek protection might be more effective. Why haven't I heard of such folklore? Lumian found the Trier citizens' actions indescribable. They weren't just foolish. Lugano chuckled. Boss, that's normal. I've never heard of it before either. It's a folklore that only appeared in the past two to three months. Perhaps it's brought about by some foreigners. More and more people are believing it. Lumian chatted with the bounty hunter, who had saved up to purchase the doctor main ingredient, for a while longer, gaining a vague understanding of Trier's medical world. Shortly before noon, having filled his stomach, he turned on to Rue de Blouse's blanches and entered apartment 3. Throughout this process, Lumian didn't conceal his curiosity. He carefully examined six Rue de Blouse's blanches, but found no traces. He knocked on apartment 601's door and tossed the lie earring to Franca, whose flaxen-colored hair was tied up in a simple ponytail. This companion had to interact with the demoness sect in the afternoon again. She had to revert to her previous appearance. What took you so long? Franca precisely caught the silver earring. Didn't you receive the information from Madame Gila? I've been waiting for you to come and discuss it. A soft chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. Why are you even more anxious than me? After closing the door, he sat on the sofa and recounted the key information and corresponding guesses he had extracted from the information. Franca chimed in from time to time, offering her opinions. Towards the end, Lumian recounted the bounty hunter Lugano Toscano's description of Trier's medical world and the strange folklore. Franca's expression turned odd. Is there a problem? Lumian wasn't alarmed but delighted. Franca confirmed succinctly, the rumor that eating bread stained with the blood of death row inmates can treat illnesses is very similar to ancient folklore back home, but that was many years ago. Ever since education was made universal, such folklore has basically disappeared. In the original folklore, steamed buns dyed red by the blood of death row inmates could treat severe lung ailments, provided they were eaten while they were still hot. Lumian raised his right eyebrow. He had found the strange folklore giving him an indescribable feeling. It felt like a prank. This was the style of April Fools. I know someone came up with it. Lumian suddenly felt a surge of excitement. A psychiatrist capable of hypnosis could make such folklore appear and spread without anyone knowing. Franka nodded solemnly. I know someone is also from your sisters and my homeland. Otherwise, your sister wouldn't have trusted him and sought treatment for her psychological problems. His code name and the language he knows bear witness to this. Besides him and Black Earth, the other members of April Fools might not be aware of that ancient folklore. Loki doesn't know either? Lumian asked in surprise. I'm not sure. Franca frowned. I'm not familiar with him, 
and he has never revealed his identity as a fellow countryman. If he hadn't recited the four-lined honorific name in the language of your sister and me, I wouldn't have known that he knew it. I always thought that their team's Emperor Roselle diary entries were translated by I know someone in Black Earth. A mischievous grin curved Lumian's lips. If it's really a folklore prank created by I know someone, I'll go to the execution ground in the prison district and watch. The prison district, also known as Cartier du Red Hat, officially numbered four, was one of the oldest urban districts. It boasted Entis's most renowned prison, St. Mar Prison, hence the district's name. Near St. Mar Prison stood one of Trier's busiest execution grounds, Roy's Comprehensive Execution Ground. Be careful. Psychiatrists are more cautious than marionettists, Franca warned. Although I know someone wasn't a beyonder of the seer, marauder, or apprentice pathways and couldn't discover the seal on Lumian's body even if he believed in the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings, Lumian still felt that he couldn't be careless. He got back the lie earring and briefly changed his appearance. He was worried that the resurrected Loki had already communicated with I know someone about his and Franca's real appearance. Franca took back the lie earring and asked curiously, what was up with that terrifying aura from that day? Lumian chuckled. We'll need to start with Madame Hela and me searching for the Samaritan Women's Spring. Dot. Franca was taken aback for a moment before cursing. Damn it. How many details did you leave out? It depends on when it comes up. Lumian briefly mentioned how the Blood Emperor's aura had corroded his flesh. Franca had already forgotten her anger. She carefully observed Lumian's raised right palm and finally noticed the indistinct marks that seemed to have been squeezed beyond recognition. Wow, you actually have the aura of a true god on you. Although it's just an empty shell, it's still the aura of a true god. Furthermore, it's a true god of the same pathway. Franca sighed enviously, wishing she could have one for herself. She then looked at Lumian's bandaged left hand. What's on this one? Nothing. It's just to attract attention, Lumian replied with a smile. Franca was stunned for two seconds. You're so sinister. If you advance to a conspirer, your digestion speed will definitely be very fast. I hope the outcome is as good as your blessings, Lumian replied without modesty. In the afternoon, Lumian took a public carriage to the north bank of the Srenzo River and arrived at the Royce Comprehensive Execution Ground in the prison district. One of Trier's citizens' hobbies was watching the execution of criminals. Although it wasn't the weekend, there were still many people gathered here. There were even many vendors setting up stalls or traversing among them, hawking food and drinks. Among them, there was no shortage of gorgeously dressed street girls seeking business as well as a group of authors who had deliberately come to take a stroll. If not for the name Royce Comprehensive Execution Ground written at the intersection and the gallows and beheading platform standing in the distance, Lumian would have suspected that he had come to the wrong place and entered a nearby market. It was bustling and noisy. Stepping on the muddy ground, Lumian concealed himself in the crowd and circled the execution ground as if he were strolling through a market. He didn't spot anyone suspicious but he saw a dozen or so men and women with bread in their hands crowding in front. Their clothes were old, and some of them could be considered crude. After a while, the crowd suddenly stirred, squeezing to the sides of the road leading to the execution ground to welcome the procession from St. Mar Prison. Lumian didn't join in the bustle, but he heard cheers, whistles, and women shouting, I'm willing to marry you. The latter wasn't a proposal, but a jest about past folklore. In the classical era before Emperor Roselle, if a death row inmate received a proposal while walking from prison to the execution ground and he agreed, he would receive a change in sentence and survive. However, not all death row inmates would accept it. Some valued looks very much, while others had dignity. They all chose death to uphold their ideals. The two most renowned cases involved a handsome death row inmate who rejected the proposal of a woman believing her appearance to be a nightmare. On the other hand, a beautiful girl, faced with an executioner's courtship, gave up the opportunity to save herself, believing it was an insult to love and marriage. Lumian squeezed into the front row of onlookers and saw two death row inmates standing at the firing point. 
They were relatively young, no more than 30 years old. They wore standard prison uniforms, red short shirts, yellow pants, and green hats. Their feet dragged iron balls, and their hands were tied behind their backs with iron chains. One of the men had black hair and blue eyes, while the other had brown hair and brown eyes. They were good-looking, but their gazes were filled with hatred. Upon seeing the execution gunmen reach their designated positions and raise their rifles, the two death row inmates shouted, Long live freedom! Return to glory! After shouting, the two of them glared at each other angrily and collapsed amidst the gunshots, blood gushing out. The people holding the bread were excited, but they were stopped by the soldiers in front of them and couldn't rush to the firing point. Once the condition of the two death row inmates was confirmed, the soldiers left in formation. The bread-wielding citizens charged towards the blood-stained soil. Lumian didn't look at them. Instead, he observed his surroundings to see who was enjoying this absurd comedy. Chapter 398 Human Blood Bread Some of the citizens of Trier were curious and began asking around for the reason behind the commotion, while others watched with excitement. Lumian couldn't discern who was genuinely enjoying the prank's results and who was simply caught up in the fun. This was a part of Trier's folklore. Lumian believed that even a formidable, higher-sequence psychiatrist like Madame Susie wouldn't be able to pinpoint the source of the commotion, identify the prankster, or distinguish the intentional misguidance from the innocent bystanders. Although Lumian had anticipated this, he couldn't help but let out a sigh. You Trierians! No wonder the April Fool's team held their private gatherings here. It was like a homecoming. Lumian abandoned his observations and casually singled out a middle-aged man who was using rye bread to soak up the blood left behind by the death row inmates. He waited until the man made a dash for an exit of the Roy's comprehensive execution ground before quietly following behind. In a secluded alley devoid of barricades, Lumian took a few steps forward, blocking the path of the middle-aged man in a tattered linen shirt. Raising his bandaged left palm, Lumian inquired, as if he were a mobster giving a condescending glance to an ordinary citizen. What have you got there? The gaunt middle-aged man with short black hair replied timidly, its bread stained with the blood of death row inmates. And what's the purpose of this? Lumian adopted the tone of a curious monster with a touch of intrigue. The middle-aged man's fear was palpable. It, it can treat illnesses. Who told you it could treat illnesses? This was Lumian's main question. The middle-aged man answered in a daze, I heard it from Guillaume, who lives across the street. He said that his co-worker's child got better after eating this kind of human blood bread. The child of a co-worker's neighbor. Lumian regarded it as nothing more than a rumor. Tracing its origin would be challenging. He studied the middle-aged man clutching the blood-stained bread and asked with contemplation, Is someone in your family sick too? Yes. The middle-aged man instantly looked downtrodden and filled with despair. He glanced at the blood-stained bread in his hand, a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Lumian remained silent for a moment before responding, What did the doctor say? The middle-aged man lowered his head slightly, his gaze fixed on the blood bread. He said there's no cure, and I don't have the money to. Lumian didn't press further. He turned silently, allowing the middle-aged man to pass through the barricade with his blood-soaked bread and continue down the secluded alley. He moved slowly, retracing his steps back to the Royce Comprehensive Execution Ground, and noticed that the market was still in full swing. Many citizens had taken advantage of the situation to have picnics, sing, and dance, turning it into an impromptu gathering. Lumian took cover behind the trees on the edge of the square, sitting in the shadows, and continued to silently observe the people coming and going. As time passed, the bustling market in the execution ground gradually quieted down. The sun had dipped below the horizon, casting the surroundings into darkness. Lumian remained hidden, keeping an eye on the departing citizens and vendors. However, he didn't identify any suspicious individuals. With the arrival of the dark night, the Royce comprehensive execution ground was deserted, bathed in the eerie light of the crimson moon. Lumian slowly rose to his feet, preparing to depart. Suddenly, 
he caught sight of a dark figure leaping over the side fence and swiftly infiltrating the execution ground. Lumian froze and pressed further into the shadows of the tree. The slender figure, adorned with a top hat, made his way to the area where the death row inmates had met their end. He knelt down, reached out, and collected the soil stained with their blood. Could this person also believe in the healing properties of death row inmates' blood? His actions and agility suggest he might be a beyonder. Lumian silently watched the mysterious figure. Before long, the tall, thin figure in the top hat straightened up, holding a mound of blood-soaked soil. Rather than immediately leaving the Royce execution grounds, he ventured deeper, heading towards the gallows. Under the crimson moonlight, the figure buried the blood-stained soil beneath the gallows. He seemed to scrutinize the plants growing there, as if searching for something. In Trocadero Town, inside the Red House Café with its vibrant mushroom-like roof, Franca, sporting black hair, brown eyes, and hunting attire, placed her dinner order, beef seasoned with coarse salt, red wine, fries, face sack omelet, quail bisque with a few slices of ham. Earlier that afternoon, she had engaged in a lively conversation with a group of ladies and could sense the longing and desire in their eyes. Simultaneously, she felt someone secretly observing her, prompting her to stay until nightfall. As Franca neared the end of her dinner, a woman descended from the second floor. It was the demoness who had tailed Franca previously. Today, her long orange-red hair cascaded down her back, and she wore a white man's shirt, brown dungarees, and dark brown boots that accentuated her perfect figure. Her appearance was exquisite and clean, with an aura that was both pure and slightly wild. Without hesitation, the woman, presumably a member of the demoness sect, walked straight toward Franca, pulled out a chair, and sat opposite her. Franca deliberately assessed the demoness's appearance and figure with a masculine gaze. She smiled and watched as the woman sat down, waiting for her to speak. Why are you here again? The orange red haired demoness inquired, studying Franca closely. Franca smiled and replied, Trocadero wine is my favorite wine. The scenery and atmosphere here are quite appealing. Noticing the demoness's disbelief, Franca added with a sly smile, Besides, I've heard. She lowered her voice and insinuated, There are female orgies here. The eyes of the demoness with long orange red hair flickered. Who told you that? Franca looked at the demoness's face and said provocatively, Once, I encountered a nymphomaniac who tried to ambush me, but I handled him. He claimed to be a peripheral member of an organization called the Bliss Society. The core members of this organization are lesbians, and they are trying to connect with participants in the female orgies at the Red House Café, looking to recruit new members. Franca wasn't sure if the Demonis sect had any ties to the Bliss Society. After all, it wasn't inconceivable for organizations worshipping evil gods to form alliances to some extent, similar to how Hugues Artois had numerous heretics under his influence. Therefore, she confessed this information to gauge the reaction of the person sitting across from her. As she spoke, she prepared herself for any potential surprise attacks. The demoness with long orange-red hair's expression shifted slightly, becoming more serious. The hostility and weariness in her eyes diminished, but there was a clear sense of repulsion. Oh, does she view the participants of these female gatherings as her lovers and is unwilling to let me, possibly once a man, near them? Franca couldn't help but mimic Lumian's tone inwardly and playfully tease. She was reasonably certain that the other party had never heard of the Bliss Society, but she had detected some signs. The demoness sitting across from Franca fell into deep thought, appearing to consider a potential issue. After more than ten seconds, she unconsciously brushed back her long orange-red hair and asked cautiously, Are you here to investigate the Bliss Society, or are you interested in joining the orgy? Franca's laugh drew astonished looks from the surrounding customers, who were clearly taken aback by her stunning expression. Both, Franca replied, meeting the orange-red eyes of the demoness. But if I had to choose, I'd prefer attending the orgy. How can people like us resist such a tempting party? Wouldn't you agree? In this way, Franca subtly indicated that she had deduced that the other person was also a demoness and likely a former male assassin. She also hinted at her own history as a man to deter any sudden attacks. 
The demoness, now dressed as a man, seemed to resist this notion but remained silent, clearly captivated by Franca's presence and aura. Leaning forward, Franca asked in a more masculine tone, What should I call you? The demoness hesitated briefly before responding somberly, I'm Brown Sauron. And you? Sauron. Another member of the Sauron family? Franca suddenly recalled that Lomian's recent mission under the Iron and Blood Cross Order involved interactions with members of the Sauron family. She didn't conceal her true name and smiled. Franca Roland. Brown Sauron let out a silent sigh and continued, Our party places great importance on the privacy and safety of all members. We can't allow problematic individuals to join. If you're truly interested, you'll need to undergo an audit. Franca didn't mind at all. She toyed with the buttons on her shirt and inquired with a grin, So, where should we start this audit? Prison District, Royce Comprehensive Execution Ground. Under the crimson moonlight, the tall, slender figure in the top hat carefully unearthed a few handfuls of weeds from the ground beneath the gallows. The roots of these weeds emitted an eerie, blood-red glow, appearing especially otherworldly in the moon's dim light. This tall, thin figure had a prominent nose bridge, fair skin, and impeccably groomed medium-length black hair. His eyes were a striking shade of red, and he possessed a certain androgynous allure. Clad in a white shirt, a vibrant red bow tie, and a sleek black suit, he gazed with fascination at the peculiar weeds in his hand. He was on the verge of rising to leave the execution grounds. However, at that very moment, a curious male voice broke the silence. What are you digging? The lanky figure, who had been crouched beneath the gallows, looked up in astonishment. To his surprise, he realized that, at some unnoticeable point in time, a figure had materialized before him, peering down with a penetrating gaze. This new arrival had blonde hair and eyes as blue as serene lakes. He wore a simple white shirt and a black vest, giving him a youthful and refreshing appearance. How did he manage to approach me without detection? I didn't pick up on any scent or movement. The lanky figure's heart raced with alarm and trepidation. Chapter 399, Mandric The lanky figure, though startled, sprang into action. In a swift motion, he launched a powerful kick with his knee, lunging at Lumian, leaving only a blur behind. Rather than reaching out with his right hand, which was gripping the strange weeds, he extended his nails, etched with mystical symbols and patterns, appearing hard and razor-sharp. Darkness surrounding Lumian seemed to awaken, converging into pitch-black chains that aimed to ensnare him in place. Lumian's gaze remained resolute as he observed the rapidly approaching figure. He emitted a soft harumph. Two beams of brilliant white light shot forth from his nostrils, striking the target before he could evade in time. The tall, slender figure suddenly crumpled to the ground, unconscious. The illusory chains, formed from darkness, disintegrated into nothingness. Lumian, donning a different visage, grinned and shook his head. You actually opted for an attack rather than fleeing. Utilizing spirit world traversal, he teleported to close the distance with his target discreetly, preventing him from sensing the impending danger. When they were within mere meters of each other, escape or counterattack became impossible. At worst, both parties would sustain injuries. Hence, Lumian still had time for a greeting. If the other party cooperated and answered civilly, there might be no need for a confrontation. It was akin to a phrase frequently espoused by the Curly Haired Baboons Research Society encouraging compliance through good morals. Lumian carefully observed for a few moments and confirmed that the tall, thin figure had indeed fainted. He bent down to examine the peculiar blood-red rooted weeds. Apart from their extraordinary spiritual properties, they seemed rather ordinary. After some contemplation, Lumian hoisted the unconscious figure and shook him vigorously. As the target began to stir, Lumian released his grip and stepped back. Based on the previous skirmish, Lumian suspected that the other party was a mid-sequence beyond her from the apothecary pathway, specifically Sequence 7, known as Vampire. This meant that any human who consumed the corresponding potion to advance would eventually undergo a transformation into another species. 
Aurora possessed substantial knowledge about vampires' characteristics and abilities, as the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society included two individuals known as Sanguins, one of whom bore the codename Headmaster. Hence, Lumian deduced the target's identity based on his swift reflexes, formidable nails, and the dark shackles-like spells he wielded. Since he wasn't a psychiatrist and didn't possess any similar items, they weren't truly enemies. The best course of action was to engage in a friendly and cooperative conversation. As soon as the lanky figure regained consciousness, he sprang to his feet and scanned his surroundings with a wary gaze. His eyes fell upon a blonde youth standing by the gallows, dressed in a crisp outfit and wearing a friendly smile. Instinctively, he considered launching an attack, but a rational thought held him back. The other party had clearly demonstrated the ability to subdue him effortlessly, with the power to end his life or sell him at any moment. However, instead of harm, he had chosen to awaken him. This implied an absence of immediate malice. Moreover, it indicated a profound confidence in his own capabilities, as if he were unafraid of any resistance or escape. The lanky figure recalled the other party's sudden appearance and the peculiar white beams. He couldn't help but feel that even if the barons or even viscounts from his family were to confront him, the outcome wouldn't be so swift and one-sided. Coupled with his ignorance of the two white beams' nature and the corresponding pathway, he suspected that the individual before him had surpassed his expectations in terms of sequence. What do you want? The lanky figure inquired in a deep voice. Lumian remained composed, ready to employ the spell of Harumph if necessary. Are you a vampire? Sanguine, the lanky figure emphasized. Lumian cast his eyes skyward at the crimson moon and inquired with a smile, which family? Though he possessed no knowledge of the numerous vampire families or the renowned last names, it didn't prevent him from assuming the role of an ancient being, wise and well-traveled. Sensing the fear in the lanky figure's demeanor, Lumian seized the opportunity to play this role, drawing inspiration from figures like the ancient monster Amon, who had lived for eons. I hail from the Brook family, the tall, slender figure declared with pride. My name is La Nu Brook. What kind of family is this? I've never heard of them. Lumian nodded slightly and said, Ah, the Brook family. He glanced at the strange weed in La Nu's hand. What is this? It's Mandric, La Nu responded truthfully, believing that such a potent beyonder wouldn't have much interest in a plant primarily used for spiritual purposes. You mustn't merely answer my questions one by one. Be proactive and provide context and your reasons for being here. How can I maintain my image like this? Lumian chided him internally as he thought rapidly. Did you come specifically to retrieve it because this herb holds unique significance for you? La Nu hesitated for a moment before succumbing to his fear. Yes, the lotion made from it can help me withstand the spirituality surge during the full moon. Spirituality Surge Lumian recalled some details from Aurora's grimoires, the headmaster of the academy team had sought a solution to the spirituality surge during the full moon within the curly-haired baboons research society, but had found none. According to sanguine accounts, after the awakening of the ancestor of the ancient species a few years ago and her reclamation of authority from the Evernight goddess, all sanguines had become unstable during the full moon. This wasn't the madness that afflicted the mutants, but a form of sublimation. Nevertheless, the sudden surge in spirituality, akin to a rising tide, placed a substantial burden on the vampires' bodies. Some experienced hallucinations or unnecessary danger due to their heightened spiritual perception during this period. Lumian regarded Lanu with interest and asked, Mandric can suppress the spirituality surge during the full moon? The few sanguines I've encountered seem to be unaware of this. The entire curly-haired baboons research society was unaware. La Nu didn't hide his smugness. I believe I may be the first to have made this discovery. Mandric is a plant that thrives beneath the corpses of hanged individuals. It appears to draw power from some sort of earthbound divine influence. Spiritual plants associated with the earth domain? Lumian inquired thoughtfully. How did you stumble upon this revelation? Observing that such a formidable beyonder was ignorant of the origins and applications of Mandric, La Nu's smile broadened. 
At first, there were rumors circulating about the plants that grew beneath the bodies of the hang being able to treat various ailments. Given that every sanguine is an apothecary, I couldn't entirely dismiss these rumors. So, I decided to give it a shot. I crafted a mandrake lotion and found that it remarkably suppressed spirituality fluctuations. Rumor. Rumors once again. Lumian suppressed his frown. Do you happen to know where these rumors originated? I'm afraid not, La Nu replied with a shake of his head. In Trier, rumors abound. For example, in recent months, I was concerned that the reckless harvesting of mandrick by uninformed citizens might disrupt its growth. However, new rumors have surfaced, with people now chasing after blood-soaked soil from death row inmates. It's indeed a challenge to trace the origins of rumors and trier, Lumian remarked, a touch of resignation in his voice. Why did you bring soil stained with the blood of a death row inmate to the gallows? Lanu proudly displayed his findings. I've discovered that mandrake flourishes beneath the bodies of hanged individuals. While it's most effective, hanging people isn't a common occurrence. However, by using the blood of other death row inmates to nourish it, mandrick can still grow. Although it's not as potent, it gets the job done. Lumian nodded thoughtfully, considering another aspect of the issue. Who initially gave the mandrick its name? Wasn't it merely a rumor in the beginning? When it came to topics within his apparent profession, La Nu spoke confidently. This plan has borne its name for quite some time, though no one had discovered its medicinal value until now. It was primarily utilized as a spiritual ingredient and as a component in certain spells. At this juncture, La Nu suddenly fell into a momentary stupor. Why haven't my ancestors, the illustrious apothecaries, attempted to concoct lotions with mandrick? They aren't confined to traditional knowledge, they explore ingredients based on principles and develop new lotions. Perhaps they did try, but there was no spiritual surge in those times? Could it be that Mandrick possessed some mystical power triggered by the spirituality surge accompanying the full moon? Lumian, not being an apothecary or a mysticologist, couldn't arrive at a conclusive answer. All he could do was speculate based on La Nu's musings. He changed the subject. Why did you refrain from reporting the Mandrick's utility to your elders? It could hold great significance for the entire Sanguine community. La Nu stammered, there are still some issues with the lotions I've crafted. I'm uncertain if the toxicity of mandrick can be entirely neutralized. I plan to verify this before informing the higher-ups. Only then can I have a clear chance at ascending to the rank of Baron. What issues have you encountered? Lumian queried, part curious and partly assisting the headmaster of the curly-haired baboons research society. La Nu adjusted his long, black hair and expressed his concerns with a mix of confusion and apprehension. Whenever I consume the various mandrake-based lotions, it's akin to ingesting poisonous mushrooms. I witness an abundance of flowers blooming on the ground, with countless tiny figures dancing amidst them. I find myself covered in mushrooms. The illusions vary somewhat each time, but recurring elements persist. Could it be that your preemptive entry into the illusion mitigates the adverse effects of your spirituality surge state? Is that why you believe Mandrick can suppress this phenomenon? Lumian silently pondered. Without further ado, he activated his spirit world traversal ability and vanished from La Nu's view. A Sequence 5 Traveler or an item of similar nature? La Nu heaved a sigh of relief, hazarding a rough guess as to why the other party could appear beside him before he could react. Coupled with the strange white beams, such a figure was undoubtedly formidable below the demigod level. Chapter 400 Transferring Burdens The street lamps outside the window had already lit up. Franca gazed at Brown Sauron and spoke, I've already mentioned my name. I reside in the market district and hold a significant position within the Savoy mob. That's all I can reveal. You're free to investigate me as you wish. In any case, I have two objectives. Firstly, I intend to probe into the Bliss Society and eliminate any hidden threats. Secondly, I plan to take the opportunity to gain insight into the female gathering. Franca couldn't help but smile at her last statement. 
Her strategy for the day involved connecting with people genuinely, a tactic she had devised with Lumian. If the demoness at the Red House Cafe approached her, she would confess her intentions and assess if the other party had any ties to the Bliss Society. Franca had even discussed specific details with Anthony Reed, a psychiatrist, to prevent herself from reacting excessively. If that happened, it could do more harm than good. According to Anthony Reed's suggestion, she was candid, but not completely forthcoming. Revealing that she was once a man, had transformed into a demoness of pleasure, and was infiltrating the Savoy mob to join the Iron and Blood Cross Order and eventually return to her original gender would not only fail to gain trust but also raise suspicions of ulterior motives due to her excessive honesty. Thus, she only disclosed her identity and primary motives on the surface, leaving the rest hidden in the details, allowing the other party to uncover and investigate on their own. Information gathered through effort was much more credible than mere words. Brown Sauron fixed his gaze on Franca's eyes and remarked, With the strength you've demonstrated, why limit yourself to being a mob leader? For something of great importance, I believe you would have done the same, Franca replied cryptically, hinting that she had also discerned the other party's path, approximate sequence, and original circumstances. With that, she raised her hand to touch the silver-white earring fastened to her right earlobe and added with a grin, I forgot to mention that this isn't my true appearance. My disguise is quite effective. Otherwise, why did you lose track of me the last time? Browns glanced at the silver earring, nodding in comprehension. Instead of delving deeper into Franca's identity, the conversation shifted toward the topic of the Bliss Society. Franca could discern that the demoness placed significant importance on the Red House Cafe's female orgies and was cautious about any organizations or individuals with hidden agendas. Are you telling me that you genuinely form romantic connections with some of the participants in these orgies and have developed feelings for them? If this continues, you're bound to encounter trouble sooner or later. It's perfectly natural to have emotions, but seeking them in such gatherings is a sign of a narrow perspective. Can't you completely separate the spiritual from the physical? When there's too much spiritual connection, the desire for physical intimacy grows. Conversely, with too much physical intimacy, it's inevitable for souls to draw closer. As an observer, Franca offered her critique of Brown Sauron's situation, drawing from the knowledge and experiences of two lifetimes that had led to her philosophical reflections. This insight allowed her to grasp her first principle as a demoness of pleasure to some extent. She didn't withhold any information. On the one hand, she suspected that the demoness sect had fostered such an innocent and emotionally driven demoness because they had their sights set on the Sauron family. On the other hand, she recounted the general activities and abilities of the Bliss Society. Upon hearing the name Sex Addict and its corresponding behavior, Brown Sauron's expression grew serious and cautious. Franca knew when to conclude the conversation. She finished her after-dinner liqueur, rose gracefully, put on her blue bonnet, and departed from the Red House Café. As she entered the rental carriage and returned to the market district, her mind raced, analyzing potential vulnerabilities. I need to persuade Jenna to move out. But having her stay in my apartment might reveal my true gender. I must remind her not to display her assassin and instigator abilities for the time being. The issue with Seal is that if Brown Sauron and Poofer Sauron frequently interact, they might discover that the affluent merchant's generous scion is, in reality, the leader of the Market District's mob, exposing the Iron and Blood Cross Order's hidden agenda. Yes, Brown's is affiliated with the Demonist sect and doesn't share the same interests as the Sauron family there is a significant likelihood that she would conceal this fact and exploit it. Browns is brimming with emotions. Is she preparing for the affliction of a sequence 5? Dot. Rudu Rossignol, Market District. Lumian teleported back to his safe house. While waiting for Franca to return lie to him and allow him to revert to his original appearance, he contemplated the rumors circulating about the human blood bread. It would have been manageable if I had discovered it from the outset, but now it's already widely believed. Hundreds or perhaps thousands of people have bought into it. Tracing it back to the source will be extremely challenging. Moreover, even if I locate the origin, 
the person responsible may be filled with false information and unable to identify their source. Finding a skilled psychiatrist who can hypnotize people is quite a task. The Mandrake rumor La Nu Brook had heard appears suspicious. After careful consideration, Lumian decided not to dwell on it. He would report it to Madame Magician and explore the possibility of hiring someone like Madame Susie or even a high-ranking psychiatrist such as Madame Justice to investigate the source of the rumors. They were experts in similar operations and possessed all the abilities of I know someone, and even more. The matter concerning the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings was a shared mission of the Tarot Club. Likewise, Lumian intended to burden the major arcana card holders with the other clue. Given his abilities, it was practically impossible for him to investigate it further. He believed that since Loki was operating within Bureau 8, there was a chance he had either subtly influenced some of his colleagues or been discovered by them. All these were potential leads. However, based on his experiences dealing with a marionettist, Lumian recalled the events at the Alone Bar and the puppet show in the basement. It wasn't as murky as he had initially thought. It exuded an aura of malevolence, obscurity, and terror, and he could distinctly perceive the tangible danger concealed within the various details. He suspected that most of the spectators at the marionette theater were, in fact, marionettes themselves, fitting the bar's name, alone. It seemed that there was only one living person amidst the marionettes. Of course, this was somewhat exaggerated. It was evident that a few Bureau 8 members were working as bartenders and waitstaff at the alone bar, including Loki and Leah. Nevertheless, Beyonders capable of manipulating an entire theater filled with marionettes were far more powerful than Loki. They likely exceeded Sequence 5 and might even be demigods of the Seer Pathway. Regardless of Lumian's confidence, he didn't believe he could uncover any clues in a bar protected by a demigod. He didn't dare to attempt it. Only the major arcana card holders of the Tarot Club could conduct a thorough investigation in that direction. Without hesitation, Lumian unfolded a letter and began reporting his findings to Madame Magician. As the doll messenger was summoned, it cast a glance at Lumian and remarked, Do you enjoy dressing up? Is that because I'm wearing a new face? Lumian smiled and replied, It's a necessity in certain situations. Disguises help ensure that one remains unrecognized when carrying out certain tasks. The messenger nodded slowly. No wonder you can't tell I'm different every day. Lumian gazed at the light golden attire of the doll messenger, unsure whether to offer a truthful response or a white lie. In what way is it different from before? Observing Lumian's silence, the messenger snatched the letter and stated sharply, My hair is smoother, my skin is more elastic, and my dress is new. With those words, the messenger's voice gradually faded away as it dissolved into the candlelight. Lumian let out a sigh and muttered to himself, Perhaps the more familiar I become with someone, the less I notice their subtle changes. It was akin to Franca, who appeared so relaxed around him that she didn't feel the need to rack her brains on many things. If one had to rack their brains and be on edge when interacting with others, their mental state would inevitably deteriorate over time. Seeing that it was time, Lumian left Rue du Rossignol and arrived at apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He knocked on the door, and Jenna opened it, looking surprised. Who might you be? Lumian scoffed. Can't you still not tell from my gate? Damn it, your aura, which makes others want to beat you up, will make your disguise useless. Jenna knew that Lumian possessed a mystical item capable of altering his appearance. Once Lumian entered the living room, he glanced around. Where's Franca? She hasn't returned from her visit to the Red House Café, Jenna replied, already aware that Franca had intentions of engaging with a member of the Demonist sect. She had also heard her companion mention the secret organization's animosity towards female assassins. Lumian stroked Franca's mirror substitution in his arms and settled into an armchair when he saw that nothing was amiss. This was Jenna's usual spot. Jenna rolled her eyes at him and perched on the armrest of a nearby chair. She asked thoughtfully, Why do you have so many enemies? How many of them are there? Lumian had briefly recounted the court of disaster but had omitted much of his past. 
He replied simply, the sole summoning spell that caused my sister's problem was acquired from an organization called April Fools. They intentionally sold it to my sister. My current objective is to locate their key members and execute them one by one. Jenna pursed her lips, refraining from delving into the specifics to avoid upsetting Lumian. How can I assist? she inquired earnestly. Lumian pondered for a moment and replied, your dedication to becoming a witch is the greatest assistance you can provide me. Not only were the core members of April Fools formidable, but they also had no boundaries. Jenna could only participate in the pursuit of these individuals after becoming a witch and gaining the ability to create a mirror substitution of herself. Internally seething with anger, Jenna refrained from voicing her frustration. She quietly observed Lumian for a few seconds and remarked, I sense that you're more exhausted than before. Lumian subconsciously smiled. But I'm also more motivated. But isn't this too intense? Franca mentioned that a constantly tense string is prone to snapping. The best approach is to alternate between tension and relaxation, Jenna expressed her concern. Lumian gave a self-deprecating smile. But they won't allow me to relax. They're determined to kill me themselves. Noticing Jenna's confusion, he added with a cold expression, they haven't reported me to the authorities despite knowing that I'm a wanted criminal. It's clear they want me to remain in the market district until they finalize their plan and make all the necessary preparations.